Hello, you reached the home offices of Real to Real Ministries. I'm sorry there's nobody available to take your call right now, but if you'll leave a message, we'll try to get right back with you. And if you're calling to order our newest release, Hell's Bells, The Dangers of Rock and Roll, you can also call 1-800-365-6879. God bless you and have a great day. I heard your crap about associating every other religion with the devil, and you're all full of when you bullshit oh, Christianity crap. Every other religion has as much validity as your religion. Get it through your heads, you ass. We're not devil worshippers. We believe in God just like you, you stupid mother. My fellow Americans, we will no longer be oppressed by the fascism of Christianity. Because I see you all sitting out there trying your hardest to fit in, trying your hardest to earn your way into heaven. But let me ask you, do you want to be in a place that's filled with a bunch of It's slightly ironic that tonight we're all being rewarded for 25 years of bad behavior. You're a musician, it's all selling of your mind and your body. If music is really great, then revolution can I happen. I think that there are things that are spiritual about music that transcends what we were to say. Keep rock and roll, what it was always meant to be. Flamboyant and something that fans, are you ready to sell your soul to the devil? Get ready for the soul. ACDC has gotten rich singing about hell, the devil, and all the dirty deeds commonly associated with the dark side of human nature. Obviously, they're far from alone. From the crossroads of Robert Johnson to the upside-down cross of Ozzy Osbourne. Found my thrill. From the sexual euphemisms of Fats Domino oh, to the jack-booted perversities of corn. The popular form of music we loosely call rock and roll has always been about defying taboos, embracing Dionysian riot, in the words of the Doors Jim Morrison, breaking on through to the other side. But the million dollar question becomes, just what is this other side? Is all this just a good time, a harmless outlet for youthful energy? Or is there something of a deeper, perhaps spiritual significance going on here as well? Do the messages, lifestyles, fashions, and imagery that make up the world of rock have any influence on its fans? Is it, as Mick Jagger sang, only rock and roll? Hello, I'm your host, Eric Holmberg. In this video, we're going to try to answer these questions and in the process gain some insights into the human condition and the even bigger issues that life presents to each of us. Questions of meaning, purpose, redemption, and destiny. Before we get started, however, I want to make a few points clear, kind of lay down the ground rules for this presentation. First, we're going to be taking a hard look at contemporary music and I'll be saying some pretty direct things, both about the music and the artists. Please understand that nothing personal is intended here against anybody. I don't hate these artists. I'm not trying to say that God hates them. And I'm certainly not trying to get you to hate them. We simply want to examine the world of contemporary music from the perspective of truth as defined by the scriptures and the person of Jesus Christ. Now some viewers will object at this point, and no doubt to the analysis that takes place throughout this video by citing the one passage of scripture that everyone seems to know, 
Judge not, that you be not judged. And some religious knuckleheads decided that they were the ones to pass judgment, even though in a very good book it says, do not pass judgment lest you be judged. So, the moral of this story is, who are you to judge? There's only one true judge and that's God. It's important, particularly in our relativistic age, that we understand that Jesus' words are in no way a blanket prohibition of making judgments. If they were, we would be paralyzed from ever making any kind of value judgment, including whether someone is wrong for making the judgment that someone else is wrong for judging. To give you a practical example of this principle in action, take Madonna, an intentionally provocative artist who has made a career of using the judge not defense to justify the extreme expressions of sex and spirituality that characterize her life and art. She views herself as an artist whose right to freedom of expression is practically sacred and not to be limited. This is what I consider freedom of speech, freedom of expression, and freedom of thought. Ironically, other people are not afforded the same freedom. When Newsweek and NBC's Jonathan Alter questioned the propriety of celebrities like Madonna having babies without a husband, she didn't hesitate to judge Alter's opinion, telling him, you actually have no right to criticize me. You really don't. The most important thing is that I say the things I want to say in my music or whatever expression that may be. She also had no problem passing judgment on overindulgent fans. Our own insatiable need to run after gossip and scandals and lies and rumors. In this last instance, the Bible agrees with Madonna's judgment. But you understand the point. Life is filled with and is in fact impossible without making judgments. MTV's Choose or Lose Street TV. And really, when we turn off the smokescreen, we all know it. Whether we're choosing friends or deciding for whom to vote, judgments run to the very core of our day-to-day -day existence. Send your friends e-cards from chooseorlose.excite.com to remind them that if they don't choose to vote, we all lose. When Jesus said, judge not, the context was judging hypocritically and without concern for the other person's soul. Outside this sinful context, judging is not only right, it's commanded. Do not judge according to appearance, Jesus said, but judge with righteous judgment. And it's here where we come to the next big issue we need to lock in on. What's the proper standard to use in order to judge righteously? MTV is MTV right when it says that being butch and gay is good, but intolerance is bad? Is Moby judging righteously when he states that animals have the same rights as humans? How about rage against the machine's condemnation of capitalism? What standard is Beavis using when he declares that a ban, well, you know. Is Frank Zappa making a right judgment when he said that the best way to raise a happy, mentally healthy child is to keep him or her as far away from a church as you can? How about Bjork's conviction that you should do whatever you want, even if it's morally incorrect? A statement, by the way, which requires making a judgment between what's moral and what's not. And what of our earlier caller's assessment of my intelligence and character? Just like you, you stupid mother... By what standard was he judging me? Well, in the words of Jesus, if we're to judge properly, we're not only to avoid hypocrisy and hatred, we're also not to judge according to appearances. We're not to rely, in other words, on our own senses, our own self-determined or even culturally determined opinions as to what's right and wrong. To use other language found in the Bible, we're not to lean to our own understanding, but instead in all our ways acknowledge God. Or as Jesus put it, we're to judge, as we've seen, with righteous judgment. And how do we judge righteously? How do we ultimately discern what's right and wrong? Well, the standard is 
God's Word. For the Word of God is living and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword and is a discerner or judge of the thoughts and intents of the heart. Salt and Peppa got it partially right. There's only one true judge and that's God. So chill and let my father do his job. God is the judge, but it's his word, the Bible, that judges us. To chill, to not use the standard of God's word to discern the ideas and actions presented by the contemporary music industry, is fundamentally to disobey the Father's command to both judge and cast down arguments and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God, bringing every thought captive in obedience to Christ. Understanding this, I know I've now uncovered a new problem that some of you watching this video don't believe or don't want to believe that the Bible is the true Word of God or that Jesus is the Messiah or any number of the other truths central to the Christian faith. In fact, if you've been raised on a steady diet of popular culture, you probably view the Bible as a collection of myths Heroes, gods, men, fears, and Christianity as a religion for dweebs who wear polyester, listen to bad music, and think that sex is dirty. Sex, sex. Okay, I understand your position. Frankly, until I was 26, I felt the exact same way. But try to keep an open mind and heart and at least understand conceptually the basic principle here. That it's right, in fact it's necessary, according to the teachings of Christ, to use the Word of God to judge ourselves and the world around us. And finally, to preempt the inevitable outcries of censorship, allow me to go on record. We're not here pushing for record banning, record burning, or even the dubious practice of rating rock albums. We're not even trying to control what people listen to. This is not an anti-rock music video. What we're after is something much, much deeper. Our goal here is to help you understand the big picture, to peel back the veneer of pop culture and grasp the worldviews, the underlying ideas and presuppositions that pulse beneath the surface. There's more here than meets the eye and ear, as Courtney Love of Hull acknowledged quite openly. I feel like I have a duty, she said. I, as an architect, have a need to impose my worldview on the culture. Well, I'm not interested in imposing anything, but if you want to learn something about these worldviews, if you want to understand the blueprints being used by the architects of the contemporary music industry, and how that blueprint compares to the one being used to build the kingdom of God. Well, stay tuned. That's what this video is all about. And one last thing before we get started. The production of this series spanned the first three years of the new millennium. In the ten years since the first Hell's Bells video, artists and styles have come and gone. No doubt that trend will continue. And yet, the more things change, the more they stay the same. Arthur Brown evolves into Alice Cooper, who morphs into Rob Zombie, who, if the trend continues, will yield some new shock rocker in the not too distant future. It's our prayer that by focusing on the larger themes and the spiritual energies fueling so much of the rock and roll industry, this video can help the viewer 10 years from now evaluate bands that don't yet exist, songs that have yet to be written. To this end, what follows is almost as diverse as its subject matter. From science to history, documentary expose to parabolic drama, biography to music video. We pray that God's Spirit uses this presentation to take you on a journey to the soul of rock and roll.
Music seems to be the most immediate of all the arts. Music possesses us. It really is as if some other has entered not just our bodies, but our intentions as well, taking us over. Does this music cause you to do what you do? Tonight's News on the News special report will be examining the controversial question, can the music we listen to affect our lifestyles and beliefs? Would you be willing to tell us who your favorite bands are? Nirvana, Jesus and Mary Chain, Thrill Cold, Cold, Sonic Youth, Jesus Lizard. Robert Smith is God. Smashing Pumpkins. Do you think these songs have in any way affected your values or the way you live your life? It's just music, man. We just listen to the music, that's all. Would you mind telling our viewers what bands you like to listen to? Hot Dre, Snoop Dogg, Castle, Castle, Regulator, Regulator Boy. Do you think this music or these bands have in any way influenced your lifestyles or beliefs? Yeah, no, man. No, man. All you like is a music, man. That's all. That's all. Hey, who are you guys listening to? Aerosmith. Do you think this music has impacted you in any way, shape, or form? Hey guys, can you tell us what bands you like to listen to? Blood Zeppelin! Slayer! Dio! Ozzy! Babbitt! Do you think this music has affected you in any way? What? Do you think that listening to these bands has in any way influenced your lifestyles or beliefs? No, man. We just like the music, that's all. Well, I like to listen to Chaos One, Domino Cooley, Nick Warren G, Mark Kelly, Animal Snoop, you know. Do you think the songs that you listen to have affected your attitude or character? No, we just we just like the music. That's all. Hey, who it? Hey, hey, girl. Hey, girl. Hey, girl. Hey, girl. Hey, girl. Hey, girl. Oh. Excuse me. Can I ask you a question? Oh, cool. uh, never mind. For MTV. Well, there you have it, folks. Straight from the fans themselves. Apparently, the music they listen to has absolutely no impact on their lifestyles, beliefs, or anything else for that matter. With Channel 9's Nose on the News, I'm Alex McNamara. Whether it's the way some people dress, act, or speak, we can all smile at such extreme examples of music's influence over its audience, and the degree to which those same fans will deny that influence. While most of us do know someone who could have been featured in our Nose in the News satire, the truth is that for most of us, music seems to be just that, music, an amusement, a harmless form of entertainment that we can both turn on and off at will. Funny thing about life, though, it has a way of busting through the facade of our excuses and easy answers and forcing us, if we're brave and honest enough, to do a serious gut check. Could there be more to all of this than meets the eye and ear? I'm standing in front of Columbine High School in Littleton, Colorado, scene of one of the worst mass murders in American history. On April 20th of 1999, Eric Harris and Dylan Klebold strolled into this school shortly before lunch and opened fire. After killing 12 classmates and a teacher, and planning at least 30 bombs with the intent of killing hundreds more, they turned their guns on themselves. A stunned nation was once again forced to gaze into the abyss of evil and ask, why? How can two so young do something so unspeakably depraved? What force or circumstance can turn former Boy Scouts, living in two-parent homes in an affluent suburb, young men blessed with health, intelligence, and good looks, into two assassins who laughed as they hunted down their victims, killing them in cold blood. As America and much of the world grappled with this question, 
parallels began to be noted to other recent acts of senseless destruction and mayhem. Horrors again committed by individuals who not so long ago would have been considered too young to have had the time to develop the depravity of conscience necessary to perform such evil. Pearl, Paducah, Jonesboro, Springfield, Santee, kids gunned down at the supposed sanctuary of their schools. And then there's Rod Farrell the leader of a vampire cult who, for no more than the rush he thought he would get from taking someone's life, bludgeoned a member's parents to death with a crowbar. Richard Ramirez, the infamous Night Stalker, killed and then carved pentagrams into the flesh of his victims. 14-year-old Tommy Sullivan stabbed his mother to death, cutting off her hand and face before turning the knife on himself. In a secluded wood, three pre-adolescent boys were stabbed to death and mutilated. Convicted for the crime were three teenagers with more than a passing interest in the occult and heavy metal music. Four teenagers calling themselves the Lords of Chaos began a spree that spiraled down into ever-increasing acts of mayhem and violence. From theft to vandalism to arson. Their rampage ended with their arrest for the brutal and senseless murder of their high school music teacher. Three young men, ages 15, 16, and 17, believing that a human sacrifice would invoke hell's blessings and assure the success of their heavy metal band, lured 15-year-old Elise Poller into the woods and stabbed her to death. From suicide to homicide, rape to killing one's parents. The list goes on and on. The bottom line for each of these young killers, of course, is that they chose. They made a conscious decision to pick up a knife or a gun or a bomb and kill. No failure in their upbringing, no cultural deficiency, no weapon, movie, song, or video game. No demon evoked through some occult ritual can serve as a primary focus of blame. They are killers because they killed. But that said, we would still do well to consider those cultural phenomena that may have helped move them along towards that point of decision. The most common denominator in the lives of these young killers was a profound sense of being outcasts, of not fitting into the prevailing cliques, of being shunned and made fun of. But can that by itself explain these horrors? After all, there's nothing new here. When haven't there been cliques and kids made to feel that they're outside them? No doubt a good portion of the blame lies with our society at large. Our national addiction to ever-increasing doses of violence, gore and mayhem, reaching down into even the toys that are marketed to our children. The general coarsening of our culture, shattering taboos concerning everything from language to sex, the sacrifice of moral absolutes upon the altar of relativism, the lack of true heroes and strong moral leadership. This and more has contributed to the steady erosion of the foundation of honor, civility, and self-sacrifice that is necessary to bring out the best in a nation's citizens while keeping the worst at bay. Leaving the bigger picture and focusing in on some of the specific cultural phenomena that seem to thread their way through most of these acts of teen violence. The occult, whether through dabbling or outright obsession, was uncomfortably common. 3D shooter games like Quake and a fascination with violent movies were another prevalent theme. But perhaps the most widespread link to the world of pop culture was the music that so often seemed to score, like a Hollywood movie, their individual descents into anarchy and senseless violence. From Marilyn Manson to Ramstein. Gangster rap to grunge. Metallica. Their fans are so hardcore. It's like almost like a religion. Kill them all. To KMFDM. Dark, nihilistic, angry music was all too often.
playing in the background. Take as just one example the story of Brian Bassett, a 16-year-old who shot and killed both his mother and father and drowned his five-year-old brother in a bathtub. Spin, a magazine that celebrates contemporary music, relates what happened next as confessed by accomplice Nick McDonald. Brian pulled a small plastic object from his father's hand. It was Brian's favorite cassette, Frog Stomp by the group Silver Chair. That's my expletive tape, he shrieked. Brian stuck the cassette in the stereo, rewound to the beginning of Israel's Son and pushed play. Brian started kicking the bodies of his parents in time to the pounding guitar chords, yelling insults with each blow. This is for kicking me out, thump. This is for breaking my stuff, whack. Now you're dead. Okay, I can hear the objections coming. No, I'm, I'm kidding. I think, I think it's absurd whenever the media tries to blame artists for violence, especially, you know, in the context of something like Columbine. You know, where um, they were saying that there was some kind of a, a violent movement of music that was causing the youth of America to right. turn on each other. You know, I thought that was ludicrous. The messages these bands are getting across, us and anybody, is nothing harmful to anyone whatsoever. It's, it's not telling you to do drugs, to kill somebody, to hurt somebody. It's just feelings that other people have made you feel. I never heard of anybody being able to kill somebody with a CD. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> when a dude's getting bullied and shoots up the school and they blame it on Maryland and the heroin, where were the parents at? And look where it's at. Let's get the straw man out of the way, shall we? Listen carefully. Music is not solely or even primarily responsible for Eric and Dylan, or anyone else for that matter, killing someone or committing some other immoral act. In the same way, the publication of Uncle Tom's Cabin by itself didn't start the Civil War, but it did so fire the imaginations of the millions who read it that President Lincoln greeted its author as the little lady who made this big war. Neither can Taco Bell's ad campaign by itself account for the astronomical increase in Chihuahua sales since the commercials first began to air. Yo quiero Taco Bell. But one would have to be either ignorant or a liar to deny some degree of linkage. A tattoo on your tongue, a porn, that is a fan right there. There's no question that music, art, and the popular media has enormous power to influence, to capture the imagination, to push people along a little faster in the direction to which they're already inclined, and in some instances, even to help change that direction. Be all you can be. And there is ample evidence to suggest that of all the things that have the power to capture the imagination, there is none more evocative, more electrifying, than music. Don't believe me? The music I listen to doesn't affect me because I know it's just music. I think music that you listen to doesn't really affect your life. It's pretty trivial, you know. Like, you know, not like, oh, go out there and do what they tell, go out there and do what they're telling me to do. They're not, you know, enforcing anything on you. They're just saying how they believe. Because they're just doing their life as long as you keep living your life and just listen to the music. That's all it is. Listen and hearing it. You ain't got to do what they do. I don't. I just like, I'm like, sitting back and listen to music, you know, it don't affect me really. You know, I like to listen to it, but I don't, you know, base myself on what someone said. I think that all this controversy is like useless, you know, it's just a song. It's just music, you know, I believe that. Music and vibrations are the basis of everything. They pervade everything. Human consciousness is reflected by them. Atoms are vibrations between positive and negative forces. Some very subtle, some complex. But it's all music.
popular music's young fans may want to insist that it's all just music, that the songs they listen to and the videos they watch are not having any real impact on their lives. But how does that line up with the opinions of those who actually make, study, and promote the music? The music comes to people on a subconscious level. It gets right to the core, and it has a way of transforming you. And songs, oh my songs so powerful that you are forever changed. You know, people say that music can change the world, and it really can. Music works in mysterious ways, you know, I mean, once it goes in, you have really no say about what it does to you. Music is, is our weapon. We also promote the idea of unification between the body and the spirit. Music is a complete ocean. They hit one note, every hair in your body is going to stand up. And then you feel like you, you, you just made love or you just touched God's feet or both at the same time. I was 19 years old when I first saw the Rolling Stones. They've rocked my ass off. They've inspired me in word and deeds. From the first instantly recognizable chords, it grabs you hard, it goes to your gut, your muscles twitch, and it's deep in your soul. Rock and roll. It's an intense force. It can move mountains, stir up love affairs, and encourage revolution. Look at this. You're just amazed by the power of it. And I was also aware that you could just say, kill. And, you know, just somehow this surge would happen. Funny thing about people. Gene Simmons can on the one hand talk about this power to evoke this surge and on the other hand, spend his life defending rock music as a harmless diversion, as just a way of letting off steam and having fun. In the same way, Anthony Kiedis of the Red Hot Chili Peppers can in the same sentence talk about music's tremendous power to influence people in positive ways. You know, music is made to create beauty in the world, you know. Right. There's, there's always need for more beauty in the world and that's what music is. It you know, makes people happy, it gives people something creative to and, focus and on. Things at Woodstock were While maintaining, as we saw earlier, that it couldn't possibly have any negative effect on its listeners. You know, I thought that was ludicrous, you know, I thought the media was, was groping. Thank you, sir. Music is a magical gift. At the 2000 Grammy Awards, Recording Academy President Michael Green echoed Kiedis when he gushed about music's power to help people while denying that it could ever provoke to harm. Enhance the spatial intelligence in newborns, and let's not forget that the arts are a compelling solution to teen violence. They're certainly not the cause of it. Tonight, a year later, this doublespeak was turned on its head with the controversial performance and triple Grammy nomination of raunch rapper Eminem. Suddenly, practically every liberal women's and homosexual support group in America was up in arms because of his music's potential to affect behavior, to encourage violence and hatred. My words are like a dagger with a jagged edge It'll stab you in the head Whether you're a fag or less Is that a homosex, a map or a trans a vest Pants a dress, hate facts, the answer's yes Homophobic But what's the big deal if it's only music? Didn't anyone listen to Mr. Green the year before? Teen violence, they're certainly not the cause of it No one was more vocal in his defense of rock music than Frank Zappa, one of the most innovative and influential musicians and composers of the contemporary era. From interviews, to books, to his testimony before Congress, Zappa has insisted again and again, music is only music. It can't hurt anybody. And yet, in an article he wrote for Life magazine, Zappa noted rock's rather incredible power when he quoted Hal Zeiger, one of the music industry's first big promoters. I realized that this music got through to the youngsters because the big beat matched the great rhythms of the human body. I knew there was nothing that anyone could do to knock that out of them, that they would carry this with them the rest of their lives. Zappa further observed, the ways in which sound affects the human organism are myriad and subtle. The loud sounds and bright lights of today are tremendous indoctrination tools. 
Well, one might wonder how a tremendous tool for indoctrination that operates in myriad and subtle ways and will be carried with us for the rest of our lives can be only music. But leaving that alone, these types of observations by both musicians and people who work in and around the industry leave little doubt as to music's incredible power over its audience. Virtuoso guitarist Eddie Van Halen rightly observed, music really is the universal language. It really does have the power to heal. We've had people who hallucinated. We've had people become violent for no apparent reason and not understand why. Music is very powerful and it doesn't have to be a recognizable form. The power in and of itself of any sound is enough, which release specific chemicals in the brain and body in order to alter the state of consciousness. Renowned musicologist David Tame agrees. Music is the language of languages, he wrote in The Secret Power of Music. It can be said that of all the arts, there is none that more powerfully moves and changes the consciousness. Tori Amos echoed this observation when she stated, Music is the most powerful medium in the world because of the frequencies. You're hitting places and people that remind them that they're more than just this functional being. The artist, once again known as Prince, gave his perspective on the power of these frequencies when he told an interviewer, The other night I went to a club and I watched the DJ control the entire room. Even politicians can't do that. Incredibly, given his own history of X-rated songs, he went on to reflect on the power of lyrics. I watched the DJ reach for the new album by B.I.G. and put it on, and the crowd went crazy. I asked him, do you know what he's saying in those lyrics? He said he didn't know. Then he tried to tell me he wasn't playing it for the lyrics, that for him it's all about the beat. But it's affecting people. Everything we put out there is affecting people. The message matters, my brother. Weighing her own influence as a musician against that of being an actor, Courtney Love admitted that there was a more bourgeois respectability to acting, but Meryl Streep doesn't know the sublime pleasure of standing in front of 10,000 people and making them do whatever you want. Superstar Jimi Hendrix noted another, perhaps more sobering aspect of this power. After describing how central music was to his life, to the point of functioning as a type of electronic church, he went on to tell Life magazine, you hypnotize people to where they go right back to their natural state. And when you get people at their weakest point, you can preach into their subconscious what we want to say. This power over the subconscious is precisely what science writer and composer Robert Jourdain was getting at when he said in his book, Music, the Brain, and Ecstasy, Music seems to be the most immediate of all the arts. Music possesses us. It really is as if some other has entered not just our bodies, but our intentions taking us over. Well, music is your special friend. There's probably no contemporary artist who's made a greater study of music's awesome power over the human soul than percussionist Mickey Hart. Drummer with the Grateful Dead, world music devotee, and self-taught musicologist, Hart has spent his life attempting to unravel the mystery that is music. From his testimony before the United States Senate, co-founding the Rhythm for Life Foundation, researching and authoring several books on the subject, including his late 1999 release, Spirit into Sound, The Magic of Music, a book that is a virtual apologetic for music's incredible, even supernatural power. To countless live concert experiences around the world, Hart's belief in the power of music borders on the religious. Describing, for example, the Dead's official archivist, Dick Latvala's devotion to their music, Hart said, in those moments when he was listening, he was communing with God. 
Several years ago, Hart sent out a request for anecdotal information on music and its power through the vast electronic underground of Deadheads. His letter began, Dear friend, I've discovered, along with many others, the extraordinary power of music, particularly percussion, to influence the human mind and body. Among the thousands of examples Hart has compiled is his own striking observation of the effects evoked by some music he heard many years ago. It was my first exposure to the mother rhythms from West Africa that later mutated into my tradition, becoming rock and roll. All I knew then was that whenever I played this music at parties, the room would transform. It was as though the rhythm of the drum was calling up something from these sleek cosmopolitan bodies that had been asleep. There was a power there I couldn't ignore. Hart is far from alone in these types of empirical observations. Doctors and professional musicologists have also studied this power to transform, creating a whole new branch of medicine called music therapy. And as music therapist Gene Maas has stated, music is the greatest power I have ever experienced. I doubt if anything else equals its power to act upon the human organism. The organized patterning of music uh, can help drive electrical uh, networks within the brain and can help the organization and reorganization of brain networks. MTV, aggressively reorganizing your brain. Nothing could be more this ability to organize and reorganize brain networks was given powerful expression by Richard Pellegrino, a medical doctor and consultant to the entertainment industry. In an article in Billboard magazine, Dr. Pellegrino discussed the powerful way music interacts, often subconsciously, with receptors in the brain to produce endorphin highs, to trigger a flood of emotions and images that have the ability to instantaneously produce very powerful changes in emotional states. He closes his commentary with the observation, take it from a brain guy. In 25 years of working with a brain, I still cannot affect a person's state of mind the way that one simple song can. And in over 30 years of writing about the simple songs to which most of those brains listen, Rolling Stone magazine agreed. A song or an album, they said, can change your life. A great concert will change it on the spot. And when they're honest, the fans agree. The music itself just gave you this feeling that you couldn't forget. It just, it was like embedded inside of you. And even if you didn't know what the lyrics were, the music transported you into that realm that, that Kurt Cobain wanted you to be in. Much in the way Manson courts controversy, his fans began to follow suit, or dress. Years ago, Marilyn got in trouble for bringing his Kiss lunchbox to school. A generation later, the stiletto heel was on the other foot as kids were getting busted for emulating Mr. Manson. You're my inspiration. Do you want to know why? Why? There's a lot of reasons. You've inspired me to do so many things. Like, I think about you every day, and I listen to your music every day, and you keep me going. I, they, they have totally changed my life. They are gods. I love corn. And they take it quite seriously. I look into the faces of our fans, and I see that they've been touched by the Dark Carnival. Basically, to them, there's nothing fantasy about it. It's like, it's what they're into. I mean, it really is a real existence to that. Their music is like a background to my life. Like, everything that happens to me now, it's like, it's like my own little soundtrack. And I just want to, like, be able to hang out with them and say that I hang out with, like, the people that, like, have influenced my life. Music is an extension of yourself. And it's like, when people accept it, they're accepting you. You know, multitudes of people just, just vibing off your stuff, you know what I'm saying? Just heads bobbing. To me, it's like a drug, it's like euphoria. As soon as you turn on that beat, I'm in a different world, you know what I'm saying? Well, a renowned musicologist certainly knew exactly what he was saying when he observed, music really is a powerful drug. It can poison you, lift your spirits, or make you sick without knowing why. Well, in a moment, we'll try to understand why. Just how it is music can exert, for good or evil, this type of influence over us. But first, it's important to also note that what music can do to the individual, it can do to their entire culture. 
And this is why, from philosophers to rulers, revolutionaries to network and marketing executives, Plato's observation in the Republic has been echoed time and again. When modes of music change, the fundamental laws of the state change with them. In another work, Plato could have been writing about our modern age when he stated, through foolishness they, the people, deceived themselves into thinking that there was no right or wrong in music, that it was to be judged good or bad by the pleasure it gave. As it was, the criterion was not music, but a reputation for promiscuous cleverness and a spirit of law-breaking. Plato's contemporary Aristotle, observing music's power to form character, to in some cases encourage self-control, while in others provoke abandonment, advised that music actually be regulated by the state. 18th century Scottish writer, orator, and parliamentarian Andrew Fletcher echoed Plato and Aristotle when he declared that, if a man were permitted to make all the ballads, he need not care who should make the laws of a nation. A modern fulfillment of Fletcher's observation can be seen in the vast cultural changes that took place in America and much of the West during the 1960s. Rock and roll was the beginning of the brand new world uh, in terms of a generation bringing on its own consciousness through music to other generations. So music was like the Pied Piper that led kids off the asphalt and out of the suburbs and into some other kind of reality. Albert Goldman pop culture analyst and best-selling author goes so far as to call that decade's popular music the most important cultural event in the history of America. Um, it's like an earthquake. It, uh, it just shook the whole country and it cracked open uh, the shell of what had been society before that and outswarmed a whole new generation of freaks. Leading these freaks were organizations like the Black Panthers, Students for a Democratic Society, and the Youth International Party, the Yippies. Embracing not only communist ideology, but also the Marxist-Leninist credo that music was to be used as a weapon to achieve particular socio-political ends, songs became the driving force of the revolution. Uh, point two is... Uh Total assault on the culture by any means necessary, including rock and roll dope in the streets. Jerry Rubin, co-founder of the Yippie Movement and one of the infamous Chicago Seven, authored the bestseller, Do It, a book that was called by its publisher, quote, the communist manifesto of our era, a declaration of war between the generations, calling on kids to leave their homes, burn down their schools, and create a new society upon the ashes of the old. See, we, we don't want to be responsible. We're irrational. We're irrational and crazy. In a chapter titled, Elvis Presley Killed Ike Eisenhower, Rubin described the spark that lit the fire of the revolution. The new left sprang from Elvis' gyrating pelvis. Hard animal rock energy beat surged hot through us, the driving rhythm arousing repressed passions. Rubin went on to observe the role technology rather ironically played in making this revolution possible. Affluent culture by producing a car and a car radio for every middle-class home gave Elvis a base for recruiting. While a car radio in the front seat rocked, young kids in the back seat were having sex to the hard rock beat. The back seat produced the sexual revolution, and the car radio was the medium for subversion. Thirty years later, Rubin's communist revolution has largely been passed up in favor of rank, whatever makes you happy materialism. Because everyone loves a twofer. Bye, Teddy. Bye, cutie. But music's influence has only become more powerful and more widespread. The low fidelity car radio of the 60s has given place to digital technologies, surround sound and personal stereos, music television, TV commercials, 
Movie soundtracks. Soundtrack to the Smash film. Video games. The internet. And a nine billion dollar a year industry that's with us when we wake up, as we drive, study, when we exercise, as we relax, shop, go out to eat, and finally as we go to sleep. And the result is a new type of revolutionary, one even more secure in music's power to influence individuals as well as shape the culture. So music is really great. It can, it can, it can move you know, a large group of people. It can inspire and move a large group of people. Then revolution can happen. There's more to Rage's music than meets the ear. We are able to seduce some people in with the music who then are exposed to a different uh, political message. As Bob Pittman, founder and one-time president of MTV once bragged, the strongest appeal you can make is emotionally. If you can get their emotions going, make them forget their logic, you've got them. At MTV, we don't shoot for the 14-year-olds. We own them. It's MTV. Today you are a woman. MTV. It's all part of growing up. You know, no one wants to feel like they're being influenced and certainly not owned or controlled by anything that's outside their own rational decision-making minds. Yeah, maybe some of those idiots who hang out in front of Game World at the mall are being led around by their nose rings, but we'd like to think, not me. The simple, inescapable truth, however, is that you and I do become, to some degree, what we listen to and watch. In the same way that human biology dictates that if you live on a steady diet of junk food, you will eventually damage your body, the entertainments you feed upon, for good or ill, will affect your emotional and spiritual well-being. It's true that not everyone will be influenced in precisely the same way, or to the same degree, but like it or not, we will be influenced. Whether it's the manner in which music organizes thought patterns in the brain, or the mysterious spiritual power that has so fascinated artists like Hendrix, Morrison, Mickey Hart, and Tori Amos. Music truly does have enormous influence over its audience. On my command, relinquish control. Give me your body. Surrender your soul. Submission is strongly suggested. Let's now close by examining the basic bottom line of this power over our souls and what we can do about it. TJ. TJ. Son. Get it. What are you doing? I'm just doing some programming. Programming what, the computer or your brain? What's that? I've already drawn the analogy between food and entertainment, how what we bring into our bodies and minds affects the type of people we become. Perhaps an even better analogy, though, can be found here, in, of all things, a broken window. In his classic work, Thinking About Crime, renowned social scientist James Q. Wilson observed that disorder and crime are usually inextricably linked that human behavior is profoundly affected by its environment. Broken windows, graffiti, drunkenness, and open displays of unfettered sexuality are an invitation for crime, a declaration that the environment is uncontrolled and uncontrollable, and that anyone can invade it to do whatever damage and mischief the mind suggests. Almost like clockwork, when this broken window effect is reversed and these elements are removed or suppressed within a community, crime rates plummet. An ordered and more dignified atmosphere encourages civility and moral behavior, while disorder breeds anarchy and immorality. Hi, how you doing? And if that's true when disorder appears in something as mundane as a broken window, 
How much more powerful is the catalyst for immoral behavior when the aural environment, when the music, that language of the human soul, is bent towards moral disorder and chaos? A striking example of this broken window effect as it relates to music can be seen in this small park in Edmonton, Alberta. Several years ago, drug dealers began doing business here, and as a result, the crime rate in general began to increase. In an effort to restore a sense of order and preserve their community, local merchants paid for a sound system and began to broadcast the symphonies of Bach, Beethoven, and Mozart throughout the park. Neil DeBoer, the local chief of police, reported that the results were immediate and dramatic, with the number of crimes falling by approximately 800 percent. While there's no way to fully quantify all the factors that led to this decline, the gut consensus was that the beauty, intelligence, grandeur, and order projected by the classical music was so antithetical to the discord and degeneracy associated with the drug trade that many of the dealers just stayed away. A more recent example of the flip side to this principle can be seen in the rioting, theft, arson, and rape that took place at Woodstock 1999. It's time to let yourself go right now, because there are no more rules out there. During the Limp Biscuit set, where the majority of the sexual assaults were reported, vocalist Fred Durst introduced a new song. How many people here ever woke up one morning and just decided it was one of those days and you're going to break some sh Well, this is one of them days, yo. And then sang. It's going this way, I just might break your face tonight. This chaos reached its crescendo the next night during the Red Hot Chili Peppers performance, while bass player Flea pranced about naked, and lead singer Anthony Kiedis urged women in the audience to do something so disturbing we can't even mention it here. An organization calling itself PAX, Latin for Peace, distributed candles. So here, why don't you just take one as a souvenir for coming by? It was no small irony when these so-called peace candles were used to set fires that ultimately burned down a stage, 12 trailers, and brought 500 riot police onto the scene. When asked by reporters about the pandemonium, concert promoter John Schur replied, I can't give you an explanation. I guess they were kids blowing off some steam and it got out of hand. It's been well said, there are none so blind as those who refuse to see. Again, as with the young criminals we looked at earlier, we're not suggesting that the music and the atmosphere shaped by it were the sole cause of all the mayhem. The heat, high prices, and poor planning have all been trotted out as contributing factors. But to say that the moral anarchy intentionally promoted by this music was not a, if not the major factor, is to not only deny common sense and the broken window effect, it's to ignore a very basic aspect of human nature. If we stop to honestly think about it, we all know we have a bent towards doing the wrong things. Little children, for example, don't have to be taught how to be bad, how to be selfish or fight or get angry when they don't get their way. Parents have to work hard at teaching kids how to be good, how to develop the self-discipline necessary to not succumb to these very natural tendencies. And even as we grow older, again, if we're honest, we struggle. It's all too easy for us to become impatient or even angry over things as inconsequential as the flow of traffic. We're tempted to goof off at work, even though we know we'd be upset if someone did the same thing to us. We're tempted to get angry and rebel against the very people who love us the most. We struggle with sexual and emotional faithfulness, even though we know it's what we desire and expect in return. On and on it goes, confirming what the Bible clearly declares. The heart of man is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? 
Like it or not, compared to the perfections of an infinite and infallible God, our fallen, fallible, and finite natures produce actions that even at their best are as filthy rags in His sight. Our bent towards evil is really more an addiction, one for which we ultimately need His power, His grace to fight and overcome. So what happens when we immerse ourselves into an environment that encourages us to give in to these temptations? When we listen to and watch things, for example, that glorify sex, anger, and rebellion, suddenly it's not just the fires or the rapes or the looting that took place at Woodstock that begin to make sense. It's the stuff that goes on every day and all around us. The dumbing down and coarsening of language. Okay, well I can say You've said it 20 times already. The increasing popularity of tattooing, body modification, and body piercing. The erosion of any and all standards of modesty. The loss of a sense of destiny, purpose, and hope. The use of alcohol and drugs. I'm taking a hit for every one of y'all. The celebration of rebellion, chaos, and anarchy. The assault on religion and moral absolutes. The growing fascination with death and the occult. The embrace of anger, aggression, and the celebration of violence. The increasing normalization of sexual debauchery. The list drags on. The sonic environment created by many of today's artists, both at Woodstock and more importantly, throughout our culture, is encouraging behavior that in any other time and in any other context would be almost unthinkable. Hey, we got one rule. There are no rules. Have a good time. The prophetic warning of Galatians 6 has come true with a vengeance. Do not be deceived. God is not mocked. For whatever a man sows, that he shall also reap. For the one who sows to his flesh shall from his flesh reap corruption. Billboard magazine got it exactly right when it acknowledged that popular music doesn't just reflect aspects of our society, which of course is the most common defense raised in support of the industry. It also helps define, condone, and deepen their sum effect. While the vast majority of us will never be inspired by popular music to kill or commit a crime or even to take our clothes off in public, we are nevertheless affected. Whether it's in our attitude towards sex, aesthetics, authority, intelligence, civility, language, beauty, on and on. The world we create for ourselves through our choices in music, along with other entertainments, goes into our hearts and minds and works, for good or ill, their subtle magic. And this is precisely why the clear warning God presents to us in Proverbs is echoed throughout the Bible. Watch over your heart, the things you listen to, watch and think about with all diligence, for out of your heart will flow the issues of life. I think that there are things that are spiritual about music that transcends what the words are saying. I think it's things. Possession is 
the psychic phenomenon which occurs when the divinity becomes manifest. It is the point which one travels by the most visible and physical means, yet to the traveler it is itself invisible. Trance is a way to merge with the cosmic beat of the universe, a way to heal, to release emotion, to awaken spirit, to taste the ecstasy of the dance. Magical patterns of percussion is the discussion so it's enough close Let it connect you to the powers that be with the healing with mixed synergy Techno tribal, a positive reprime, a shamanic and artistic, archaic revival And I think that's what music was originally In ancient times we had a different consciousness It wasn't the kind of consciousness that we have now When people made sounds they could see other beings still We only forgot to do that when we developed Western language and perspective and architecture, our consciousness changed. We've seen how powerful music is, its ability to inspire, indoctrinate, organize thought patterns, produce endorphin highs, generate sonic environments, to, as Stone's guitarist Keith Richards said, work in all kinds of mysterious ways. But we can never really understand the heart of this mystery or the real bottom line of music's power until we look at its spiritual connection. Perhaps no living musician has had more experience with music's power to move and enthrall an audience than Oscar-winning composer John Williams. His film scores for many of our most popular movies have touched millions of lives worldwide, leading him to observe the one thing perhaps that every culture on earth shares, even before language, is music. There's a very basic human, non-verbal aspect to our need to make music and use it as part of our human expression. It doesn't have to do with articulation of a language, but with something spiritual. Mickey Hart echoed this idea of music being a type of proto-language, what Scottish writer and critic Thomas Carlyle called the speech of angels, when he described music as the language of God, a secret call whose intention is to vibrate the mind and body, to form a union with the spirit world. It is the preferred medium for communication with the gods. This union with the spirit has been described by many of rock's greatest luminaries. The Who's Pete Townsend declared, when I'm on stage, I feel this incredible, almost spiritual experience. When they occur, they are sacred. Pop superstar Michael Jackson has written, On many an occasion when I'm dancing, I have felt touched by something sacred. In those moments I felt my spirit soar and become one with everything that exists. John Anderson of Yes acknowledged, Music has always been religious. Music is a passion and a vehicle for understanding why we are here. It's a remembering of the past and ritual. Irish bluesman Van Morrison, one of contemporary music's most brilliant and enduring performers, agrees. Music is spiritual, he declared. Singing, playing an instrument is spiritual. It's coming from a spiritual world. I think spirituality exists mostly in art and in music, and the last place you're going to find it is in religion. P. 
Peter Gabriel has described music as a spiritual doorway. Its power comes from the fact that it plugs directly into the soul. A sentiment foreshadowed by hippie troubadour Donovan when he declared that rock was a perfect religious vehicle. Jefferson Airplane singer Grace Slick might have been wondering where that religious vehicle was headed when she stared out at the mind-blowing, culture-defining freakout that was the first Woodstock and wondered, were we, the bands, there to invoke the spirits, the gods? Were we pagan? Were we all shamans of equal power, channeling an unknown energy, seeking fluidity? Paul Stanley of KISS put a slightly different spin on a very similar conclusion. In other ways, I think of myself as kind of like a holy roller preacher. I'm testifying and I'm getting everybody riled up to the power of almighty rock and roll. No band has had more experience and has experimented more with channeling this type of spiritual energy than the Grateful Dead. The band's name, and Talisman, was taken from a character in folk tradition who served as a ferryman, a conduit, a bridge to the spirit world, and the band provided a musical experience that offered safe passage to the other side. In 1995, guitarist Jerry Garcia made the final voyage to the other side, dying from a heart attack brought on by years of drug abuse. One fan eulogized the 53-year-old band leader by describing just how spiritual their concerts had become. A dead show was not just a concert, it was a place of worship. The band was the high priest, the songs, the liturgy, the dancing, the prayer, the audience, the congregation. And in those moments of perfect grateful deadness, we collectively storm the gates of heaven, entered a sacred chamber of the universe from which we returned, always reluctantly, always transformed. In all this, bassist Phil Lesh got right to the bottom line when he said, every place we play is church. I'm the one who's got to die, I want to for me to die. And Jimi Hendrix agrees. Do you think music has a meaning? Oh yeah, definitely. It's good to be more spiritual so than anything. Uh, pretty soon I believe that they're going to have to rely on music to uh, like get some kind of peace of mind or satisfaction, direction actually. We're making our music into electric church music. We plan for our sound to go inside the soul of the person actually, you know, and see if they can awaken some kind of pain in their minds. You know? 30 years later, echoes of this same philosophy can be found everywhere. From the Lollapalooza festivals, as conceived by Perry Farrell, to the all-night dance parties, or raves, that crop up in major cities throughout America and the world. Dr. Russell Newcomb, a sociologist who specializes in rave culture, extended Lesh's and Hendrick's religious metaphor when he wrote, DJs are the high priests of the rave ceremony, responding to the mood of the crowd, with their mixing desks symbolizing the altar, the only direction in which the ravers consistently face. Dancing at raves may be construed as the method by which ravers worship the god of altered consciousness. The fact is, there's a certain inevitability to this type of connection. Music has always been seen as fundamentally spiritual, as something closely associated with religion and worship. Even the very word music suggests this spiritual dimension. Its etymological root, muse, is the name of the spirit beings, daughters of Zeus, who the ancient Greeks felt were responsible for the inspiration of all art. Over 3,000 years later, this connection between muses, or spirits, and music hasn't just survived, it's thrived. The world of popular music virtually teems with artists who believe they are channelers for spiritual forces, guiding lights to the undiscovered areas of our subconscious. Often these spirits are credited with helping inspire or even compose a particular song. 
John Lennon, for example, has stated, When the real music comes to me, it has nothing to do with me, because I'm just a channel. It's given to me, and I transcribe it like a channel. A lot of the songs were written in about 15 minutes to 45 minutes, just really quickly. Glenn and I in the room, very stream of consciousness, as though, many times we felt as though it was being channeled through us. I, and plus my songwriting too, I'm very, very aware that when I write a good song, I'm just acting as like a messenger. It comes from a higher source, you know. I don't, I don't, I'm not so egotistical that I think that I've done this all on my own. I'm very, very aware that there's a higher source sort of guiding me through this and I'm just acting as a messenger. Led Zeppelin's Robert Plant felt that their most popular song, Stairway to Heaven, was given in much the same way. I was holding a paper and pencil, then all of a sudden my hand was writing out words. There's a lady who's sure all that glitters is gold, and she's buying a stairway to heaven. And she's buying a stairway to heaven. I just sat there and looked at the words, and then I almost leapt out of my seat. And it makes me wonder. There were some very strong vibrations in that place, and we're not quite sure of what nature, you know. We've always, in, within the band, said there is a fifth member, a, a mystical member, yeah. The members of Black Sabbath also know exactly what Plant was talking about. We would literally show up in a room, and it was almost as if the songs were already written. When we first wrote this sort of music, we didn't even know what we were doing, and we were oh, God, this, we like this, you know, it's strange, but we like it. Yeah, although it is a rock and roll band, uh, there's a phenomena involved there where that stuff just comes from somewhere, and it just so happened that it, we, we happen to be the ones that it came to. Tori Amos' music is channeled more deliberately, making use at times of fairy rings, sympathetic magic, sacred geography, and psychoactive drugs. When people were asking me about the whole fairy thing, she told one interviewer, it was because I believe in the spirit side. I think music comes through dimensions. It's arrogant to think you can create music on your own. There's a co-creation going on. I don't know with whom, but there is this well that we all tap into. On other occasions, she has described the songs themselves as spiritual entities. I feel like it's really kind of nice they come and use my body to say what they want to say. It's an energy force that comes and visits me. But not only do many musicians see spiritual forces attending the process of creation and composition, the performance itself can also be suffused with supernatural energies. Carlos Santana, whose supernatural disc was among the most popular and critically acclaimed recordings of 2000, can hardly discuss his music without bringing up its, well, supernatural characteristics. It's a spiritual vibe. It's a spiritual hit. It's a hit, you know, it's a hit that you can't get at church. In an interview with Guitar Player magazine, he declared, I am the string and the supreme is the musician. It's like sometimes I'm not aware I can do some of these things on my guitar because in reality, I'm not doing them. They are being done through me. In an interview with Rolling Stone, Santana was more specific concerning the identity of this supernatural entity, identifying him as Metatron, the architect of physical life. His personal studio, a place he calls church, features candles, the word Metatron spelled out in intricately painted picture letters on the floor, and a yellow legal pad Santana uses to record the spirit's messages when they come to him like a fax machine. Then there's this striking observation by fusion guitarist extraordinaire John McLaughlin. One night we were playing and suddenly the spirit entered into me and I was playing 
but it was no longer me playing. Porno for Pyro's guitarist Peter DiStefano echoed McLaughlin when he observed, a lot of that guitar playing is not me. We figure we got help from something more powerful. And earlier in this video, we saw ACDC guitarist Angus Young say almost the exact same thing. Someone else is steering me. I'm just along for the ride. I become possessed when I'm on stage. Of course, the real question then becomes, just who or what is steering him? Where exactly is this other side to which the Grateful Dead ferries its audience? What spirits are being channeled? And what God does the Electric Sky Church celebrate? To help answer these questions, and to more fully understand the mystical relationship that exists between man and music, we must first understand some basic biblical truths concerning the fundamental nature of reality. Again, you may choose not to believe these principles, but at least try to understand them. Number 1. The material universe is not all that exists. One of the scripture's primary messages is that the universe in which we live is a created one, having its origins in an eternal, spiritual realm that exists outside the scope of our physical senses. In John's Gospel, Jesus tells us that God is spirit. And it's this inexpressibly wise, loving, and all-powerful spirit who is the creator and sustainer of all things. His is the transcendent reality. Number 2. Man is a spiritual as well as a physical being. Genesis gives us the account of our origins. And the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life and the man became a living being. So God created man in his own image. In other words, spirit begat spirit. From the breath of God that gave us life, to his image impressed upon our hearts, you and I are spirits. And as spirits, the principles and the personalities that make up the spiritual world profoundly affect each of us whether we are aware of them or not. Number 3. As image bearers of God, the primary purpose for our existence is to know, enjoy, and glorify the One who created and redeemed us. Jesus declared, This is eternal life, to know God and the Savior whom He has sent. Continuing with the passage of Scripture we read a moment ago, the Father is looking for those who will worship Him in spirit and in truth. The worship spoken of here is not some dry religious exercise, but the natural response to knowing and experiencing God. And both biblically and scientifically, there is no more profound way to be drawn into and then express this experience than through music. As perhaps the greatest musician in history, Johann Sebastian Bach said, The end of all music should be the glory of God and the refreshment of the human spirit. Bow down before an important side note here, because we were created for worship, make no mistake about it, each of us will worship someone or something. For those who don't know God, this innate drive to worship, to find and then serve something that gives meaning and direction to one's life, will sublimate itself in a thousand different ways. Self, sex, money, family, honor, ease, country, pleasure, pain, power, false gods, art, knowledge, heroes, self, self, and more self. The capacity of the human heart to manufacture idols is practically limitless. And as we'll see, the music industry affords the perfect vehicle in which to do this. And isn't it interesting? How often this idolatry can even take on the very form and feel of religious worship. You gotta be the one.
Number four, through sin man fell and was separated from God. Throughout scripture, the words of God in Ezekiel are echoed again and again. The soul who sins shall die. The death spoken of here manifests itself in several ways, but most significantly in a spiritual sense, as through our sin we are separated from the God of all life and liberty, locked in our ego boxes. Subject to the tyranny of self and sin, we are no longer members of God's family, but instead walk according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit who now works in the sons of disobedience. As fallen creatures, who by our very nature are children of wrath, we are utterly incapable of redeeming ourselves before a just and holy God. Into this hopeless situation, God sent a Savior, His own Son, to pay the penalty for our sins, to destroy the power of this Prince of the Air, and to bring man back into His kingdom family. Number 5. The Kingdom of Darkness is Real and is the primary source of all opposition to God. The lord of this diabolical kingdom is the prince of the air, more commonly known as Satan or the devil. With the horde of wicked spirits at his command, he is called the god of this age, the world that is at war with the true god. Though cast down and defeated by Christ through the cross, he has power wherever people grant it to him through their obedience to his satanic law a law that we'll be looking at in greater detail later in this presentation. Wherever he's granted power, his task is essentially twofold. First, to stimulate the variety of lusts resident within the human heart, thereby degrading people as well as bringing them into greater bondage and control. For by what a man is overcome, by this also is he brought into bondage. Second to oppose Christians' efforts to bring others to Christ and thus steal away Satan's subjects. The battlefield here is the human mind and will. Using a variety of techniques, Satan's strategy is to fill us with lies, to convince us that black is white and evil good. I have to believe that sin can make a better man to help justify our sins and blind us to our need for a savior. To distort our image of God. Just a slob like one of us. And erase or trivialize our image of Satan, convincing us that he either doesn't exist or that he's a cartoon imp in red pajamas. Put simply, to blind the minds of the unbelieving so that they cannot see the light of the glory of Christ who is the image of God. Dead inside, dead inside Every single one of us The dead inside, dead inside, dead inside Every single one of us The dead inside Given its power over the heart of man Music is among the most potent carriers of this type of deception. Of course, any style of music can be perverted by evil. Many of the elements this presentation examines are found in other musical forms as well. The reason for our focus on rock, and by rock we mean the broad spectrum of popular music in all its forms, is both its unparalleled popularity and the manner in which it has given place to evil. Suddenly at first, then with increasing blatancy.
as rock's celebrants have been brought under its rhythmic sway, it has become one of the most potent weapons in Satan's arsenal of deception. Fortunately, Satan's historically proven tendency for overachieving has resulted in a blatancy that, when examined by an objective inquirer, can be used to expose the devil's presence and purposes. Hence, this presentation. Lay down your soul! Insane! And one last point before we begin to dust rock music for Satan's fingerprints. 2 Corinthians tells us that the devil can disguise himself as an angel of light. That he can, in other words, appear as something beautiful, even Christ-like. Beautiful child of God and man There's a Messiah inside of you yeah. Don't be fooled. Satan doesn't just manifest his power through a Hitler or a Charles Manson. He can use your favorite guitarist, a pretty pop singer, maybe even you. Anyone who resists the will of God is fertile soil for his seeds of deception. I try to understand my cause. There's nothing here. It's common today in our relativistic and ultra-democratic world to think that all gods, like all men, are created equal, that ultimately there's no real right or wrong, no transcendent good or evil. Artists like Mickey Hart can talk about communication with the gods like it's all pretty much the same thing. You have your god, and I have mine. It's no big deal. You got the right key, baby, but the wrong key, ho, yo! I'd like to thank uh, a higher power we call God for uh, seeing us through some amazing ups and downs. Well, the Bible, as we've just seen, says there's no bigger deal anywhere. There's only one God, the source of all life, truth, goodness, and beauty. Outside of Him and His loving dominion, there's evil. An evil we're born with and an evil that grows within us as we seek to live life on our own terms. And then there are the forces of wickedness in the spiritual realm that help us in this rebellion. Forces Ozzy Osbourne was ultimately referring to when he wondered if he was perhaps a medium for some outside force and then went on to say that he hoped it wasn't Satan. Ozzy does well to wonder, but wondering is not enough when it comes to those issues that go to the very heart of the truth, our lives, and our eternal destinies. We need to know, and we need to have the humility and the courage necessary to submit to this knowledge, regardless of where it leads. Over 2,000 years ago, the Chinese philosopher Mencius made a very perceptive observation about human nature. To act without clear understanding, to form habits without investigation, to follow a path all one's life without knowing where it really leads. Such is the behavior of the multitude. In the next section, Notes from the Underground, we'll look more closely at these habits, paths, and behaviors as commonly practiced in our postmodern world. And more importantly, we'll examine what T.S. Eliot, among others, referred to as the cult, the religious beliefs upon which our culture is based, and see how these beliefs and the gods they represent have materialized through the spiritual conduit of rock and roll.
have done a great job of opening the cerebral cortex and sweeping it clean of many of the game structures of Western society. But if we are going to break set and blow through the check valve of 2,000 years of Christian brainwashing, we need to pay more attention to guides and talismans developed by ancient pre-Christian religions. For example, this symbol was used by shamans going all the way back to the Aztecs and beyond. It's particularly incredible when you consider how closely it resembles the, the DNA, DNA helix, helix, which provides powerful support for McKenna's theories about tertiary alkaloids like psilocybin, or if you like, magic mushrooms, <laughs> providing the spark that fueled the sudden evolution of human consciousness. Now, your reading assignment for the rest of the semester, which I would highly recommend anyway, is generally considered to be the definitive work on the whole topic of using hallucinogens to reprogram the biocomputer that is the human Hey, Jeremy, man. Is this the book you've been talking about, bro? What? That book rocks. Dude, that will blow your mind. About my second time through it, I got this idea for a new song, kind of like a journey to the center of your mind type of trip. And I was thinking we could take some quotes from Lyria's translation of the Tibetan Book of the Dead. Here's what I got so far. Like the proverbial frog in the pot, happy to stay put as long as the heat is turned up slowly, Western culture, as in the parable we just saw, has become increasingly steeped in a virtual witch's cauldron of occult thought and practice. What began as an excursion into paganism on the part of a handful of philosophers, artists, educators, and other so-called free thinkers has now become part of the very fabric of Western culture. From sex magic to tattooing, New Age religion to open Satan worship, occult practices that have been progressively eradicated by the advancing influence of the Christian gospel over nearly two millennia, are now back with a vengeance. And it's here where our story becomes very interesting because, as you're about to see, art in general and music most specifically became a primary channel for an occult revival. To understand at least the outline of the big picture here, we're going to begin with a quick history lesson. If you're not interested in these types of more academic pursuits, feel free to skip ahead a few minutes to the end of the primer. The big picture starts several hundred years ago. Beginning roughly in the 15th century, Western civilization began to experience some profound changes brought about by the confluence of a few key cultural trends and events. First, there was the Renaissance, the great age of discovery and exploration. Modern science, which as most objective historians and scientists will attest, was born out of the Christian worldview, began to experience a quantum leap in growth. Discoveries in astronomy, physics and mathematics in particular began to hold forth the promise that man could, as Kepler said, think God's thoughts after him and truly begin to plumb the mysteries of creation. Simultaneously, the voyages of the great explorers circumscribed the planet, dramatically expanding man's horizons and opportunities. During this same period, the printing press was invented, and suddenly there was an efficient means by which this new knowledge could be recorded and circulated. The next key movement began in 1517, when a German monk by the name of Martin Luther challenged the institutional church 
and launched the Reformation. Suddenly, the church, which heretofore had in many ways dominated European life and thought, was now seen as distinctly human, flawed, and as a result, open to being questioned. Increasingly, scientists and philosophers, while for the most part still holding to a belief in God, began to pursue knowledge with a diminishing regard for the frame of reference of, first, the church, and then finally, God and His Word. By the 17th and 18th centuries, these movements culminated in what is commonly termed the Age of Reason and the Enlightenment. While Christian thought continued to exert great influence, particularly in England and America, more and more the architects of Western culture viewed the God hypothesis as increasingly irrelevant. Human reason was king, and by the middle of the 19th century, most notably with the publication of Darwin's Origin of the Species, the modern era was in full bloom. As Enlightenment principles took hold, however, a number of problems began to emerge, and suddenly rationalism didn't seem to be the savior so many hoped it would be. First, as the Cartesian foundation for knowledge supplanted the classical Christian formulation, philosophers and scientists began to run up against the limits inherent in independent human thought. Slowly, the great hope of the French encyclopedists and others that man's reason alone could penetrate the mysteries of life began to crumble. By the middle of the 20th century, the twin discoveries of relativity and quantum theory nailed the coffin of classical materialism shut. Another serious setback occurred when the French Revolution, in many instances a well-intentioned experiment in Enlightenment humanism, went horribly awry. With the guillotine and the reign of terror, naked human reason was seen to be capable of the worst sort of atrocities. And again, the 20th century, most notably through its various communist revolutions, has only driven this point further into the ground. And finally, as far as this summary is concerned, there was the irrepressibility of the human spirit. Despite materialism's cold insistence that all that existed was matter and its motion, man's innate thirst for meaning, redemption, and transcendence simply refused to go away. And the scriptures tell us why, for he has put eternity in their hearts. This God-shaped vacuum as the famed philosopher and mathematician Blaise Pascal called it, goes to the very core of man's existence and cannot be filled by any created thing, but only by God the Creator, made known through Jesus Christ. But, as we've just seen, this Christian solution was no longer acceptable to the supposedly enlightened architects of this modern era. New solutions had to be found as everything from primitive naturalism, radical individualism, intense subjective experience, a classless society, psychoanalysis, and the alchemy of the subconscious mind, and altered states of consciousness, were trotted out by the intelligentsia to fill the vacuum left by the rejection of God. Ironically, by the latter half of the 19th century, the great revolt against the Christian worldview an incremental revolution that was supposedly sparked and sustained by man's bold quest for rational knowledge had become progressively irrational, and everything that has followed in its wake has only served to confirm Chesterton's famous observation. The first effect of not believing in God is to believe in anything. Among the anythings that people began to believe are a number of irrational ideas that are still very much with us today. Belief number one, all religions are equally valid. With the foundations of Christendom being set aside, people ran everywhere in search of answers to the mysteries that science had either refused to acknowledge or failed to penetrate. European colonization in India, China, and Africa in particular sparked a major revival of Eastern and occult religions in the West. Belief number two, a corollary of number one. 
primitive cultures, because they are closer to man's natural, uncivilized state, contain truth the Christian West has lost or suppressed. This idea was popularized first by Rousseau and then later by the writers and artists of the Romantic school. The influential German philosopher and key initiator of the God is Dead movement, Friedrich Nietzsche, pushed the envelope even further by calling for a literal reversal of Christian values, substituting instead the will to power and a more primal, what he termed Dionysian approach to everything from philosophy to sexual ethics. And it's also quite significant that Nietzsche and other metaphysicians saw music as a primary carrier of this new ethos. In response to these potent ideas, all manner of occult thought and practice began to spread throughout Europe and eventually America. Seances and spiritualist societies became increasingly popular. Foreign service personnel, enamored with the sex cults of Hinduism, wrote tracks introducing these arcane practices to a wider audience looking not only for mystery and meaning, but new ways of gratifying their flesh. Theosophists and the Illuminati spread the gospel of occult enlightenment, making particular inroads in academia and secret societies like the Masons. New drugs were introduced, along with the occult notion that they could be used to spark the fire of psychic enlightenment. In England, Yeats took mescaline and joined the Golden Dawn. Shelley practiced ritual occultism, free love and satanic blasphemy, dying young and leaving behind the troubled founder of modern horror. The Hashish Club in Paris was frequented by Baudelaire, Dumas, Flaubert, Rambeau and others. Their school of Romanticism perfected the now common practice of divorcing art from morality, producing art for its own sake, while celebrating Dionysian madness, triggered often by alcohol and drugs, as a key to literal inspiration. Gurus, prophets, ascended masters, shamans, witches, mahatmas, alchemists, and New Age messiahs flourished, and the river of occult thought became progressively mainstream. And nowhere was this stream more powerful, wider, flowing into more lives than when it coursed through the channel of art, and its most potent form, a new style of music that came out of Africa via the Caribbean and the port city of New Orleans, a music whose rhythm patterns serve as conduits for spiritual energies, linking individual human consciousness with the gods. And as we'll see, these spiritual energies help fashion a new world and a new type of worshiper, remade in the image of these gods. Well, having outlined the historical backdrop, let's now connect the dots using a few brief examples that closely follow the pattern we outline in the dramatic piece that opened this section. The story is a broad one with a million subtexts and minor characters. But we can grasp the essential plot, and I mean that in every sense of the word, by focusing on a few main players and events. We'll begin with the religion and ritual music of what we'll call shamanism, although it has dozens of different names and permutations based upon culture, continent, and ethnicity. As a musical form, it's identified not so much by its primary emphasis on rhythm as by the use of these rhythms, coupled with repetition and the relative simplicity of the music to induce a form of trance state. Shamanistic music, in turn, purposely uses these states of altered consciousness, often enhanced by the use of drugs, to dissolve inhibitions and tap into primal energies, heighten sensuality, boldness, resistance to physical and psychic pain, and contact with spirits are among the intended byproducts of the performance. Well, using our analogy, any number of modern intellectuals became interested in shamanistic cultures, thinking that they perhaps held a key to enlightenment and human evolution. 
Aldous Huxley, for example, the renowned British writer and intellectual, explored mystical experiences far and wide, finally experimenting with psychotropic drugs and advocating their use as a tool of enlightenment. His 1954 work, The Doors of Perception, titled from a line by William Blake's Gnostic treatise, The Marriage of Heaven and Hell, became a classic of psychedelic literature. A decade later, the book, as well as Blake's writings, became the inspiration for both the name and the spirit behind one of the most influential bands in rock, The Doors. Let's swim to the moon, uh -huh. let's climb through the tide. Keyboardist Ray Manzarek explained, at the time, we had been ingesting a lot of psychedelic chemicals, so the doors of perception were cleansed in our own minds. And we saw the music as a vehicle to, in a sense, become proselytizers of a new religion, a religion of self, of each man as God. That was the original idea behind the doors. I read a little bit about shamanism, you know, what we see. Uh, with the music and that kind of thing. The shaman, in defining his role in, in society, he's just more interested in um, uh, pursuing his own fantasies. Let's reinvent the gods, all the myths of the ages. Celebrate symbols from deep elder forests. We need great golden copulations. Where did the God of the Bible fit in Morrison's new theology? Petition the Lord with prayer. You cannot petition the Lord with prayer! After deconstructing both Christianity and Western culture, he wonders what should take its place. And what was that new something? Reinvented gods, the ancient ones, the shaman, the wild child, disorder and chaos, a snake who's old and whose skin is cold. Manzarek described the transformation of Morrison, the Lizard King, as these spirit guides came over him in concert. It was a psychological horror, freak show in the sense of the shaman, the sense of possession. Morrison was the shaman who took people on a mystical journey to a darker psychic realm. And guitarist Robbie Krieger added his perspective. We were revivalists, he said, as well as musicians, and wanted our audience to undergo a religious experience. Well, millions of fans underwent this religious experience, following the doors and dozens of other psychedelic bands into the mystical new age envisioned earlier by Huxley. The reason for the doors, the raison d'etre for the doors, was making music to plug yourself into the vibrations of the planet, harmonize your inner vibration with the vibration of the audience, the human beings, vibrating in harmony together. It becomes, it's, it, it's like a pagan, it's like some sort of a mystical Christ, the, uh, uh, the release of... Uh, Kundalini, the Kundalini power expanding in your body and curling and coiling upwards. Uh, the Aquarian age in which we'll finally begin to merge all the religions and sciences and arts and whatnot and we'll all realize that we are gods. Jim Morrison was a god to himself. I'm a god unto myself. We are all gods unto ourselves. So to put it outside of yourself is a seeking, uh, is, is, is a false messiah. That's a messianic. That's the, the end of 2,000 years of the culture and the religion that we're involved in now. The LSD trip. I salute the God with him. There's a religious pilgrimage. The LSD kick. I salute the goddess within you. It's a religious ecstasy. 
Following a very similar tack was the grand old man of the psychedelic 60s, Timothy Leary. Psychologist, Harvard professor, and consummate free thinker, Leary coined what may have been the essential mantra of the rock and roll revolution. Turn on, tune in, and drop out. We're turned on, and we're tuned in, and we're very dropped out. Turn on, tune in, and drop out. Turn on, tune in, and drop out. What I'm saying happens to be the oldest method of human wisdom. Look within, find your own divinity, detach yourself from social and material struggle. Turn on, tune in, and drop out. In what may be one of the most telling private conversations in modern history, Leary recalled the first time he took psilocybin with Aldous Huxley. Huxley's eyes were closed, he said. Suddenly, he clapped his hands. Your role is quite simple, Huxley told Leary. Become a cheerleader for evolution. That's what I did and my grandfather before me. These brain drugs will bring about vast changes in society. We must spread the word. Huxley then continued with a chilling addendum. The obstacle to this evolution, Timothy, is the Bible. Leary, like Huxley, spent his life as a cheerleader for evolution, tearing down the foundations of Christendom and erecting in its place a syncretistic blend of Eastern religion, shamanism, and a do-it-yourself drug-fueled enlightenment. Our Father, who art in cellular heaven within, hallowed be thy name, from whose loins we have sprung. And a primary tool for advancing this New Age gospel? You got it, rock and roll. One pill makes you larger. Speaking of the psychedelic bands that dotted the 60s landscape, Groups that increasingly embraced his occult views, Leary declared, I rejoice to see our culture being taken over by joyful young messiahs who dispel our fears and charm us back into the pagan dance of harmony. In an essay Leary wrote at the time, he actually spoke of God becoming incarnate in a particular band. He or she, he said, has come back as the four-sided Mandela, the Beatles, the means by which to spread the new gospel, music, the sacrament, drugs. And in what became the virtual model for our opening vignette, John Lennon became so enamored with Leary's thought and practice, he used his translation of the Tibetan Book of the Dead in the lyrics for the 1966 release, Tomorrow Never Knows. It is not Observing the impact of both this song and, a year later, the groundbreaking Sgt. Pepper's Lonely Hearts Club Band album, Leary once again extolled the power of music to affect social change by sparking a form of religious awakening. First, Leary said, you started with rock and roll, and then you add psychedelic drugs. Millions of kids turned on pharmacologically, listening to stoned-out electronic music designed specifically for the suggestible, psychedelicized nervous system by stoned-out, long-haired minstrels. This combination of electrical pharmacological expansion is the most powerful brainwashing device our planet has ever known, an instrument for evangelic education propaganda that few people over the age of 30 can comprehend. They're laying down a new revelation, the journey to the East. And the East is precisely where the brainwashed multitudes found themselves. The Beatles, the Stones, and the Beach Boys, among many other rock stars, followed the same trajectory described by George Harrison. When I was younger, with the after effects of the LSD that opened something up inside me in 1966, a flood of other thoughts came into my head which led me to the yogis. Having embraced Krishna consciousness, Harrison purposely used his music, as Leary described it, for evangelic education. In a 1982 interview with the ex-Beatle, Vedic scholar Mukanda Goswami observed, 
I don't think it's possible to calculate just how many people were turned on to Krishna consciousness by your song, My Sweet Lord. And Harrison replied, My idea in My Sweet Lord, because it sounded like a pop song, was to sneak up on them a bit. The point was to have people not offended by Hallelujah. And by the time it gets to Hare Krishna, they're already hooked, and their foot's tapping, and they're already singing along, to lull them into a sense of false security. And, as in our opening piece, multitudes of fans were and are, quote, snuck up on, not just by this song, but through an avalanche of artists and anthems extolling the virtues of everything from reefer to reincarnation, new age spirituality to hardcore Satanism. And while few are led into full-blown devotion, many of the distinctives of occult thought have gained more than a foothold in the thinking of most Westerners. Among them, the denial of either Christ's divinity or his uniqueness the mockery or trivialization of Christian faith and symbols, the embrace of pagan practices like ritual cutting, piercing, and tattooing, as well as the use of drugs, trance states, and occult customs and iconography. And, perhaps most significantly, the proliferation of the distinctly Eastern and occult notion that God is an impersonal force that lives in everything and everyone so that values and morality are relative to the individual I will live by my own policies. and therefore with no absolute standard of righteousness there can be no ultimate judgment no heaven or hell imagine there's no heaven If you try No hell below us Above us only sky John Lennon's most famous song is among the few truly universal and instantly recognizable anthems that rock has produced. John Lennon recorded Imagine on a Thursday. The only song that has been broadcast to most of the world via the United Nations and in perhaps the most surreal performance of all, the closing ceremony of the 1996 Summer Olympics. Not only is the song fundamentally communistic, not only does it hold forth the unattainable and ultimately occult notion of a man-made utopia, but by denying the existence of heaven, hell, and finally even God, Lenin, and apparently much of the world, seeks to deny the one thing that holds tyrants in check and that guarantees individual human freedom and dignity. What Lenin has, quote, imagined would be nothing less than hell on earth. We could spend days examining the vast panorama of occult thought and practice that has been mainstreamed through the contemporary music culture. But let's continue Notes from the Underground by taking just a few snapshots of some of the more crucial collusions between rock and the satanic. We'll see that David Bowie was more right than probably he ever imagined when he stated, Rock has always been the devil's music. I believe that it's dangerous. It could well bring about a very evil feeling in the West, a dark era. I feel that we're only heralding something even darker than ourselves. It's been well said that a person is known by the company he or she keeps. Well, in the world of rock and roll, there's one guy who pops up so often, you'd think he'd invented the backbeat. The Beatles featured him 
along with Aldous Huxley and four Hindu masters, on the cover of their Sgt. Pepper's album. The photo montage was made up of what they called people we like and admire and our heroes. Their choice was a significant one. Aleister Crowley is generally considered to be the most important and influential occultist of the 20th century. Clever, well-educated, and a prolific writer, Crowley was a walking encyclopedia of occult thought and practice. Dubbed the wickedest man in the world by the British press, Crowley preferred his own pseudonym, The Great Beast 666. In August of 1914, the World Magazine published an account of some of the semi-public ceremonies Crowley held in London. Journalist Harry Kemp attended one such ritual and noted, Then came the slow, monotonous chant of the High Priest. There is no good, evil is good, all hail Prince of the World, to whom even God himself has given dominion. Kemp continued, sounding for all the world, like he was describing any number of contemporary rock concerts. Men and women danced about, leaping and swaying to the whining of infernal and discordant music. They sang obscene words. Women tore their bodices, some partially disrobed. One fair worshiper, seizing upon the high priest's dagger, wounded herself in the breasts. At this, all seemed to go madder than ever. Such was Crowley's ministry at the age of 39. By the time he died 33 years later, fearful, sobbing, and with the last words, I am perplexed, upon his lips, his dark legacy had reached sufficient critical mass to almost single-handedly, in the words of occult writer Robert Anton Wilson, spark a worldwide revival of paganism. Well, in 1918, Crowley uh, took a great magical oath, which was a serious thing for Crowley. And he took an oath that he would surrender all of his magical powers that he had achieved until that date to concentrate his energy single-pointedly on the one task of uh, destroying Christianity and uh, reviving uh, paganism. And I think if you look around the world, it's pretty obvious that Crowley has been uh, a remarkable success. The paganism has made a big comeback in an organized way neo-pagan groups and in an unorganized way our whole society has become more pagan. I'll tell you, when I was a kid I read Robert Anton Wilson and all this shit, and here we are, we're standing here, we're talking about this shit, and it's real. If you do these things that you're told by Arthur Crowley, if you actually do what they say, things happen. Things occur exactly as it's described, and we can all do it. In 1971, Timothy Leary had an epiphany during a tarot reading that utilized a set of cards designed by Crowley. His revelation? That he was Crowley Reborn and was to complete the work Crowley began, preparing humanity for cosmic consciousness. Leary acknowledged this powerful connection with the great beast in a letter to Wilson, observing that the coincidences, synchronicities between my life and his are embarrassing. From this connection flowed frequent references to Crowley, his philosophy, and their common destinies in Leary's writings and speech. Well, I've been an admirer of Aleister Crowley. I think that uh, I'm carrying on much of the work that uh, he started uh, over 100 years ago, and I think the 60s themselves. You know, Crowley said, uh, um, he was in favor of, uh, of uh, finding your own self and, and uh, uh, do what thou wilt shall be the whole of the law under love. It was a very powerful statement. I'm sorry he isn't around now to appreciate the glories that he started. The phrase, do what thou wilt, was taken from the Book of the Law, Crowley's most renowned work and one whose composition is worth understanding in the context of our study. 
While visiting Egypt in 1904, Crowley's first wife, Rose, began going into spontaneous trances, muttering things like, They are waiting for you. And he who was waiting was Horus. Intrigued, Crowley and Rose went to visit the Cairo Museum. From a distance, she spied a glass case and exclaimed, There, there he is. Upon inspection, the case did contain an image of Horus painted on a wooden stele, but what particularly stunned Crowley was its exhibit number, 666, his number, the number of the beast. Convinced now that something supernatural was happening, Crowley went back to his hotel and performed a ritual, summoning this higher power. Over three successive days, beginning on April 8th, the book was channeled through Crowley while in a trance. And the content of this revelation? I am the snake that giveth knowledge, the spirit said. To worship me, take wine and strange drugs, whereof I will tell my prophet. Falling on precisely the wrong side of the Bible's account concerning the fall of man and Satan's role, this snake spirit begins the revelation by telling man that he is a god, that reality is essentially an illusion, sin a myth, and that ethically there's no greater commandment than the law of Philema, Greek for will, as famously stated in the 40th verse of chapter 1. Do what thou wilt shall be the whole of the law. We do what we want to do when we want to do it. Well, today that same law has been written, spoken, or sung about by more contemporary artists than even Robert Anton Wilson would have imagined. John Lennon, Jim Morrison, the Black Crows Chris Robinson, and Marilyn Manson have all trotted it out in one form or another as words to live by. Harry Smith inserted it into the original handbook that came with his renowned anthology of American folk music. It shows up in songs by Mudvayne. David Bowie, The Only Ones, The Electric Hellfire Club, Alphaville, Throbbing Gristle, Numb, Ancient Ceremony, Eddie and the Hot Rods, Death SS, Theater of Tragedy, Cult Disciples, Therion, Psychic TV, Celtic Frost, Bruce Dickinson, Moonspell, Graham Bond, Sepultura, Edge of Sanity, The Lords of the New Church, and Marilyn Manson, among others. The band 311 not only uses Crowley's law as a lyric, the bass player had it tattooed on his leg, as well as Crowley's tree of life design on his back. Punk band Unwritten Law had Crowley's law written on their concert t-shirts. I'm closer to the golden dawn Immersed in Crowley's uniform of imagery. Among rock artists who have studied and embraced aspects of Crowley's magical system, Daryl Hall, Sting, Coyle, and Killing Joke, among many others, could relate at some point in their careers to Bowie's comment. My overriding interest was in Kabbalah and Crowleyism the whole dark and rather fearsome neverworld of the wrong side of the brain. Director Donald Kamel, the man behind the underground film performance, used to enjoy telling friends that, as a child, he would sometimes be bounced on the knee of the wickedest man in the world. Significantly, the film starred the Stones Mick Jagger, 
and Anita Pallenberg, herself a devoted occultist, and explored nihilism and insanity through the metaphor of rock and roll. The only performance that makes it, that really makes it, that makes it all the way, is the one that achieves madness, right? Kamel also played the role of Osiris in Lucifer Rising, the film by another Crowley devotee, Kenneth Anger. Anger directed and produced a number of occult films that utilized the talents of rockers Marion Faithful, Mick Jagger, Jimmy Page, and Bobby Beausoleil, another Crowleyite who was later convicted of murder in relation to the Manson cult. And Led Zeppelin's Jimmy Page's fascination with the Great Beast is so notorious, it rates its own link on a website dedicated to Crowleyana. From studying magic as an adolescent, purchasing Crowley's old house, buying an occult bookstore and naming it after a periodical Crowley published, inscribing Do What Thou Wilt onto the runoff vinyl for the first pressing of Led Zeppelin III, even acting out rituals on stage that look an awful lot like those described by the Beast in his, quote, instructions to his magical order. Page meant it when he said, I've employed his system in my own day-to-day -day life. While few artists have shown the same level of dedication to Crowley's life and philosophy as Page, or the members of Coil, or any number of satanic metal bands, there's one sense in which Crowley's legacy has become central to the spirit of most of rock and roll. We'll discuss this in more detail in part eight of this series. But for now, understand that his primary message was simply, find your true will and then do it. Thou hast no right but to do thy will. Do that and no other shall say nay. Every man and every woman is a star. Which, when you boil it down, really means there is no God but man. This is not to say literally that there's no God. Satan knows there is, as do all men, if but just deep in their hearts. The crux of Crowley's demonic creed was just that each individual has no higher authority than their own will, that we are free to live life as we please. And this was the lie that the serpent hissed in the garden, and the deception that has become the siren chorus that floats through the world of popular music. Another way to dust for Satan's fingerprints is to examine the signs and symbols that are used within the culture of rock and roll. Even as words have etymological roots, so do symbols and gestures. And we can learn a lot about a movement or a culture by tracing where those roots lead to. For example, Hitler's National Socialist Party, the Nazis, used as its primary icon the Twisted Cross or swastika. Well, it's no accident that this same symbol had been embraced as a powerful talisman during the occult revivals that immediately preceded the Third Reich. Madame Blavatsky's Theosophical Society, for example, used the swastika in their official seal. Significant? Well, understand that Theosophy's influence was considerable among Western intellectuals and counterculturalists, particularly in Germany. Among their many teachings was a Gnostic theory of racial superiority and purity as a key to the evolution of a superhuman race. There's little doubt that Hitler's racial theories and the icons he used to represent them were taken from the occult world of Blavatsky and others. In short, one can understand the fruit by looking at the root. Well, Rock and roll is awash in any number of signs and symbols that have their roots in either the occult world 
or in the Bible's symbolic representations of evil. The pentagram or pentacle, for example, has a long history in the occult world, as well as in the culture of rock and roll. Ditto the Il Cornuto, or horned hand, a symbol used in occult circles to represent the horned god Satan. Contextually, it can be used in a benign way, save for example, to represent the Texas Longhorns. But in the dark, rebellious, and carnal world of rock, there's little doubt as to its ultimate significance, whether people are aware of it or not. Then there's the infamous goat head, Judas goat, or Baphomet, a symbol whose only context is within the so-called left-hand path, voodoo, Satanism, the Golden Dawn, the doodlings of self-confessed satanic serial killer Richard Ramirez, and more than a few rock bands. Kiss that goat! Occult fortune-telling devices like tarot cards and Ouija boards are also not uncommon, with at least two bands claiming to have used the Ouija to divine their names. David Bowie consulted both it and a crystal ball in developing the character of Ziggy Stardust, the androgynous messiah who scrambled so many people's definitions of truth, authenticity, and sexuality in the 1970s. Then there are the various distortions of the Christian cross, among them the Southern Cross or Upside Down Cross, and the Satanic Cross, which was used as the group symbol for Blue Oyster Cult. Not talking about the light up above, I'm talking about the hellfire down below, that's right, that's a Lucifer light. Even as the occult world loves to mock the cross and everything holy in the Bible, it's also quick to embrace the scripture's images of evil. Most notable, perhaps, is the dreaded Mark of the Beast, or 666, the consummate number of man in his rebellion against God. The number has become so closely associated with contemporary music culture that rock journalists frequently use it as shorthand to represent the industry's obvious commitment to rebellion, sex, chaos, and, well, evil. In the same way, every demon in the Bible, every alternative name for Satan, and many of the evil people found in either the scriptures or in the Judeo-Christian tradition make an appearance in one form or another. For example, when Sarah McLachlan went looking for a name for the popular tour that showcased female performers, she settled on Lilith Fair. And who was Lilith? Well, the mythological first wife of Adam, who was thrown out of the garden for her unwillingness to submit to either God or her husband. She was Adam's first wife before Eve and wanted to be treated equally, yet he refused her that. And so she took off, said, fine, I don't need this. She's such a strong and wonderful feminist figure, yet we've never been taught that. So I feel really proud to put her back on her rightful goddess position. The Lilith Fair was far more subversive and uh, satanic than anything that I could have done because uh, here you have people playing this very uh, innocuous folk music that's uh, providing America with a lot of very dangerous ideas about women's sexuality. Manson nailed it. Lilith may look cute and have a sweet voice, but her rebellion against God's authority begins and ends in hell. To excuse all this as meaningless metaphor or Halloweenish, just kidding hijinks is refusing to see the forest for all of the trees. We could spend hours documenting other examples of this sign language, but let's finish with one that is particularly interesting because it's more subtle, operating on a more subliminal level. If one were to survey the pantheon of world religions and attempt to identify the, quote, deities that best personify salvation through chaos, death, and madness, two at the top of the list would be the Prince of Darkness, under one of his many names, and the Hindu goddess Kali. 
Interestingly, they share many things in common, but one of the more curious as regards our analysis is the whole tongue thing. Kali is normally depicted, along with the necklace of human skulls, with her tongue sticking out. And anecdotal information provided by people who have consorted with the devil in some form or fashion paints a very similar picture. Keeping in mind the bigger picture we've just looked at, ask yourself, could there be any spiritual application here to the world of rock and roll? The Stones freely acknowledge that their famous logo was based in part on Kali. The goddess Kali, and the goddess Kali has this disembodied tongue that sticks out. So. And protruding tongues are second only to the extended middle finger as the universal symbol of rock and roll rebellion. Shrug it off if you can, but God isn't laughing. You sons of the sorceress, whom do you ridicule? Against whom do you make a wide mouth and stick out the tongue? Are you not children of transgression? offspring of falsehood, inflaming yourselves with gods under every green tree. Let your collection of idols deliver you, but the wind will carry them all away. A breath will take them. But he who puts his trust in me shall possess the land and shall inherit my holy mountain. Of course, we're not suggesting that every time a tongue is stuck at it represents this level of demonic rebellion, any more than this hand gesture always represents Satan. But clearly, in certain contexts, it can have a deeper, darker, and more spiritual significance. And given the rock and roll industry's occult foundations and its blind embrace of chaos and rebellion, one would have to be either incredibly naive are willfully blind not to admit that something very strange is going on here. Like it or not, where buzzards flock, there's dead meat. And you can be sure that where the icons, signs, and symbols of evil gather, that real evil is not too far away. There's a whole new generation of young people but who are uh, discovering that psychedelic plants and vegetables can be used for trance experiences. It's called acid house music. Uh, uh, the, the basic uh, strategy here is uh, you set up a hypnotic trance experience uh, with either LSD and uh, or XTC, and you just kind of dance for four hours. And then there are certain words, mantras that come in and out. It's amazing how another generation intuitively, instinctively developed the group shamanic uh, experience, and uh, uh, it's becoming very, very popular in Europe and this country. Nowhere is the occult world more powerfully realized in contemporary music than in the confluence of DJs, hypnotic rhythms, strobing lights, covert all-night parties, drug usage, and new age ideologies that define much of the rave subculture. I mean, the hippies talk about it for ages. Dawning of the age of Aquarius. It's here, it's coming, two years now. It's here, you know? Listen and be reborn. What began as an underground phenomenon often relegated to exotic locales in India and the Mediterranean, has become mainstream, with events drawing thousands of people in cities around the world. But as we've seen throughout this series, there's a lot more going on than just music and people having a good time. Both the musicians and the audience understand that there's a profound spiritual vibe going on as well. You should let go of all your inhibitions and dance your f***ing socks off. Because um, that letting go process will open you up. You can't bottle the feeling of just 
total euphoria. Like when a DJ just brings you like to this level where you're just like totally out of your head. Your consciousness is expanded because of this supernatural thing that happened to you. As close as you can get to God, this is the closest I've ever felt to being with God. Rave music and techno music and the new dance music is the flowering of new, new spirituality. This new spirituality is in fact quite old. The cultivation of altered states of consciousness through a variety of techniques and substances that have been used shamanistically for thousands of years. Let's go back to you know, indigenous cultures, to the ancient civilizations, you know, shamanistically, you know, it was part of the ritual you would take, you know, there were certain drugs that would open up certain levels of consciousness. So when you surrendered yourself into the dance, into the ritual, into the collective organism, you have this, you are opening yourself up. It's just, it's just, it's a key. On his website, Decker is very specific about the means by which his band will help his audience open up. Medicine Drum are modern shamans, he says, the techno-pagans of electronica. They take the listener on an incredible journey into psychedelic trance. And Decker has loads of company. There are hundreds of bands and DJs who view their music in precisely the same way, as a form of techno-paganism, a gateway into trance and the spiritual world. Goa Gill, perhaps the most revered of the techno-tribal DJs, cut to the bottom line when he declared, music has gone through a complete cycle. It started in ancient times with tribal drumming, and now it's come back to tribal trance techno. I'm basically just using this whole party situation as a medium to do magic, to remake the tribal pagan ritual for the 21st century. It's an initiation. Quite often, these shamanistic experiences are intensified with the use of drugs, expanded now through modern pharmacology to include new and powerful psychotropics, including LSD, E or ecstasy, G, and special K. When you drop this chemical bomb into your neurosystem, you are cutting up all your previous inherited perception of what we call reality. Everyone suddenly has shamanic experience for a couple of dollars. And then there's the use of light and sound to manipulate. Most DJs would say accentuate everything from metabolic rates to brainwave activity and states of consciousness. Whether we're talking about in training or photic and auditory driving, the terminology may be more sophisticated, but make no mistake about it, these alterations are based, often consciously, on occultic, shamanistic formulas. Indigenous rituals performed by Shaman in the Peruvian Amazon and stuff, they would beat a drum at a certain number of wave cycles per second in modern club culture and in seeing modern club events and modern rave events and things like that you're seeing people in training in the same brain state you've got strobes you have lighting that everyone's taking in you have big time photic driving and the music is auditory driving that's why people get so excited for rock concert and tear up the seat it's because their metabolism is being governed by the bass and the rhythm and the light. And that's what it's all about. It has reduced down in the West for the first time to a ritual which admits to and utilizes the most arcane and ancient methods for achievement of altered states and a celebration of that contact with others. But what is this otherness that ravers often come in contact with? Into what are they being reborn? Reborn. Before we answer that, allow me to again say that we're not questioning people's conscious intent or their sincerity. I know that many ravers don't use drugs and an even greater number really enjoy and are even comforted by the often sincere sense of community that a rave can produce. And compared to the brain deadness of a hardcore mosh pit, a rave can seem even sublime. But sincerity and new age goosebumps 
are not the ultimate arbiters of truth. As always, we need to look at both the methodologies and the fruit through the lens of Scripture. And in that context, what we find once again departs from the true faith and gives clear heed to deceiving spirits and doctrines of demons. Not only do we find drug abuse, including the not infrequent overdose, not only do we encounter sexual immorality, sometimes reaching levels that rival the orgies of the ancient cult of Dionysus. But preeminently, whenever spirituality becomes open and ritualized, it invariably clothes itself in the garb of pagan and Eastern religions. You've seen him a million times, the dancing deity in the ring of fire, the image of the Hindu god Shiva. In searching for my personal connection to best explain these roots of trans dancing from ancient India, I felt I needed to go deeper than books. I felt the need to invoke Shiva. So last night, as I prepared to go to a party at the Dimension 7 warehouse in San Francisco, I considered my intention for the evening. I wanted to become a sacred temple dancer. I knew I was on target when I arrived and immediately was greeted by a large bronze statue of Shiva dominating the altar in front of the DJ. Shiva had indeed been invoked. The magic had been spun and the time had come for me to experience my devotional dance. The techno beat morphed in my head, the mesmerizing drone of devotional songs being repeated over and over again. Ecstatically allowing the trance to overtake me, I felt my body gyrate in unfamiliar ways that seemed as old as Shiva himself. I was able to leave my body and observe myself in this new, old incarnation. The trance dance spiraled me into the deep meanings of these movements. So this must have been the justification for the nights of wild sex I've read about in those Hindu temples. It is obvious to me that they were also in the trance, induced by the rhythmic music of their own blissful states. I wondered what local concoctions the devotees imbibed. After all, Shiva is the god of sex and drugs and rock and roll. Within the warm, protective womb of Western, specifically Christian culture, these heartfelt observations may read like nothing more than a recipe for personal enlightenment. But both the Bible and the cultures that live within the full force of these demonic doctrines declare otherwise. There is a way that seems right to a man, but its end is the way of death. The devil's music. Bands like KISS and Megadeth may try to trivialize charges of occult influence through ridicule. Megadeth fans, are you ready to sell your soul to the devil? But when axes aren't being ground, even rock apologists will acknowledge this dark side, as in this cover story by the British rock magazine Mojo. How rock and roll really did dance with the devil. The 1960s witnessed an occult revival, the likes of which hadn't been seen in the West since the fin du siècle days of Madame Blavatsky's Theosophical Society and Aleister Crowley's Golden Dawn. For some artists and individuals in and around the rock music industry, this dance with the devil is both literal and intentional. And we feel that a cleansing of the idiot ideology of the pallid, incompetent Christ is uh, in order. And so uh, this is something that the Church of Satan is conducting on many different avenues. We're doing this through the use of uh, uh, what we have called aesthetic terrorism. Uh, this involves the creative use of art, uh, music, writing, uh, effectively what we call propaganda, the dissemination of information to influence uh, what we call iron age. Am I the son of the wayboard? Am I the chosen one? To be a messiah on earth and to sit at your left hand. The truth 
create the most evilest music and to gain entrance into the seven gates of hell. Do you believe in demonic possession? Of course. Are you possessed? Of course. Well, there's a, a clear, at least I assume there's a clear satanic influence in your work. Is that real or is that a sort of tongue-in-cheek humor that you know, have? No, that's as real as it gets. Um, but your art certainly, it seems to express the stereotype of Satanism. Uh, yeah, but I use that specifically to bash the church. <laughs> Why? Because that's really what Satanism is to me. It's anti-Christianity. Both the Bible and human experience make it clear that the vast majority of people who live under the power of sin and Satan are unaware of it, at least consciously. Salvation then is described as a process whereby God gives people grace so that they may know the truth, that they may come to their senses and escape the snare of the devil having been taken captive by him to do his will. The scriptures also address how these same senses can be progressively seduced until people can't tell, spiritually speaking, up from down, their right hand from their left, as they walk as the Gentiles walk, in the futility of their mind having their understanding darkened. The eventual result, individuals and, if left unchecked, eventually a culture in which this darkness reigns, where evil becomes good and good evil, and where finally even the occult and Satan himself become acceptable, even cool. Father Lucifer, you never look so sane. You always did prefer the drizzle to the rain. Tell me that you're still in love with that milkmaid. How's your Jesus Christ been hanging? Sounding for all the world like Crowley and LaVey, Tori Amos told Spin Magazine about her love for Lucifer, a Latin name for Satan. I wanted to marry Lucifer. Lucifer was the brother holding the space for mankind to act out their fears and hidden secrets, things they won't acknowledge. That's what the shadow is, and once you don't deny your shadow anymore, then it's not a perversion of that energy source. I don't consider Lucifer an evil force. We can all tap into that free-running current of distorted energy. She went on to talk about him on a more personal note. I feel such a sadness from him, she said. I cry and feel his presence with his music. I feel like he comes and sits on my piano. Yet this is a pretty serious being. I'm a little squirt when you think what a very serious force this is. Avant-garde artist Diamanda Gallus has admitted to tapping into this same energy. Before performances, I used to say prayers to the devil. It was like making a connection to some source of power so that I could do what was not socially accepted. It was like, you know me, you understand me, I can speak for this reality, you can help me do this. Among her many blasphemous recordings, writings, and performances is her interpretation of Baudelaire's The Litanies of Satan, which includes the final prayer in French, to thee, O Satan, glory be and praise. Grant that my soul one day beneath the tree of knowledge may rest near thee. It should come as no surprise that she has described her performances as being like a ripping of the flesh, like a bloodletting. A kind of voodoo possession, asked the interviewer. Exactly, Gallus replied. A Ugandan who saw my performance said that what I did reminded him of a voodoo ritual which is practiced in Uganda, that if I were performing there, I would be worshipped as a high fetish priestess. Well, Gallas and Amos have loads of company when it comes to artists who get off on this fetishistic voodoo sympathy for the devil vibe they view as the true heart and soul of the music. 
Robert Palmer glowingly described it as the central rock and roll paradigm, a kind of voodoo rooted in a vigorous tradition of celebrating nature and spirit that's far removed from the sober values of Western culture. David Byrne lovingly helped produce a television special about it, calling voodoo-related sound a big part of where our popular music comes from. Rock and roll comes from those traditions, and I believe that the power and influence it has had has come because it carries a small part of that energy with it. And this same voodoo vibe was more than just a lyrical device for Jimi Hendrix. A percussionist from West Africa who often played with the guitar god observed that many of the signature rhythms Jimmy played on guitar were very often the same rhythms that his father played in voodoo ceremonies. And while for many all this may sound cool, dark and mysterious, in the end it will be seen for what it is, a snare of the devil where people ultimately become captive to his will. Now one of the biggest things about him was he believed that he was possessed by some spirit and I got to believe it myself and that's what we had to deal with all the time. And he was very humble about discussing it with people because he didn't want people to feel like he was being uh, pretentious and so on. But he really believed it and he was wrestling with it constantly. Yeah, he used to always talk about some devil or something was in him, you know, and he didn't have any control over it. He didn't know what made him act the way he acted and what made him say the things he said and and songs and different things like that just come out of him, you know, and, and uh, he'd say, I don't know what come over me, you know, I really can't understand it. And, you know, he used to just grab his hair or something or pull his hair and just or stand in the mirror or cry or something. Oh, Lord, it was so sad when he would cry. It, I mean, it seems like to me he was so tormented and just torn apart and like he really was obsessed, you know, with something really evil. And finally, this embrace of the occult has led to a curious phenomenon described in the Bible. The light has come into the world, and men love darkness rather than light, because their deeds were evil. Where people in their fallenness move beyond rejecting light and loving darkness and come to the place where they are fascinated with and even love death and hell itself. For example, besides riding the serpent and mainstreaming the venom of the do what thou wilt worldview, rock and roll hall of famer Eric Burden has also come face to face with the spiritual entities that slither beneath the surface. His entree to this occult world, like so many other rockers, was through the doorway of pharmakia, the sorcery that is psychotropic drugs. In his autobiography, he described an LSD trip he took with Andy Summers, guitarist for the police. As he stared at a Hindu mural created by Summers, focusing on the figure of Kali, the goddess of death and destruction, he fell into a deep coma. Then I came face to face with Kali, Burden remembered. I was covered in a void. Darkness, darkness. Ah, so you need answers, said Kali. If you want information, you have to make me a gift. You've taken my sight, Burden responded. What more do you want? She laughed a wicked, cruel laugh in the darkness. How much are you willing to give? My life, I said. My life was sucked out of me. I was gonzo, melted to the floor, dead. Compare this with the testimony of a student at Columbia University after she took part in an occult ritual led by Dr. Michael Harner, an anthropologist and practicing shaman. I went down a couple of levels and then went even further to some area that was very gray and slimy and foggy and I walked through that for a while and found another opening and went down even further. It was someplace I'd never been before 
and it was kind of like a cave and there were some beings in there but I couldn't quite make out what they were and I was just kind of sitting there with them and all of a sudden they came at me with knives and tore me apart into all these pieces and tore my flesh off and I was startled but it didn't hurt and finally there's the testimony of rock and roll's most focused, committed, and articulate neo-pagan, Genesis Peorage. In the occult magazine Gnosis, he enthusiastically described a life-changing experience he underwent in Nepal when he became the first Westerner to be invited into a particular shrine to the Hindu god Shiva. Then this priest anointed me with this tilak, Peorage remembered, and I got this really fast freeze frame of the shrine, animal intestines, and mummified human heads, and incredibly powerful, very dark-edged materials, pools of blood, and it was really dark, and he started chanting. As soon as he started chanting, it was like Terence McKenna described DMT. I just went, woo! instantly into this completely altered vortex, shooting into this deeper and deeper blackness, floating in liquid blackness, the ultimate blackness, black beyond black. And then I became really aware that somewhere within this ultimate black were these two shiny, slightly pointed, almost insectoid eyes. Shiva watched. After years of studying the occult traditions of Crowley, and Austin Osmond Spare, of ingesting powerful psychotropics and practicing sex magic, ritual cutting, tattooing and piercing, cross-dressing, filing his teeth, presenting occultic and obscene performance art, playing the techno shaman, putting the satanic Anakian calls to music and relentlessly blaspheming God, Peoridge was finally ready to come face to face with the spirit behind it all. And he consciously did what so many others do unconsciously. He embraced the darkness. Looking again at John's Gospel, and this is the condemnation, that the light, Jesus, has come into the world, and men love darkness rather than light, because their deeds were evil. And let me say something here in closing. Don't write off Peorich or any of the other people we've just looked at as some nutcase from whose life you can't draw any personal inferences. All he's done is go for the gusto, taking the essence, the ideas that gave rise to our modern rock and roll world, and then just chase them to their logical limits. To put it another way, he's splashing about in the deep end of the pool of do what thou wilt rebellion, while most moderns just dangle in their feet or wait about in the shallow end. But whether you dive in or just dip, you still belong to the same club. And one day, unless you repent, give up your membership, you'll find your eternal destiny in the same place of which Eric Burden, our Columbia University student, and Genesis Peorage caught but a glimpse. What is the alternative to death being torn apart by demons and infinite blackness? Well, eternal life, infinite love, and the perfect light of a God whose holiness burns as a consuming fire, who dwells in a light so immeasurably bright as to be unapproachable by man in his fallenness, but who has reached down from the cross to purify man and prepare him for a new heaven, a new earth, and a holy city where there shall be no more curse, but the throne of God and of the Lamb shall be in it, and his servants shall serve him. They shall see his face, and his name shall be on their foreheads. There shall be no night there. They need no lamp nor light of the sun, for the Lord God gives them light, and they shall reign forever and ever. And as a living testimony of God's light and grace, among his servants are those who once proudly bore the marks of the beast. Uh, I was really angry and I hated everyone and everything and I basically wanted to murder the world. I wanted everybody to just die. I wanted everybody to suffer like I was suffering. 
and I wanted the power to make him suffer. This will give you an idea of how where I was coming from. I still am fighting a constant battle between what is good and what is evil in me. Evil is winning to my extreme joy, but the good is not easily defeated. But I know in my heart that evil will prevail in the end. Blessed be the darkness, is what I said at the time. Today I formally and finally renounce all good and pledge my allegiance to evil. Long live the dark ones. Praise be to all evil. Satanism, according to Anton LaVey, and, to, and according to Satan, in all truth, is meism. It has nothing to do with worshiping anybody else. That's the definition of Satanism in the truth. The funny thing about it was, is I didn't know I was a puppet. I thought I was the puppet master. I mean, the hat was wearing me. The costume I thought I was wearing was wearing me. To seek your own will is to seek the will outside of God. God is life. Jesus Christ said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Your way is 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 dead way. I mean, it's it's suicide. Is literally what it is. It might not matter to you now. It might not matter you matter to you to the day you breathe your last breath. But it will matter. You will regret it. You will be sorry. And I hope it's on this side of the grave because if it's on the other side, you're going to be sorry forever. A lot of you have heard this song, I'm sure, but it's true. I once was lost, but now I'm found. I once was blind, but now I see. You've seen Junior's brain. Do whatever you want. You want to bend the grown-ups and behave like the way a teenager really wants to behave, wants to behave, wants to behave. Rebellion chaos A quiz. Test your powers of discernment by answering the following question. Through their lyrics, sound, concerts, and lifestyles, today's rock artists encourage their fans to A. Trust and obey their parents. B. Honor the great heroes of past generations. C. Value maturity, modesty, and good etiquette. Or D. Some people say this music is loud, stupid, excessive, vulgar, and appeals to the basest animal instincts. That's why we play it. I don't know. I think music really, it's supposed to be like a feeling. It's supposed to be, it's usually, usually about like youth culture, go, totally rebelling. Uh, probably a lot of rebellion. It has a lot of influence on people and doing your own thing. It's no fun to be good. You got, you know, I mean, you gotta let loose and you gotta do rules. I guess it's kind of a cliche, but rules are meant to be broken. I guess is what they say. Rock and roll has always kind of been rebellious. I don't know. It's supposed to bug your parents. I guess. What do your parents think of ICP? They fucking hate them, but them. In my opinion, rock and roll is more of a rebellious type music than it is uh, stay in school, uh, go get good grades, you know. Uh, I don't know, but I like it. To say that rock celebrates rebellion is like noting the sky's blue. Spin the radio dial or plop down in front of MTV anytime, day or night, and you'll be hit right between the eyes with what one prestigious rock magazine called Rock's essential core, a core of rebellion, sexuality, assertion, and even violence. All the things that have always been unacceptable to a ruling establishment. 
Once that vigorous, horny-handed core is extracted from rock and roll, you're left with little more than music. As Details Magazine observed after covering one of the many music festivals that have come to dot the summer's landscape, so what did we learn? We learned that old rock and roll devils will strip off their clothes. We learned to shout, F the police. We learn that, should a waft of passion come into our lives, we should just scream, let's get butt naked and blank. There's no need or time to belabor the obvious. We all know or should know that the essence of rock and roll is rebellion. The only reason for rock to exist is to be a soundtrack for the movie of teenage angst and anger. A far more interesting, as well as profitable, line of investigation is to try and understand something of the spiritual implications of this rebellion. Where did it come from? What are its byproducts? Where is it leading us? Is teenage angst and anger just a fact of life, like zits? and the music just a harmless way of venting aggression? Or is the truth heavier than that? Well, we could spend hours and still not do justice to this issue, but let's try to gain at least some general insights into these important questions by briefly examining a few key dynamics in our culture's love affair with rebellion. Before we get started though, we need to make an important distinction. By rebellion, the Bible means anarchy and lawlessness, not the resistance of good against evil. God doesn't want blind submission to the earthly status quo. Jesus was the ultimate stick in the eye for injustice, indifference, and hypocrisy, and was ultimately hung on a cross for it. And we're called to follow in his footsteps. The 60s and the rock and roll revolution, for example, came about not because of what was righteous about America in the 50s, but because of what was wrong. The love of money and materialism. The superficial and ultimately idolatrous America right or wrong attitude that often passed for true patriotism. Parents handing their kids over to professionals, whether academic or ecclesiastical, to be raised and nurtured platitudes and or silence instead of honest and vigorous discussion on key life issues like sex, politics, and religion. Entrenched sin in attitudes concerning race and equality. A war that was not fought biblically. Good boys can, but good girls don't attitudes about premarital sex. Hypocritical approaches to substance abuse. And worst of all, a cultural, wishy-washy, I'm a Christian because I'm an American kind of spirituality. On and on it goes. True biblical Christianity calls for open prophetic resistance to these types of institutionalized evil. No doubt, if the church had been faithful in this regard, the anarchistic and ultimately occult forms of rebellion that took root in the 60s would have never prospered. So, turning the world right side up is good. Plunging it into do-what-you-want-to-do anarchy is, well, rebellion. With that critical distinction made, let's now look at a few aspects of the rebellious spirit that did take hold in the 60s and what they mean for us today. Number one, rebellion is evil. Though frequently celebrated today as something cool, comical, and even heroic, make no mistake about it, God hates and punishes the sin of rebellion. The evil man seeks only rebellion, therefore a cruel messenger will be sent against him. Shut up! Furthermore, God views it as a form of occultism, something we'll look at in more detail a bit later. For rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft. Lastly, while all rebellion is serious, there's one specific type that especially tears at the fabric of divine order. Honor your father and your mother. 
To rebel against, to dishonor one's parents is so abominable to God that cursing or striking them, as well as other extreme forms of protracted rebellion against parental authority, was a capital offense in Old Testament Israel. Shut up, slut, you're causing too much chaos. Just bend over and take it like a slut, okay, ma? Oh, now he's raping his own mother, abusing a horse, snorting coke, and we gave him the Rolling Stone cover? In this context, one shudders to think how God views rapper Eminem's rebelliousness, as well as the millions of fans who feed off his depravity. And there's a million of us just like me, who cuss like me, who just don't give a fuck like me, who dress like me, walk, talk, and act like me. Hit it with the skateboard. Parents and their authority have become a primary target for the grotesque defiance that courses through the world of rock and roll. Rock and roll is supposed to bring you crazed joy and rebellion for no apparent reason. That's what it started out as music to f your parents off. Of. And that's what rock and roll ought to be. Kids ought to come up and just hit you right in the face. I don't mean breaking noses, but I mean with what it is they have to say and dressing different so that adults are going, oh, yeah, that's it, you know. Make them throw up. The parents and moms and dads start to like corn, that's when we become not cool. Rock and roll is attitudes. It's uh, it's all the things that your parents told you don't do, you can do. Green Day's Billy Joe Armstrong once advised an audience, when you go home, I want you to eat your parents. I'm not allowed to listen to him when she's home, but, you know, I don't care. They hate it, but I still go, I don't give a what they say. This is rock and roll! Parents always hate rock and roll. It's in custom. If parents like rock and roll, it must suck. Just keep this in mind. They're playing our CDs when you're not home. They're playing my tapes in your own car. And I'm influencing your children. Just don't push your luck. At a Doors concert in Washington, D.C., Jim Morrison's mother, by all accounts a good and decent woman, came to see her son perform. His only acknowledgement was to stare at her as he sang the infamous words to the song, The End, Mother, I Want to Blank You. He never attempted to see or talk to his parents again and usually referred to them as being dead. As Perry Farrell said when asked by Rolling Stone for his secret to happiness, move as far away from your parents as you can, because I feel like I have no parents. I do what makes sense in my head. Number two, rebellion is inane, hypocritical, and doesn't work. Not only is this dishonor your parents attitude among the worst types of sin, it ultimately violates the one law of God that goes so deep into the human conscience that almost nobody will deny it philosophically. That is the golden rule. Do unto others as you would have them do unto you. Isn't it interesting how the rock and roll, do your own thing lifestyle goes out the window when suddenly it's the rock star who's the parent. Madonna, for example, became a star largely through the medium of television and music videos, getting rich selling sex and rebellion to other people's children. Now she has two of her own. And guess what's one of the big rules that governs her household? You've got it. <laughs> she can't watch TV and... Um... She can't watch TV? No. This irony became even more painfully obvious in a feature Rolling Stone did on Ozzy Osbourne. Was affectionately seen as a man reduced to trembling like a frightened chihuahua. So much for rebellion as a lifestyle choice. 
And yet, perhaps it is his relationship with his children that is the most tragic and telling. Glaring down at his brood, Rolling Stone reported, he opens his mouth and says, If you don't shut up, I'll, I'll... What is he, Ozzy Osbourne, legendary drug-addled Prince of Darkness, going to do? To the alert observer, these ironies can reach the height of absurdity. We see Everclear at Woodstock chanting the great rock and roll mantra. All right, we got one rule. There are no f***ing rules. Have a good time. And then just moments later, ordering people. Okay, you guys got to back up now. Everybody back up. Back up. I think I'll have you repeat it after me and get us all feeling f***ing good in here. So follow me, friends. We don't give a s***. We have bands like Metallica embracing the darkness of nihilism and moral relativism. And making light of every kind of sin imaginable, including, ironically, shoplifting. And then getting worked up about people swapping their songs on Napster without paying them royalties. You know what, maybe I wouldn't have to whore myself out if the kids didn't steal my music. Hey Metallica, so what? We have MTV making light of both violence and rebellion against adults in one of their network bumpers. and then broadcasting a PSA against violence. Violence, it should be noted, that featured a person being beaten with a club. We have bands like Rage Against the Machine getting their audience to do what they tell them to do by chanting, Even more surreal is their hardcore advocacy of Marxist socialism, all the while getting rich and enjoying the unparalleled liberties of the very free market economy they condemn. Like other rock artists from time to time, they raise some valid issues, particularly their condemnation of the way our two-party system has been co-opted by big money, special interests, and mushy middle politicians. But what is their alternative? To scream, F you, to advocate unbiblical economic systems that lead to poverty and the loss of freedom everywhere it's been tried? To smash TVs and squat atop a stage prop? What the world needs is a generation that can spread the light, not whine and curse the darkness. And finally, there's the absurdity of an industry that has gotten rich promoting sins that tear at the fabric of society and then turns around and occasionally tries to raise both money and awareness in order to help fix the very problems that the immorality associated with the music helped create in the first place. You don't have to say nothing I know your body wants something R. Kelly, for example, has gotten rich singing about and promoting promiscuity, but was then lauded as a hero when he wrote a song to help fight, get this now, a largely promiscuity-based disease. And then there's Janet Jackson, an artist who's often honored as one of the good guys. Her involvement with Colin Powell's America's Promise Foundation was front and center during her Velvet Rope Tour with some of the proceeds going to help its efforts on behalf of the less fortunate. Help become a mentor for a child. Help keep our kids off the street because they really do need us. Please. But hold on. The facts are in. One of the greatest causes of poverty, poor self-esteem and disease, the very problems the foundation is attempting to address is sexual promiscuity and its inevitable byproducts. And what are Jackson's personal life, her music, the concert, and even the concert title filled with? Sexual innuendo, partial nudity, references to genital piercings, sex outside of marriage, bondage themes, etc.
This level of cognitive dissonance shot through the roof during the production of her music video, If. Close to 80 pregnant 13 to 17 year olds, or teens who'd recently had babies, were invited down by Jackson. And the video they saw made? You got it. A veritable training film for lust-driven sexuality. And deep down, Miss Jackson knew it. The article continued, there was one individual though who was discouraged from dropping by, Katherine Jackson, her mom. The one person that kept running through my head while I was writing these songs was my mother, Jackson says. I told her, some of my movements are very sexy. I'd be embarrassed if you were there. Well, she might have been able to hide her shame temporarily from her mom, but not from God. As Jesus noted when he declared, you are those who justify yourselves before men, but God knows your hearts. For what is highly esteemed among men is an abomination in the sight of God. Number three, rebellion is fundamentally occultic. We saw earlier that rebellion in God's sight is as the sin of witchcraft. God's wisdom in defining rebellion in this way makes perfect sense when one understands the basic difference between the Judeo-Christian cosmology and the one generally embraced by the occult and Eastern traditions. The difference can be summed up by contrasting two words. Cosmos versus chaos. The Greek word cosmos, a word that is front and center throughout the New Testament as well as in the Greek translation of the Old, carries within it the suggestion of order and harmony. In a nutshell, the Bible presents a universe, a cosmos, created by God out of nothing and infused with a symmetry that literally, we now know, defies our comprehension in both its complexity and beauty. Guided by God's superintending hand, the pinnacle of this cosmos was and is this planet with its inhabitants. And it's here where an interesting distinction is made. The earth was without form and void, and darkness was on the face of the deep. Earth's initial formlessness, or unfurnished state, is quite different from the tailored order that the word cosmos suggests. But God wasn't done yet, as, step by step, the divine paradigm began to unfold. The Almighty spoke, and light divided darkness, land came from the sea, life from inanimate matter, etc. The earth was beautifully furnished, and the stage set for the drama of human existence. After creating man in his own image, God took an area of land bounded by water and fashioned Eden an incubator of sorts, as well as a pattern for future expansion. This garden was adorned with everything man needed, as he was prepared for the task at hand, to be fruitful and multiply, and replenish the earth and subdue it. In other words, to make it all as ordered, as beautifully furnished as the garden paradise that was home. Well, most of us know what happened next. Man blew it and paradise was lost. But that's not the end of the story. The Bible's essential message is the account of God's elaborate and awesomely sacrificial efforts to redeem mankind while remaining true to Himself and His righteous standards of justice. And so, through the cross, we were ransomed from the penalty of sin and re-empowered, divinely enabled to get the original job done to go into all the world and fill it with His glory, to disciple individuals and ultimately nations, to bring life from death, light to darkness, ever increasing order and harmony from the chaos of sin and destruction. The occult world, on the other hand, in this as well as in most everything else, seeks to reverse the divine order. Rather than God, chaos or emptiness is seen as the ultimate ground of being, and the material world is viewed as either illusory, maya in the Hindu lexicon, or as in the Gnostic tradition, fallen from the true realm of the spirit. Amid this quantum cloud of uncertainty, God and His will become either unknowable or subject to the whims of human imagination. 
Man is born to do what he wills, and chaos has become his midwife. All creation begins in chaos, progresses in chaos, and ends in chaos. The phenomenon of being is this self-synergizing engine of an out of chaos, through creativity, into the imagination, back into chaos, out into creativity, uh, so forth and so on. See, quantum physics gave us the real term to describe what happens when you take a, uh, a powerful psychedelic plant. It's it's chaos. I like the idea of surfing waves of chaos. I'm surfing the chaos, riding the wave in my mind. We're confused. I'm so f***ing confused, man. It's all chaos. Please, man, I'm surfing the chaos. And roll, man, roll. You definitely generate an atmosphere or a mood which might be characterized as rebellion, chaos, disorder, and activity that appears to have no meaning. They have figured out the formula for chaos! Chaos is a beautiful thing! And so the clear line between light and darkness, life and death, meaning and meaninglessness presents itself. On the one hand, a cosmos created and sustained by the Almighty, suffused with design and meaning. And our purpose in this cosmos? Well, to love God and submit to His will, to glorify and enjoy the Lord, to grow in grace and become more and more like Him in our character and in the way we think, and then to furnish the void, to in a sense colonize the chaos, bringing God's order where there's disorder, discovering and cherishing all that is true, good, and beautiful. And then, on the other hand, there's the embrace of chaos and a descent into the void. For those with the epistemological integrity to embrace the fullness of this horror, well, as more than one rock and roll icon has stated, Nothing is true. Everything is permitted. Nothing is true. Everything is permitted. Because nothing is true. Everything is permitted. And this is why rebellion is a form of occultism. God's order and rule, his cosmos, is rejected. People begin to worship, to derive meaning from the creation rather than the creator, the very foundation of witchcraft. People rebel, concoct their own so-called truths, make up their own rules. They begin to do what they want. Most dabble in their defiance, afraid to fully embrace the horror of this nothing's true, everything's permitted worldview. But dabbling with rebellion is like dabbling with theft. You may just be stealing candy, but you're still a thief. Just so, any time we choose our will over God's, chaos over cosmos, we are rebels and moving in precisely the wrong direction. Jesus understood this as he described the spiritual war to which all of his followers have been called and then warned what it would take to plunder the kingdom of darkness rather than be plundered by it. He that is not with me is against me and he who does not gather with me 
who does not make a conscious effort to press into Christ, scatters. Everywhere in today's music and popular culture, people are scattering, allowing spiritual entropy to drag them into the void. Artists proudly admit that they don't write real songs, they produce chaos. Decay, ugliness, death, dissonance, pain, Darkness, despair, and meaninglessness abound in popular culture. Laziness, disrespect, rioting, stupidity, irresponsibility, and perpetual adolescence are everywhere celebrated. Responsibility, what's that? I don't want to think about it. We'd be better off without it. Leaders of the occult revival, as well as artists who hated Christ and sought inspiration from nihilism and the derangement of all the senses, serve as patron saints for rock's most influential musicians. So tell me why. From the annihilation of every sexual taboo, to the now fashionable rejection of Christianity in favor of Eastern and occult religions, evidence of popular music and culture's embrace of chaos over cosmos is practically endless. Rebellion qua witchcraft has all but become the default religion of Western society. Number four, rebellion leads to death. Jesus declared that true discernment, understanding what's really going on beneath the surface of something, is aided by examining its fruit, what it produces. Elsewhere, the scriptures declare, he who sins against me wrongs his own soul. All those who hate me love death. The wisdom spoken of here is a personification of God and involves an absolute commitment to do what he says. Cosmos, not chaos, submission, not rebellion. This is the God who is, not the great mush God concocted by our postmodern, follow your heart imaginations. And this God declares, warns, that one of the fruits of those who hate this wisdom is death. Well, once again, the sky's blue. <laughs> What about popular music's ever-increasing fascination, even obsession with violence, destruction, and death? While certainly not the soul or even primary cause, why does this music, and specifically songs about nihilism and suicide, become the soundtrack of choice for young people who either take their lives or surrender to the tyranny of despair and hate? This is a letter um, written in blood by a 12-year-old from Los Angeles, California, saying uh, he's on Valium and liquor. This is from a 12-year-old. Is the violence and even death that has plagued so many concerts and music festivals a mere coincidence? I remember this one night when Exodus played and it was like a really violent night and this one guy like Paul Bela said, I want to see a dead poser and a bunch of you know Exodus kids just ran out and found this guy with spandex and slashed his throat. You know, and it was hilarious. And perhaps most significantly, what about the incredibly heavy toll it has taken on the artists themselves? The rock and roll lifestyle is among the most dangerous in the world, not only in the percentage of deaths, 
but in the pathetic way so many die. Suicide, AIDS, drug and alcohol abuse, violence, heroin overdoses, even asphyxiation in one's own vomit. Take as just one example, an artist whose life and death, while not as well known as other rock catastrophes, serves as one of the best illustrations of just how lethal rebellion can be. A gifted, intelligent, and beautiful woman, Nico fell headlong into the chaos of rock and roll when Andy Warhol tapped her for the Velvet Underground. The more you look at the same exact thing, pop artist Warhol had once explained, the more the meaning goes away, and the better and emptier you feel. Well, Nico became a committed disciple of this doctrine of meaninglessness, declaring, I'm a nihilist, so I like destruction. Nihilism seemed to be the most suitable religion. Through both music and sexual relationships, Nico shared her faith. Punk's godfather, Iggy Pop, for example, credits her with helping him get totally into corruption. This particular attitude that I have all stems from Nico, he told one interviewer. I was a skinny little naive brat, and she taught me. You are not full of the poison, she said. This is not right. How can you perform when you are not full of the poison? I will help fill you with poison. Otherwise, you have nothing. We do not want to see a person on stage. We want to see a performance. And the poison is the essence of the performer. Well, eventually the poison took its toll. Drugs became her primary sacrament, reaching a depth where eventually she turned her own teenage son onto heroin. Chaos destroyed cosmos, and moral absolutes were among its victims. I don't have any limits, you know. Without truth, even art was turned on its head as ugliness became her preferred aesthetic. She was almost proud of the fact that her teeth were rotten and her hair was gray and, you know, her skin was bad and she had needle tracks all over. I mean, she, was, she liked that. That was her aesthetic. She died alone and the nihilistic wasteland she helped pioneer a world where ugliness and darkness have become fashion statements. Where the divide between good and evil is blurred and ever-changing. Where death and existential despair are viewed as somehow attractive, brave and profound. And where the derangement of the senses is the key to creativity. Her spiritual children barely took note of her passing. Of course, by the grace and forbearance of God, far more people live on than die young. But they, as well as each of us, will still one day die. And after death, the scriptures declare, comes judgment. Those who have rejected God will in turn be rejected. And it's this death what the Bible calls the second one, the final reward for all who have chosen rebellion over obedience. That is the only death with which each of us should be ultimately concerned. As Jesus warned, my friends, do not be afraid of those who kill the body and after that have no more that they can do, but I will show you whom you should fear. Fear him who after he has killed has power to cast into hell. Yes, I say to you, fear him. Number five, rebellion, like hell, is never satisfied. Good, like God, has no limits. There are always new vistas of virtue to explore and develop. But Rock's deliberate identification with rebellion and chaos has created a very real and pathetically ironic dilemma. When the limbo bar of cultural standards keeps getting dropped, how low can you go before you fall on your back? How does one fly their rock and roll freak flag high 
when it's the Woodstock generation that's now the status quo? At what point does rebellion start to either play like a cartoon or stink of unrefined evil? 40 and 50-somethings, for example, can remember when the F word was shocking. And even the idea that Jim Morrison might have flashed an audience in Miami led to a felony arrest and sparked a national scandal. And today? Well, entire concerts are performed naked, and obscenities are so common that if they were somehow banned, hundreds of artists would have a hard time fashioning a coherent sentence. So what's a poor rebel to do? They, 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 they cut up each other on stage. Um, the, the lead singer has a, a four-foot-long that he masturbates and so white. Sing about raping the Virgin Mary and torturing Christians? Rub animal entrails all over their body. Rap about mutilating women or having sex with underage girls. Commit unspeakable acts on stage. Why, Gigi, did you feel a need to... Uh to defecate in front of a live audience. Well, my body is the rock and roll temple, and my flesh, blood, and body fluids are a communion to the people. And there are no limits and no laws, and I'll break down every barrier put in front of me till the day I die. The pathetic absurdity of this cycle of satanic one-upmanship is nowhere more obvious than in the life and music of the platinum-selling rockers from Iowa, Slipknot. No doubt without fully realizing it, guitarist Mick Thompson commented on the progressive desensitization that made his band's particular brand of rebellion and nihilism a foregone conclusion. I used to watch a lot of gore movies, lots of true death videos, and at first, sure, I was disturbed by what I saw, but after a while I became numb to it. With hard music, it's the same way. People listen to corn, and now they want something even harder. It's like a drug. And their drug? Basically nine people working out every poison that ever infected them in their life and putting it on tape. And I hope they get a positive message for them, you know? Where they don't have to answer to anything or anyone. This song is your new national Drummer and group visionary Sean Crahan says the band's mission is to spread the sickness, which includes not only the raw rebellion of their lyrics and music, but live performances that feature band members hitting themselves and each other, drinking urine, smearing feces, throwing up into their masks, starting fires, and in general embracing chaos with a nihilistic vigor that would stun the Voodans of Haiti. And the effect on their audience? Every show, Crahan told Rolling Stone, I've got some kid out there who's hitting himself just like me. His knuckles are bloody, his eyes are black. I'll look in his eyes and see that he's in some other place. It's a heavy duty responsibility. So it's only rock and roll, huh? As incredible as all this is, there's an important footnote. Most of the band came from intact homes and led wholesome American lives. Hi, Mom. Look at me. They live in the richest, most free nation the world has ever seen. Crahan admits, I have a beautiful wife and three healthy children. I'm happy, man. And then goes on to say, but when I'm on stage, it's effing on. I'll kill people. I look into the eye of the abyss every day of my life because my time here, it's nothing, man. Well, Crahan and millions of other artists and individuals feel this way because they've made a choice. They've embraced the spirit of our age, preferring chaos over cosmos, their will over God's. And now, as they stare into the pit of nothingness, this other place Crahan sees in the eyes of his fans, the anger, pain, and emptiness they experience are not only the result of a self-fulfilling prophecy, they are the emanations of the satanic reality that lies waiting, like a black hole, in the bottom of the abyss.
Number six, rebellion doesn't help, it hurts. Whether it's a song brimming with rage or the semi-controlled violence of a mosh pit, the typical argument for rebellion in music, or many other art forms for that matter, is that it's cathartic, that it provides a healthy release for pent-up anger or pain. And for some, this catharsis can take on the form of ritual, even something religious. Now gather yourselves. All your hate, all your anger, everything that is black and loathsome that dwells inside of you. I want you to pour that into me! And while the vast majority of songs fall into the rebellion for the sake of rebellion category, there is the occasional song that does attempt to address the real trauma people experience in a fallen world. Jonathan Davis of Korn, for example, has powerfully expressed the horror of sexual abuse. And Papa Roach, among other bands, has attempted to exorcise some of the pain that results from divorce and broken homes. No doubt people who have undergone either trauma can experience a measure of relief from these songs, the sense that they're not alone, that someone else has been through it and understands the pain. Screaming, moshing, even cutting oneself can provide, like the use of alcohol or drugs, some temporary relief. And if you're a rock star, it can also make you rich. But the root problem is never really addressed, and as we saw with Slipknot a moment ago, the nihilistic rage and despair inevitably become a self-fulfilling prophecy, producing even more poison and a sense of hopelessness. Suffocation, no breathing, don't give a f give a cup of your breathing. Would it be wrong, would it be right? If I took my life tonight, chances are that I might. Mutilation out of sight, and I contemplate suicide. In this context, the band Against All Authority asks an important question in a song about a friend who committed suicide. Tell me what you think of mine. What Toby ultimately needed was God and his grace. What he got instead was a bottle of liquor and a blind friend's support as he skated down the ramp of rebellion and into the abyss of chaos. And the only thing to be found there, whether now or later, is death. Every rebellious rock and roll band needs to stare into Toby's eyes and in the eyes of millions of others just like him. To understand the bigger spiritual picture here, let's close with an analogy. As we've already seen, the Bible makes it very clear that a root problem is sin, both those we commit and the ones that are committed against us. And let me say something here. Look, in many ways, the wheels have come off our culture, and I know that many of you watching have been run over by them. Divorce, rejection, sexual abuse, violence, the lack of love and encouragement, on and on. It's a hurting world. But here's the bigger problem. Each of us is like a radio, designed by God to receive the true signal of His light and love. But because of sin and our innate drive to do our own thing, to possess this radio on our own terms, we've lost this ultimate signal. It never stopped broadcasting, it's just that we've stopped receiving the frequency. And so we begin looking for our own answers, for our own redemption, spinning the dial, looking for a signal that we like, that seems to fit our specific needs or personality. Something that we can dance to. Well, rebels like rebellious music. Those with anger, angry. The lustful, lusty. And those who hurt, well, music by people who hurt. For someone who's lost and alone, these stations on the dial can provide a measure of comfort and temporal satisfaction. But ultimately, each is just a broadcast tower of Babel. A soul-numbing distraction to keep the herd moving on down 
the highway to hell. God has the answer, a true signal to save us, heal us, and lead us home. But we've got to give Him control over our radio and allow Him to reset the frequency. Obedience, not rebellion, is the beginning of wisdom, and Christ's blood, not our sweat or tears, is the only way out of the valley of death. Can you name three songs that you feel really encourage people to be sexually pure before marriage? Mm. Can't think of any right now. I'm serious. Name three songs? <laughs> I don't think there really was one. <laughs> you mean rock and roll, huh? That's a tough one, though. Name of three songs like that. Actually, I can't really think of any. I can't think of any. There isn't any. Can you can you give me two? Oh. <laughs> okay. You got me on that one. <laughs> Your butt, I want to get with you. I don't know. How about if you can give me just one song? Remain pure. And the mainstream right now, all the major music's all about sex. A lot of it's about sex. Hmm. You know what? I can't think of one off the, the top of my head, but uh, I went to church a few weeks ago and heard Amazing Grace, so uh, there we go. That's something. There you go. We've asked the same question in schools, concerts, festivals, and youth gatherings around the world, and have always gotten the same bewildered response. But perhaps an even better question to ask is, why? Why is it that the question becomes almost absurd in the asking? Why is it that sex is such a major topic, if not the topic, in the world of contemporary music? And why is it that lust and perversity have become progressively synonymous with the lyrics and lifestyles that energize the world of rock and roll? It's good to know that there's a lot of people out there that don't see nothing wrong with it either. I find sex very inspirational. I've often written about it in music because there's a very powerful and direct correlation between sexual energy and musical energy. Rock and roll is synonymous with uh, a lot of things, sex being one of them, and you can't take that away from it. It just doesn't work. I'd like to thank MTV for recognizing copulation as an art form. Adult film babes, we have local babes, we have national babes, international babes. It's just going to be babe fest. It's no secret that Rock's very name is synonymous with this type of unrestrained sexuality. In an acclaimed essay, cultural critic Michael Ventura noted, Rock and roll was a term from the juke joints of the South when a music started being heard that had no name. In those juke joints, rock and roll hadn't meant the name of music, it meant to blank. 
when finally in the mid-50s, the song started being played by white people and aired on the radio. Rock Around the Clock, Good Rockin' Tonight, Reelin' and a Rockin'. The meaning hadn't changed. Ready, 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 I'm ready, ready, ready to rock and roll. Going to the corner, pick up my sweetie pie. She's my rock and roll, baby, she's the apple of my eye. It goes without saying, however, that outside of these juke joints, juke, by the way, being an African word for bad, most people were clueless as to what both the term and the music were pointing. The fact is, America in the 1950s was ill-equipped to deal with the pagan worldview and sexuality that lurked beneath the surface of this new musical form. Much of this was due to post-war affluence, a growing fascination with entertainment and novelty, and a rapid increase in leisure activity. Coupled with the weakening of the traditional family, brought on by everything from evolving work patterns, new freedoms provided by the automobile, and an increasingly strong and socialistic federal government, Western culture became increasingly vulnerable to spiritual and moral decay. More importantly, the church largely fumbled the ball when it came to providing real moral leadership in the midst of these profound changes. Many, on the one hand, condemn these new entertainments legalistically, without real understanding, often just because it was new or it upset the status quo. Rock and roll has got to go, and go it does. And sadly, sometimes for racial reasons. The obscenity and vulgarity of the rock and roll music is obviously a means by which the white man his children can be driven to the level with a nigger. On the other hand, there were many who, out of apathy, ignorance, or fear, or in an effort to seem progressive and hip, either looked the other way, or sometimes even approved. Well, it strikes me as a tremendous mystique about what you're involved in here. It's much more Sadly, Christianity had to a great extent mutated into a social convenience, what the scriptures call having a form of godliness while denying its power. And so the initiation into the fires of pagan sexuality began. In an era where sex outside of marriage was almost universally viewed as wrong, even sinful, teenagers began to dance to the coded sensuality of Little Richard, Elvis Presley, and Jerry Lee Lewis. Standards of modesty and sexual purity began to crumble. Where in 1956, the Ed Sullivan Show broadcast Elvis only from the waist up due to the obvious sexual intent of his gyrating hips, within months, Elvis the pelvis had become a national phenomenon, loved and emulated by millions. Next, the Beatles, and then the Stones, opened the floodgates of eroticism even wider and they in turn were followed by a blitzkrieg of artists and bands, all marching under the banner of Sex, Drugs, and Rock and Roll. And now, a generation later, children's shows on Nickelodeon feature artists who would have made Elvis blush. Twenty years ago, KISS was roundly condemned for their perverted lifestyles and lyrics and their exploitation of women as sexual playthings. This is real simple. I love naked women. I love touching them. I love smelling them. If I can press my crotch against them, the lottery's been won. But now, they open up the Super Bowl. Replete with dancers wearing costumes vomited up from the world of leather fetishism and sadomasochism. Even soft drink commercials have gotten into the act. David Yao, frontman for the band Jesus Lizard, summed up our present situation well after being arrested in Cincinnati for performing naked, doing his part to fulfill Rock's implicit mandate. Be rebellious, push the envelope, 
shock the straight world. What the blank is shocking, he said. It's 1996. The only thing that shocks me is electricity. I don't know how to pull off shock value anymore. On one level, all of this could be written off as just another lesson in human nature. Give people an inch and they'll take a mile. Until they hit a wall, adjustments are made, and then the whole cycle begins again. And no doubt there's some truth in this. But if we're to go deeper, we need to understand something of the spiritual realities that attend these cycles. These things don't just happen. They're an inevitable byproduct of both an individual's and a culture's attitude towards God and His truth. No sex in the it's nothing but sex, sex, sex. First, we need to explode one of the most common fallacies concerning God's truth about our sexuality. God is not anti-sex. It was His idea in the first place. He designed our bodies and souls in such a way as to make it a very enjoyable act. Scripture describes the act of making love as being central to both the beginning and the living out of the marriage relationship. Husbands and wives are further encouraged in the Bible to view their bodies as belonging to their spouse in order that they might both give and receive comfort and pleasure. Sex is the vehicle for man's participation in one of life's greatest miracles, the creation of another human being. In short, sex is an enormously important, powerful, and beautiful act. So beautiful and powerful, in fact, that God has commanded that it not be cheapened and exploited by man's lusts and selfishness. Tragically, as we've already seen, the Christian worldview, along with its high regard for human sexuality, began to break apart during the 18th and 19th centuries. Several other belief systems were proposed and investigated, invariably ones that promised more so-called sexual freedom. In his essay, Ends and Means, Aldous Huxley was quite frank about this in relation to perhaps the key idea that has come to define our modern era, the death of God and moral absolutes as a corollary of Darwinian evolution and materialism. For myself, as no doubt for most of my contemporaries, the philosophy of meaninglessness was essentially an instrument of liberation. The liberation we desired was from a certain system of morality. We objected to the morality because it interfered with our sexual freedom. Friedrich Nietzsche would have agreed. Hating the unambiguous morality of the Christian and classical era, he called for a metaphorical revival of the Greek cult of Dionysus. And for Nietzsche, music and pagan sexuality were key to this revival. The central concern of these celebrations was, almost universally, a complete sexual promiscuity overriding every form of established tribal law. All the savage urges of the mind were unleashed on those occasions until they reached that paroxysm of lust and cruelty which has always struck me as the real witch's brew. Parallel with all this, the occult revivals of the 19th and 20th centuries saw sexual freedom as an instrument of enlightenment, as a means of summoning forth spiritual energy. For Havelock Ellis, Margaret Sanger, William Reich, P. D. Ospensky, and Aleister Crowley, among many others, sex magic, what the Hindus referred to as wakening the serpent, became an essential part of the new post-Christian world they were looking to create. So finally, after decades of incubation and cross-pollination among academics, artists, musicians, and filmmakers, this do what thou wilt sexuality exploded into the mainstream with the free love movement of the 1960s. And no one expressed the essence of this movement with greater honesty and precision than another phenomenon of the 60s, Anton LaVey and the Church of Satan. This is a very selfish religion. We believe in greed, we believe in selfishness, we believe in all of the lustful thoughts that motivate man because this is man's natural. Uh, feeling. Amid satanic altars featuring naked women with 666 written across their chests, 
and liturgies designed to validate every perversion imaginable, LaVey's Satanic Bible gave the bottom line on not only Satanism, but on the spirit that has come to characterize much of our present age. Is not lust and carnal desire a more truthful term to describe love? Free love in the satanic concept means exactly that, freedom to indulge your sexual desires with as many others as you feel is necessary to satisfy your particular needs. Therefore, the most simplified description of the satanic belief is indulgence instead of abstinence. You have to give people like LaVey and his part-time disciple Marilyn Manson credit for having the courage of their convictions, for not trying to dress up their worldview with coy little euphemisms. Hey, you want to do your own thing? Invent your own moralities? Your own sexual ethics? Well, welcome to the Satanic Club. Be honest. Don't try to hide your true nature. You're your own God, because ultimately, you're your own authority, the arbiter of your own existence. Call yourself a humanist, a white witch, a liberal Christian if you must. But ultimately, as LaVey was fond of saying, you're just a Satanist in evening clothes, dressed up in order to hide your true nature. And you know what? In this instance, the Bible agrees with him. Get behind me, Satan, Jesus said to one of his followers. You are an offense to me, for you are not mindful of the things of God, but the things of men. Contrary to popular opinion, the essence of being satanic is simply being more interested in what you or other people believe about something rather than what God knows and has commanded. With that in mind, let's do some detective work by examining four key distinctives of openly satanic sexuality and then ask ourselves the million dollar question. Can we find parallels in the world of rock and roll? Number one. Satanic sexuality is self-consciously pagan. It seeks to subvert Christianity and its message of moral virtue and self-control by deliberate acts of sensual abandon, often coupled with sacrilege. Incredibly, the Red Hot Chili Peppers ramped this celebration of dark satanic sexuality up even another notch on their best-selling album, aptly entitled Blood Sugar Sex Magic. You know, there are levels of intimacy that people can enjoy with God. The Apostle Paul spoke about the things God has revealed to us through His Spirit, and then said, For the Spirit searches all things, yes, even the deep things of God. Man's chief end, whether we want to own up to it or not, is to know God more and more, to grow in grace and in holiness, to experience something of the deep things of God's Spirit. In precisely the same way, however, there are levels of satanic intimacy, varying depths to which the carnal mind can descend. In the book of Revelation, Jesus cautioned his followers in a city called Thyatira to beware of the deep things of Satan, connecting them specifically to the idolatry of Jezebel and acts of sexual immorality. Scholars tell us that this evil involved ritual prostitution 
and precisely the type of satanic sexuality celebrated in this song by the Chili Peppers. These lyrics touch on, quote, the deep things of Satan and should give anyone with even a smoldering ember of conscience a sense of the depths to which our culture has fallen. And by the way, this is not just to single out or condemn the Chili Peppers. No doubt they were to some degree clueless as to the line that was being crossed when they composed that song. The culture of rock and roll had taught them, and countless others, that perversion, and especially sacrilegious perversion, was somehow revolutionary or profound. It had been drummed into their heads that it was cool to use drugs in order to achieve altered states of consciousness, and then to let the songs rise up like sparks from a fire of some primeval furnace. This same spirit can also be seen in the manner in which many musicians view rock as, quite literally, a celebration of pagan sexuality. From the Grateful Dead to their heir apparent Fish, with dozens of bands in between, Nietzsche's call for a Dionysian revolt through music is heard time and again. Consider, for example, the words of Ray Manzarek keyboardist and co-founder of The Doors as he described his teenage introduction to the dark mysteries of rock and roll while listening to the blues. It was incredible, the most dangerous singing and the most evil implications. The top of my head rose up, Kundalini uncoiled and sent shivers up my spine. One chord, over and over, funky, dark, gritty, evil, trance state, my radio was hypnotizing me. This music opened the door to Dionysus, and he leapt in through my ears. And Manzarek understood that the transformation taking place in his teenage psyche was happening to an entire generation. It was wild and dark and dangerous, he said. Every white kid in America went absolutely crazy. The boys now had this thrusting, gyrating pelvic movement of Elvis Presley to try on the daughters of America. We went mad. A decade later, it was Manzarek's turn to open the throttle of the sexual revolution even further. The doors began with the heady vision, a fantasy of making a music of sublime destructiveness, unleashing orgies of sexual licentiousness, subverting family life and its venerable traditions. Father? Yes, son. I want to kill you. Exploring the most savage natural instincts in songs that celebrated that horrible mixture of sensuality and cruelty. Mother. Notions of Nietzsche that fascinated Ray Manzarek. And the doors were far from alone in using music to help affect a revival of pagan sexuality. Courtney Love has admitted, I want to be as perverse as I'd like to be, and therefore subversive, while making you hum along with it. In an interview with the homosexualist magazine The Advocate, Madonna also acknowledged that she is constantly trying to challenge the accepted ways of behaving sexually. Hey Britney, you say you wanna lose control. Come over here, I got something to show ya. When asked about the frequent and often extreme homosexual imagery in her music videos and live performances, and how teenage kids from middle America are going to respond, Madonna replied, they digest it on a lot of different levels. Some people will see it and be disgusted by it, but maybe they'll be unconsciously aroused by it. If people keep seeing it and seeing it and seeing it, eventually it's not going to be such a strange thing. It's little wonder that rock and roll and sexual purity 
comes off as a contradiction in terms. Whether consciously or subconsciously, there's a clear agenda here to, in the words of Huxley, legitimize people's sex lives. The problem is, though, that no matter how low a culture's standards sink, no matter if everyone is, as they say, doing it, God's standards remain firm and unmovable. Do not be deceived, neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor homosexuals will inherit the kingdom of God. Number two, closely connected with this revival of paganism, the occult world often uses sex ritualistically to invoke spirits as well as into some way empower or transform the ritual's participants. Aleister Crowley was particularly noted for using sex magic, but a number of the secret societies that were part of the 19th century occult revival in Europe did as well. And around the world there are numerous primitive occult groups where spiritual possession and trance states are seen as acts of mystical sexual intercourse between the subject and his or her possessing spirit. In his own way, David Lee Roth, ex-lead singer for Van Halen, expressed much the same thing when he told Rolling Stone, when I'm on stage, my basement facilities take over completely. It's like doing it with 20,000 of your closest friends. Roth was a bit more specific, spiritually speaking, about these basement facilities when he said, I'm gonna abandon my spirit to them, which is actually what I attempt to do. You work yourself into that state and you fall in supplication of the demon gods. No doubt Roth thought that he was just being dark and mysterious when he described his performance in these terms. But if we understand on the one hand the Bible's explicit teaching that there is a very real spiritual universe that operates beneath the surface of and often influences what we call our physical world, and then honestly compare the sexual energies in today's popular music with those found in self-consciously pagan or satanic societies, well, we would do well to reconsider the quote from the bluesman we looked at earlier. These men and women broke through the psychic straitjacket and delivered themselves up to the gods. The spirit of rhythm took hold of them and they danced wildly, freely, lasciviously. Compare that with this observation by the Stones' Mick Jagger. I get a strange feeling on stage. I don't feel the same person as I am normally. I entice the audience. What I'm doing is a sexual thing. I dance, and all dancing is a replacement for sex. Like Jagger, Led Zeppelin's Robert Plant, John Taylor of Duran Duran, Pat Benatar, Gray Slick, Blondie's Deborah Harry, Wendy O. Williams, Janet Jackson, to name just a few, have all talked about their performances as having a profound sexual component, essentially becoming the equivalent of having a form of sex with the audience. Um, I know that it's almost like a, a sexual exorcism for me when I'm on stage to have Flea and John and Chad playing behind me. I mean, it's exciting and uh, it's sexually exciting for me. You know, it, it fills my body with a, a certain frequency, you know, a certain vibration. That, that just makes me feel sexually potent, and I just sort of let that come through me. Yeah. An interesting side note here. A common feature of the occult world is spirits that come and have sex with people at night. The male demon is an incubus, the female a succubus. Well, no surprise here. These demons frequently show up in album art, band names, videos, and song lyrics.
When asked about the source for their name, the California band Incubus told Spin Magazine that they intentionally looked for something radical and chose Incubus because it is a demonic creature with an enormous sex organ that has sex with women while they're sleeping, often killing them by piercing their womb. Does all this represent the intentional embrace of demons and satanic theology? In the majority of cases, no. But evil is rarely ever intentionally embraced. And this is precisely why Jesus cautioned some other spiritually naive people. You do not know what manner of spirit you are of. As we've seen before, people who hate or mistrust Christianity and openly embrace pagan alternatives are often not as naive. They know precisely what manner of spirit is operating behind the scenes. Again from the bluesman. Many a boogie aficionado would be surprised to know that letting it all hang out is but an imitation of the ritual dancing that has been going on for centuries. Contemporary popular dance has its origins in the holy dance of the Afro-Cuban goddess Ocean. Sometimes Ocean meets her lover and they surrender themselves to a fervent dance in an unconcealed and incomparable imitation of carnal lust. Ocean used to dance naked, no longer. But perhaps we shall see it again, not in temples, but in the cabarets and theaters as a great success of white civilization. May God have mercy on us. Number three, satanic sexuality knows no boundaries. If something is desired, it becomes a transgression of the law of Philema, to do what thou wilt, to not act on that desire. Do what you want to do. Sexual freedom is something we feel is very important as the necessary requisite of the satanic church. As a result, virtually anything goes. Take your fill and will of love as ye will, when, where, and with whom ye will. I have taken thy name as part of myself. I live as the beasts of the field, rejoicing in the fleshly life. There are literally thousands of ways this pagan distinctive crops up in the world of rock. Consider just a few examples of do what thou wilt sexuality run amok. Along with its not-so-subtle endorsement of rape, especially pathetic given the growing epidemic of drug-induced sexual assaults, this platinum-selling song perfectly encapsulates what, for the most part, has become the essence of rock's sexual ethic. We're nothing but animals, so let's do it like the animals. Rapper Ice-T, the author of such sublime explorations of physical love as LGBNAF. So why don't you tell this what you want to do? Hey yo baby, you know what I want to do? I want to get butt naked as Has been even more direct about this animalistic bottom line. Men are like dogs. Men just want to smell it and knock it. But that's how men have been since the beginning of time. We can't help it. We're out of control. All men. All men. LaVey and Crowley would have totally agreed. But as this openly satanic ethic has taken root, what's been the result? Well, Fasten your seatbelts because what follows is extremely disturbing. Some may even want to fast forward through the next 10 minutes. But for those in denial, or for those who want to understand the disease, it's autopsy time. The tumor of do what thou wilt sexuality has metastasized and spread throughout the body of culture. There are no boundaries, the cancer cries, so let's become sexually depraved. I got to have it, just like a rabbit. I can't help it because I love black 
and use the sexual energies of the music and the cachet of being a rock star to fornicate with hundreds, even thousands of people. Really, just, just give, give us an, do you know how many women you've slept with, say, in the past uh, five years? Five years? No. Over the last ten years, yes. Okay, ten. Over two thousand. And it's our distinct pleasure to do the shows on stage and then, of course, do the encores back in the hotel. Next time we came into town, you know, there were boyfriends and dads looking for me. <laughs> Mock the whole concept of sin while trampling underfoot the grace and the mercy of God. brazenly father illegitimate children. In the case of rapper Eazy E, bragging about having seven kids by six different mothers. Rob childhood of its innocence by selling sex to younger and younger audiences. Equate the worship of God with sexual arousal. Produce multiple thousands of songs and music videos that promote and celebrate fornication. Yeah, we've covered it all. Sex, fun, love, partying, infidelity. That's what it's all about. So wherever you are... Applaud masturbation. I love to masturbate. I love to deliver orgasms to the masses. The more I come to understand, and then touch on my hand. Voyeuristically explore, advocate, and celebrate homosexuality. and the basest forms of sodomy and sexual degradation. Endorse sadomasochism and bondage-oriented sexuality. Insinuate sex with underage children. Or as Liz Fair said about her debut album, say really dirty things and play with pedophilia. I want authentic slime. I want the golden garbage. I want to turn things around and upset people and be provocative and exploitive. And I succeeded. Sanctioned stalking, abuse, rape, and other forms of violence against women. I'm a murderer. I am a man, a man, I'll give you something that you won't forget. I said you shouldn't have a woman dress. I said you shouldn't have a woman dress. Let's dance with Mary Jane one more time. Hint at and even openly applaud necrophilia, or sex with the dead. We met last night, making love on the refrigerator. Explore the new frontier for perversion presented by Cybersex. Endorse vampirism. Make light of the abomination 
that is bestiality. Make sure that sexually provocative content appears in 75% of the programming aired on MTV. Bang with MTV's sex rated video countdown. Undress. The juiciest part of your MTV diet. Season premiere. Objectify women's bodies, reducing them to little more than sex toys. Marginalize the sacred institution of marriage by normalizing and even glorifying adultery. Mouth to mouth, if we can. Blur the already muddled distinction between pornography and rock. Any person that plays in a rock band knows that sex and rock go together. <laughs> by having porn stars sing on songs and appear in videos and album covers. Here we go. Just clicked in my head. Porn for the youth of America and for the world. You know, Gen X, porn, rock and roll, parties, every, tattoos, everything, music, MTV type pornos. And then have rock stars return the favor by appearing in hardcore porn films. I think we should make a porno right now. You know, but I, since I'm, you know, I'm a rock star. This is rock and roll, it's just a show. These are people who have sex for money. Who cares? I don't care. Feature grotesque sexual imagery, a la Aleister Crowley's phallic signature, on album artwork, stage sets, and in the names of dozens of bands and songs. As horrific as all this is, there is one other area that is perhaps even more indicative of the degree to which this cancer has spread. Pagan sexuality now runs rampant through the one group that should know better. Professing Christians, those to whom God said, Let fornication and all uncleanness not even be named among you. Well, forget mere names and innuendo. Artists who have been very vocal about their Christian faith. About Jesus Christ, who was the ultimate rock star and rebel. And uh, now think nothing of promoting full-on debauchery in their music videos. Taking sacred songs and changing the focus from God to some woman's body. Do you see what I see? Lord have mercy. Anyway, back to the countdown. Seducing millions of teens into idolatry. Performing songs that are perversely inspired and sexually ambiguous. Satisfaction and I try. Simulating a 40 second long orgasm on their recordings. Singing or rapping lyrics that push the envelope of obscenity. Starring in perverted, evil films. And by God, we will not stand by and watch history condemn us into celibacy. We will get laid! Yes. <laughs> DJing for copulating ravers and even producing a hardcore porn film. Winning the award for breakthrough performance is a lot like losing your virginity. Once you win, you can never do it again. You've already broken through. But that's a small price to pay for something that feels so good. <laughs> and producing everything from sexually charged videos 
to a personal life replete with children out of wedlock, parties with nude women in a swimming pool, and an ever-growing arrest record. And then, to top it all off, have these artists thank God for making all of this possible. First and foremost, I want to thank God. Without him, none of this would be possible. And thank God. I thank the Lord. I'm grateful to God. I'd like to thank God. I'd like to thank God. To thank God. To thank God. Oh, thank you, Jesus. Culturally, this ever-growing avalanche of sexual perversity has torn down almost every barrier of honor and purity. The steady drip, drip, drip of sin, as the Bible warns, has deceived and hardened multiplied millions of hearts. And so, we begin to justify our sin. We can't help it. We're out of control. All men. All men. We become more blind and resistant to God's truth and salvation concerning this sin. Sex is a great thing. I don't know how you could possibly be guilty about it. Yeah, I feel guilty afterwards. And I've screwed someone I don't know. Absolutely no regret. And we become more susceptible to the next stage of sin. This is perhaps Satan's most useful ploy, not only for the power it gives him over individual lives and the toll it takes on society, but the demonic poignancy of it. How satisfying it must be for him to see the pinnacle of creation, people made in the image of God, performing acts not worthy of animals. There's a reason why we have the capacity to sink this low. Humans are completely unique. We're the only creatures who are infused with the breath of God, the spark of the divine. And even as we have the potential, through the work of God's grace, to ascend to the very pinnacle of creation, so there's a corresponding potential to sink to its very depths. Make no mistake about it. Our fallen natures, the corruptions of our present age, and the very real forces of darkness that operate in the spiritual realm together form a type of spiritual gravity that pulls us inexorably down. There's no force of human will or religious discipline that can ultimately break its power. But the gospel, the good news, is that God has done what we could not. 2,000 years ago, He stepped into our world as a man and destroyed the power of the spiritual gravity on the cross. He then ascended and grants His offspring the power to do the same. Number four, satanic sexuality gives no thought to modesty. Viewing man as little more than a highly evolved animal, clothing is commonly seen as an artifice and the shame attending public nudity as a vestige of Christian guilt. Rituals are sometimes performed nude or in the vernacular of the occult, sky-clad. Well, the Red Hot Chili Peppers, Madonna, Moby, Perry Farrell, Marilyn Manson, Green Day, Ramstein, Jesus Lizard, Courtney Love, Iggy Pop, Lit, G.G. Allen, Queen, Jackal, Motley Crue, and Blink-182, to name just a few, have all used nudity in varying degrees in their performances. Pharrell and the Chili Peppers Flea, particularly, have shown an incredible disregard for any standard of modesty, performing entire sets completely and unabashedly naked. Do you think I'll get arrested if I just play Stark naked? Definitely not. There's a lot of naked people running around. We're all gonna get naked! Woo! And it's not just the performers. Nudity in the audience, 
particularly women bearing their breasts, has become almost standard at many concerts. Observing the groundbreaking nudity amid the audience at Woodstock 1969, Gray Slick made an interesting observation that also illustrates some of its spiritual undertones. You could wear nothing or everything. Either choice of outfit would honor the nameless spirit. Adorn yourself in the full regalia of a sorcerer. Roll in the mud, let the rain splash it all away, and then take off your clothes and dance. And not infrequently, nudity and the rebellion and nihilism that surround it spills over into the real world. Filters Richard Patrick, for example, proudly described an incident that later served as inspiration for their song, Take a Picture. One time I got drunk, did a bunch of drugs, and I ended up on a plane. I blacked out, took off all my clothes, and I was running around on the plane. I was in first class, and apparently I was like, hey you, blank blank, let's get naked. I was going to get arrested, but someone said, look, he's the singer for a band. Public nudity, while not at all infrequent in the world of rock, nevertheless remains something that only a small percentage of people will engage in. But in the same way that radical extremes in tattooing and body piercing have made the butterfly on the shoulder or a navel ring seem rather tame and hence acceptable, so these extremes of immodesty have paved the way for the mainlining of what was once considered softcore pornography. And so now, even the so-called nice girls of popular music, Britney, Christina, Faith, Whitney, Mariah, Tony, Shania, and Janet, to name just a few, dress, dance, and pose in ways that, not too long ago, would have been seen as scandalous, even obscene. And the popular culture has, predictably, trotted right along. Come on over to Sears and get three totally exclusive Christina Aguilera enhanced CDs. <laughs> In his letters to his young disciple Timothy, the Apostle Paul encouraged him and us to flee youthful lust, but instead pursue righteousness. To treat younger women as sisters with all purity. If you want to be with me, amen, there's a price to pay. I'm a genie, I'm a genie in a bottle. You gotta love me the right way. Genie in a bottle is, um, based on flirtation. You pick out that, like, couple cute guys in the audience to sort of, you know, <laughs> wiggle your hips to, and, and that takes care of Jeannie. <laughs> Understanding the power of a woman's body to visually excite a man, again, something that is wonderful and to be enjoyed between a husband and wife, God, through his servant Paul, commands that in public, women are to clothe themselves in modest apparel, with propriety and moderation. This may seem hopelessly old-fashioned, which, bottom line, means nothing if it's something that God has commanded. But think about it from just a practical perspective. What has our cultural experiment in blatant, in-your-face sensuality and all the other examples of pagan sexuality we've just looked at really gotten us? Untold millions of defiled consciences, hardened hearts, broken spirits, and millstones of shame and shattered self-esteem a skyrocketing increase in eating disorders, multiple millions of people infected with sexually transmitted diseases, some incurable and fatal. There's a penalty to be paid, a very harsh one. Tens of millions of preborn children killed through abortion, multitudes of kids being born in families without a father, a reality, by the way, that has been clearly tied to the increased likelihood of poverty 
poor self-esteem, confused sexual identity, even the premature onset of puberty in girls. Simply viewing sexually suggestive material might actually trigger physical changes in your child's body. A profound increase in both the frequency and perversity of sexual crimes. A pathetically high divorce rate. And ironically, an increase in impotence and other sexually related dysfunctions. One of the world's best kept sex secrets, one you'll never hear amid all the perversities on MTV's Love Line, is that the people who report the highest level of sexual satisfaction are those who are married and are committed to mutual faithfulness. So, what is the bottom line to all of this? Well, you don't break God's laws, they break you. In the introduction to a later printing of the Satanic Bible, LaVey's biographer Burton Wolfe wrote these words, celebrating what he saw as the dawning of a new Satanic age. Repressed people have burst their bonds, sex has exploded, the collective libido has been released in movies and literature, on the streets and in the home. People are dancing topless and bottomless. There is a ceaseless universal quest for entertainment, enjoyment of the here and now. There's a mood of neo-paganism and hedonism, and from it there have emerged a wide variety of brilliant individuals who are interested in formalizing and perpetuating this all-pervading religion and way of life. Now, more than 20 years later, LaVey and Wolf would have all the more reason to rub their hands in glee. But, as the scriptures say, where sin abounds, grace does much more abound. Amidst all this perversion, all this blatant pagan sexuality, God is moving. Sin, as it says in Romans 7, has become exceedingly sinful. Only those who are willfully blind can now miss what's going on. The promised land, held out to the world during the sexual revolution of the 60s, has plainly become a Babylon, a place of satanic captivity, as bad or worse than the bondage of Pharaoh's Egypt. And now God is saying, let my people go. Personally, I heard that cry some 20 years ago. Millions more have as well. And now, multitudes stand in the valley of decision. Perhaps you're among them, staring at the fork in the road. Live as the beast of the field, or as sons and daughters of the Most High. Lust and my will be done, or love and God's will be done. Which path do you intend to follow? Here I set my face unto you. Here I speak my heart's true vow. Here I choose to walk beside you, loving only you. My heart speaks true forevermore from now. I will love you in the dawning and in the bright noonday. I will love you in the even. Every day I live, my heart I'll give. I love you from my grave. I have heard God in your laughter. I have seen Him on your face. And it's clear now what He's after. For He wrote your name on my heart in flame. It's a wound I'll not erase. We will covenant with the dust below and the Spirit up above. What if? What if? What if? What if what the Bible says is true? And Jesus is who he said he was. 
the promised Messiah. The Lamb of God sacrificed on the cross to pay the penalty for our sins. To pay the penalty. To, pay the penalty. to satisfy the righteous requirements of an infinitely holy God. holy God. And save us from the judgment and the hell our sins greatly deserve. What if? What if? What if? What if? Would you bet your life against it? It's something to think about. It's, it's something, something to think. It's something to think about. Jesus of the idiot ideology of the pallid, incompetent Christ is uh, in order. There is no God in the world. In concert news, shock metal band Charles Monroe has unleashed a new firestorm of controversy. Religious groups including Buddhists, Taoists, Shintoists, Unitarians, followers of the Dalai Lama, and a smattering of Episcopalians have begun to organize protests outside of venues where Monroe will be performing their most recent release, Fat Bellied Buddha. MTTV was allowed in to see just what all the fuss is about. Despite attempts to shut down Monroe's performance by labeling his theatrics as hate crime, the anti-Buddhist superstar was up to his same old tricks before a capacity audience in Omaha Thursday night. We will no longer rob the belly of this fat, jolly As in other venues throughout the tour, audience enthusiasm reached a fever pitch during the now infamous Buddha smashing that precedes the band's performance of their hit song, Kurt's Not in Nirvana. We will make our own Nirvana! When later asked to defend his controversial stage show, Monroe characteristically responded, it's art and needs no defense, and then extended his middle finger to a saffron-robed monk and said, here, meditate on this. Not too likely, is it? But why is such an event so absurd as to be, well, laughable? And why is it that if we were to substitute Jesus for the Buddha, it would move from hyperbole to reality, from a joke to the way things really are. We will no longer be oppressed by the fascism of Christianity. It should come as no surprise that among self-aware Satanists, the Jesus of the Bible, both his person and his teachings, are variously mocked, perverted, and despised. Clearly, he is the enemy, and standing against his divine authority becomes the first order of business for the spirit of Antichrist. For example, in 1916, Aleister Crowley, perhaps the century's most infamous occultist, created a ritual to banish the, quote, dying god of Christianity and inaugurate what he became among the first to term the New Aeon, or New Age. Central to this ceremony was the use of a frog that was baptized, worshipped, and then crucified with the words, Lo, Jesus of Nazareth, how thou art taken in my snare. All my life thou hast plagued and affronted me. I blot thee out from the earth. Thine aeon is past. The age of Horus is arisen by the magic of the master, the great beast that is man. And his number is 666. After mocking the crucifixion, Crowley's great law was intoned, do what thou wilt shall be the whole of the law. More incredible blasphemies were uttered and then, and this is very significant, the frog was killed with the dagger of art, while intoning the words, into my hands I receive thy spirit. It's no 
Well, the great beast would have longed to see this day. What was once the underground purview of a handful of occultists, drug addicts, and freaks has been literally forged into a dagger of art and thrust into the heart of Western culture. Who designed your new t-shirt? Uh, you mean the one with the demon, uh, the, the beastly guy strangling Jesus, and his heart's glowing, and blood's coming out of his eyes? That's the one. Yeah, I thought of that one. Again and again, music and art have been forged with the express purpose of storming the very gates of heaven. Concerning his 1996 release, Antichrist Superstar, Brian Warner, a.k.a. Marilyn Manson, declared, I think every time people listen to this new album, maybe God will be destroyed in their heads. And Alternative Press Magazine described Dai Warza as a band that uses computers, synthesizers, and guitars as weapons aimed directly at the heart of Christianity. Their techno-pagan rhythm signatures interact with human brainwaves in order to revive paganism and subvert Christian myth. The band's stated goal, according to founder Jim Marcus, we want to hasten the final evolution of the human species. I look forward to the day when on December 25th, we celebrate the death of Christianity. While few people would be as direct as this in their hatred of Christianity, a kind of low-grade contemptuousness, particularly on college campuses, has become fairly common. So let's peel open this onion, shall we? Let me go ahead and voice what some of you are thinking. Uh, my thoughts on Christ or Christianity? Uh, personally, I believe it was created to instill fear. It was also used to force people into war, saying, well, these people are doing evil things. You should, you know, now God says that we should go and kill them. Christians have condemned everything that wasn't them. Um, they persecuted people because they thought they were different. They found stupid little ways to kill people. How about the Dark Ages? We had a thousand years where the, the church god had to totally permeated society and nothing went anywhere. Hooray for science and the Enlightenment. Good riddance to Christianity with its wars, crusades, witch burning, slavery, colonialism, aversion to the hard facts of science, exclusive truth claims, moral demands, hypocrites, and doctrines of judgment and hell. Did I miss anything? Well, it would take hours to fully diffuse all these charges, but I trust that what follows will be adequate for those who are not willfully skeptical. And for those who are, I hope you'll be able to hold your aversion to Christianity in check and at least finish the series. Perhaps God himself in his mercy will convince you somewhere else along the way. Number one, no doubt about it, terrible things have been done in the name of Christ. But that's no reflection on Jesus and his teachings. It's an indictment of sinful men. I can cite hundreds of examples. One will have to suffice. Concerning the practice during the Crusades of forcing people to convert under threat of death, well, Jesus told his followers, You know that those who are considered rulers lord it over them. It shall not be so among you, for even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve, and to give his life as a ransom for many. Elsewhere, God declared that it's the goodness of God that leads you to repentance. To use violence to effect conversions is to get it just about as wrong as is possible. G.K. Chesterton put it well when he observed that these problems arise not because the Christian ideal has been tried and found wanting, but rather because in certain instances it has been found difficult and left untried. And then there's a related point. Number two, when man's wrath is substituted for God's love, the so-called Christians who are doing it, as we've just seen, are being completely inconsistent with the truth they're obligated to obey. But now consider the flip side. 
For example, the over 100 million people who've been killed by atheists during the 20th century alone. Their actions can be, and often are, perfectly consistent with their, quote, truth. Hitler, Stalin, and Mao, for example, were acting in a manner congruent with their acceptance of Darwinian materialism when they murdered some 50 million, quote, products of random mutation, end quote, in a sincere effort to build a more perfect society. We need to keep these things firmly in mind if we're to honestly assess the lessons of history. Number three, it's flagrantly dishonest to overlook the great blessings brought to the world as Christian principles have been faithfully practiced. Modern science, the abolition of slavery, care for the poor, hospitals, orphanages, universal education, free market economics, and the Protestant work ethic, women's and racial equality, child labor laws, concern for the environment, the inspiration for beautiful and enduring works of art, music, literature, and architecture, the rule of law, civil liberty, religious freedom, the Magna Carta, and American Constitution, on and on, these are all byproducts of the Christian faith. Some people may want to deny it, millions more simply ignore it, but the fact remains. And if the testimony of history isn't enough, just go to the villages and towns of the third world and find out who's really down in the trenches working to alleviate suffering. Too far to travel? Well then check out what's going on in your own hometown. Again, who's doing most of the work to feed the hungry, care for the orphan, or bring hope to those in prison? Swallow hard. It's been going on for 2,000 years. Perhaps the best way to cut through all the static surrounding this issue is to ask a very fundamental question. Forget for just a moment all the hype, all the noise and pressure to be cool and embrace a rock and roll lifestyle, and to even look down your nose at Christianity, and ask yourself, if you were dying and needed blood, from whom would you prefer to get it? From a rebel or a disciple of God? Here I'll use myself as an example. Until I was 26, it was sex, drugs, and rock and roll. As a result, I would have had a number of risk factors based upon the screening you're given when you donate blood. Then I became a Christian and sought to follow God and keep His commandments. Is it just a coincidence that the lifestyle He has ordained for man now makes me an optimum donor? So seriously, if you were dying, from which world, from which Eric, would you want a transfusion? You see, the truth and the life is in the blood. Guess who to the rescue on our holy mission to uphold the tradition of the Spanish Inquisition and preempt your decision by forcing your confession. Now let that be a lesson if you think you're messing with. There may be other knots in people's minds concerning Christianity. We haven't time to unravel them all. But keep something in mind. Many brilliant skeptics, from the Apostle Paul to Malcolm Muggeridge, have become devoted followers of Christ. Examine your objections honestly and with humility. Could they possibly be just an excuse for unbelief? Take as just one last example the very common and quite enlightening charge of hypocrisy. Christianity, it's, it's about money and they're just they're a bunch, bunch of hypocrites. hypocrites. I think they're just giving your stuff religion. They just want to take it and take it for themselves. Neighbors, let us join today in the holy love of God and money. Because neighbors, no one loves you like he loves you. And what better way to show your love than to dig deep into your pockets. Dig real deep and give until it hurts. It's a front they put up just to make people think that they're good because they go to church. It's nothing but a bunch of ignorance and hypocrisy. I have become heavily involved in the church of divine love. Some fucking demon horse! We spent most of our time listening to inspirational tapes and demonstrating against schools which taught tolerance of homosexuals. We got arrested too. If Jesus saves, well it better save himself. From the gory, gory seeker, we use First off, 
keep in mind that the only hypocrisy that will be judged by God when you stand before Him will be your own. Don't cop out and try to hide behind someone else's sin. It doesn't work. And as for the charge that the visible church is made up of imperfect people, including the occasional bold-faced hypocrite, well, no question about it. And those hypocrites will have a lot to answer for when they stand before a God who both sees all things and has a zero-tolerance threshold for impenitent hypocrisy. For the name of God is blasphemed among the Gentiles because of you. Soon I discovered that this rock thing was true. Jesus was the devil. But again, don't strain at a gnat and swallow a camel. For every high-profile minister who's been caught living a lie, there are tens of thousands of good men and women who quietly go about doing their best to faithfully love God and their neighbors as themselves. What is it about our culture that drives people to ignore this far greater good while fixating on the occasional bad? And again, don't forget that the bad comes about because people are unfaithful to Christian principles, not as a result of following them. But do you know what's even more interesting? It's what happens when we turn this around. Why can artists get rich promoting lifestyles that hurt people? and that poison the waters of popular culture, but because they love their mama or do an occasional benefit. My friends, my ex-lovers, people that I haven't even met that die from this disease. Or periodically sing a thoughtful and virtuous song, well, suddenly, that pound of good becomes more important than the ton of bad. Where's the hypocrite patrol when you really need them? The foundational issue here, however, is ultimately not an organization, but a person, and what he accomplished on a cross 2,000 years ago. And it's here, from music, to album artwork, video imagery, to the lifestyles and testimonies of both the artists and their fans, where rock and roll has targeted virtually every aspect of Christ's redemptive work. His name, his birth, his word, his crown of thorns, his last supper, his blood, his character, his love, his uniqueness, his divinity, his power to save, and the faith he gave his life to establish have all been systematically ridiculed, denied, or diminished. Techniques used include the standard full-tilt boogie assault. and range downward to include what radical tactician Saul Alinsky called man's most potent weapon, ridicule. As in this comedy sketch that appeared during the closing credits of the 2000 MTV Video Music Awards. After the work's over, God's just a blast to hang out with. Give God, give God. Come on, let's get a God sandwich going. Struggle, oh my 
with me. Oh my It's Buster Rhymes. Gee. How many times I got to tell you not to come in here when I'm in the studio, boy? I'm sorry, Father, but could I get a picture with him, please? Did you do all your chores? Yes, Father, I performed three miracles today. What about those starving children in Africa? Oh, damn, I, I knew I forgot something. Boy, get your oh, out here. Ironically, today's popular music embraces, even glorifies, criminals, perverts, gangsters, occultists, mass murderers, even Satan as well as every pagan, New Age, and Eastern religion known to man. It is my most profound honor to welcome the Dalai Lama. But when it comes to the Son of God, the one who came and died for the sins that the culture of rock and roll applauds, well, what happened 2,000 years ago has happened again. There's no room for him at the end. My feet stink, and I don't love Jesus. Oh, Consider, for example, the central event of Jesus' life and the stark, awful scaffold upon which that event unfolded, the cross. For this cause I was born, the Messiah told his executioners, and this cause to atone, to pay the price for the sins of the whole world or as Jesus had explained it to his disciples the night before, greater love has no man than this, than to lay down one's life for his friends. As human beings, our universal tendency is to view ourselves as essentially good, and our sins, if we even use the term, as forgivable when weighed against our good works and our good intentions. Like it or not, however, the Bible paints a very different picture. It's the story of a man named Grady who liked to grade himself upon a curve. And he found that when compared to others, he wasn't such a perv. Instead of grading on a curve, comparing us as we tend to do with other people, especially really bad people, the Bible declares that our self-righteousness is as filthy rags in the eyes of a holy God who judges every thought, word, and deed done and left undone against the standard of heaven, by definition, the criterion of absolute perfection. And against this entrance exam, we've all failed. We all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. The cross is God's ultimate and only solution to the problem of how to redeem us from the necessary penalty for our crimes, how to break the power of sin, and to ransom us from the tyranny of the Lord of that sin. And it's here where the pattern of hatred for Christ and the cross begins to make some sense. The cross is not only the greatest symbol of God's love, it also represents our sin and our need to repent and turn our lives over to God. And it represents Satan's defeat, the gladiatorial arena where Jesus disarmed the spiritual forces of evil and made a public spectacle of them, triumphing over them through the cross. It's no wonder that Satan despises the cross and will do everything he can to discredit or diminish it. Behold the crucifix. What does it symbolize? Pallid incompetence hanging on a tree. Because I had the altars of the Druids long before the cross came, and the altars of the Druids will be there long after the cross is gone. Whether the Christians like to accept it or not, he did what I was saying, the cross came by, and passed by my window and I seen it go by and I said, ah, oh, Christ was a little God. Ah, oh, because that was where they hung that last. Should we be surprised that among the hundreds of bands that embrace some form of an openly satanic worldview, this hatred of Christ and his cross is a blatant and recurring theme?
We could go on listing example after example of this type of hell-breathed sacrilege. Artists and bands who almost seem to write, record, and perform for no other reason than to blaspheme Christ, His cross, and every facet of the atonement. By suggesting that Jesus suffered for His own sins. That His body underwent decay. Or that Satan won instead of being defeated at Calvary. By obsessively writing and singing about little else than their hatred of Christ, giving voice to blasphemies so unholy, so monumentally evil, that it's as if all the venom in hell had been distilled down to an elixir of pure malevolence and then injected into their brains. These bands not only seek to turn reality on its head, in the end, they and the demons they serve doth protest too much. Like darkness clamoring to negate the light, their very words and existence only serve to demonstrate, and by virtue of the contrast, in the end even glorify, the very reality they seek to deny. As in this extraordinary song by the band Emolation. After reciting hymns of praise from the Bible, including Psalm 68, Psalm 148, and even acknowledging the great truth found in Psalm 2 that God is enthroned upon the praises of his people, the band responds with. And then intones a satanic malediction. And if you would like a t shirt to go with the song, the band is only too happy to oblige. Well, once again, you can't kill someone who's not alive. And then there are the musicians who lack either the nerve or the absolute hardness of heart to openly, as one band sang, deny the cross, but who think nothing of using its evocative power to serve their own vulgar purposes. Johnny Rotten, for example, besides striking his own crucifixion pose, helped design a shirt that featured an upside down Christ and cross along with the word destroy a shirt that Mick Jagger later wore on stage during the Stones' 81 World Tour. I don't believe in Jesus. John Lennon doodled the crucified Jesus, revealing just one other facet of his Antichrist philosophy, when he then described it as a form of exhibitionism. Madonna put an even sicker spin on Calvary when she informed Spin Magazine that Crucifixes are sexy because there's a naked man on them. And if trying to make the cross an icon of perverted sexuality wasn't horrific enough, Madonna has also suggested that Jesus was a pervert, having got it on with Mary Magdalene. An opinion, by the way, shared by Tori Amos, who also made the profoundly demonic suggestion that Jesus' father was not God, but a male who impregnated Mary during a pagan ceremony and who was then sacrificed in a fertility ritual. Along much the same lines, in a conversation with Sandra Bernhard that appeared in Interview Magazine, Amos wondered, who knows, maybe you were there. Who knows, you might have blanked him. I don't really doubt it. The Bible offers us a profound insight into this willingness, even fascination, with mocking Christ and the cross, an insight that can be used to accurately diagnose one's true spiritual condition. The scriptures declare the word of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing. In other words, mocking the cross is evidence that a person is spiritually dead. And it's the Lord of death, Satan who inspires this mockery through his incessant drive 
to pervert man's image of God, truth, sin, and redemption. Against this, the Bible then states, But for those who are called to be saved, the cross is the power of God. Understanding this, we should each ask ourselves one of life's ultimate questions. What is the cross to us? The very power of God, something viewed with awe, respect, and obedience? Or is it an object of indifference or ridicule? If you're not sure, but instead are drawn to and enjoy these types of artists and attitudes, then that question has probably already been answered. Sign of the cross. And there's another, more subtle and perhaps even more significant way that the word of the cross is made foolish in today's popular culture. Besides the outright blasphemies, besides the profane way it's trotted out in videos, album covers, rock god poses, and stage sets. The Easter show was my actually my topless debut. They had me tied to the cross and it was all business. Was all By far the most common way the cross is used is as a decoration for people's bodies. From jewelry to tattoos, the cross is literally everywhere. And when you couple this with all the thank yous made to God on album covers and in award ceremonies, and then factor in the prayer that is offered up by many bands before they take the stage, let's go out there and do it because we're not biscuit and because we can. And sometimes even after, Jesus it is you who wakes me up every day. One could easily mistake the rock music industry for some form of quasi-Christian cult. But what's really going on in all of this? Again, is it being used reverently as an awesome symbol of the power of God unto salvation? Think about it. The cross was the bloody scaffold upon which the Son of God was tortured and killed for our sins. What if it had been an electric chair or guillotine? Would we be wearing miniature versions of them around our necks? or tattooed on our arms? In truth, the blatant attacks against the cross by some artists demonstrate just how seriously they view what happened at Calvary. By contrast, the word of the cross is being made more foolish, more silly and vain by those who would trivialize it as a mere piece of jewelry, a good luck charm, or a religious symbol drained of its true meaning. And this type of desecration becomes all the more intense when the cross is made an accessory to sin. When, in the words of philosopher playwright Albert Camus, it's being climbed up on so that rock stars, instead of Christ, can be glorified. And when, countless times a day, it's worn while committing acts for which Jesus ultimately had to die. So call your other man and say you found another man. Take off your clothes. Take off your clothes. How Satan must enjoy the irony. I want you to sex me. Yeah. Take off your clothes. Yeah, 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 yeah. And it's here where another spiritual truth needs to be understood in relation to the cross. A critically important fact that has been all but lost in our touchy-feely relativistic age. Not only does the cross represent God's love and holiness, not only does it demonstrate the true cost of sin and Jesus' willingness to lay down his life for his friends, and not only does the cross stand for the defeat of Satan and the power of sin, it also represents the death and subsequent resurrection of being born again for every true son and daughter of God. I have been crucified with Christ, the Apostle Paul said. It is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. For if we, speaking of Christians, have been united together in the likeness of his death, certainly we also shall be in the likeness of his resurrection. Knowing this, that our old man, 
or sinful nature was crucified with him, that the body of sin might be done away with, that we should no longer be slaves of sin. But God forbid that I should boast except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom the world has been crucified to me and I to the world. And finally, Jesus stated, If anyone desires to come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever desires to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. And so the true cross represents not only the death of Jesus, but also the death of self. It means that we've picked up our cross, lost our life, our right to do things our way, and we are now following the Lord. And so, like wearing the purple heart when one has never even been in battle, evoking the imagery of the cross while one's life and art is a virtual celebration of self and worldliness, is the worst form of hypocrisy. Now the Spirit expressly says that in latter times some will depart from the faith, giving heed to deceiving spirits and doctrines of demons, speaking lies in hypocrisy, having their own conscience seared with a hot iron. Hard words, no doubt, but keep in mind that they were given to sound an alarm, to alert people to the winds of spiritual subterfuge that blow through this fallen world. And that gracious warning was meant to also help the artists, many of them no doubt gifted and sincere, who become conduits for these very deceptions. This is a song about the greatest man who ever lived. Prince, for example, has spoken very directly about his belief in Jesus, even composing a number of songs that reference certain aspects of Christian faith. We all have a problem. Some are big, some are small If we can bear the problems, he said we can We live in the last in life in paradise The Christ as our king, as our king Do you believe it? But these glimmers of light are swallowed up in the darkness of both a lifestyle and a body of art that has but one overarching theme. Run away, do your own thing, and hence, by definition, anti-Christ sexuality. Ditto Lenny Kravitz, who frequently references God. I'd like to thank God for blessing me with music and making this possible as well as the occasional passage of scripture. No, none of us are perfect. Uh, we all fall short of the glory. And has written a number of songs with the stated intent of pointing people to Jesus. Are you gonna go my way? Are you gonna go my way? It was written about Jesus Christ, who was the ultimate rock star and rebel. But like Prince, his version of Christianity is far more Gnostic than Christian, where obedience is reduced to with the rub-a-dub being taken quite literally in what are among the most sexually debauched music videos ever produced. Perhaps even more significantly, faith itself is reduced to some vague state of mind and is directed as much towards oneself as it is God. And then there's Rock's Renaissance man, Moby. Again, he's been very vocal about his, quote, love for Christ. In my own strange way, I'm a Christian in that I really love Christ. And Acknowledging even his divinity, at least sort of. But I really do love Christ and recognize him in whatever capacity that I can understand it as God. But once again, his brand of rock and roll faith means never having to love Jesus so much that you might actually have to obey him. Having performed naked, dated strippers and prostitutes, DJed for copulating ravers, 
urinated on the food at a record label party and extolled the virtues of pornography. Moby understated his case a bit when he admitted that when he aspires to live according to the teachings of Christ, or at least some of them, he unfortunately has to be a bit selective. From Tom and Mark of Blink-182, R. Kelly, Destiny's Child, U2, Puffy Combs, Britney Spears, TLC, DMX, Christina Aguilera, LL Cool J. We could go on and on and on, citing examples of pop artists who have modeled this pick and choose, the word of the cross made foolish style of Christianity. Imagine being in an orchestra and then blowing off the conductor and playing what and how you wanted to play. You wouldn't last too long, would you? Well, does God somehow deserve less? Look, this is not complicated. God is God, and we're not. In fact, not only are we not divinities, we're classified 4F, fallen, fallible, finite, and foolish. God, in His love and mercy, has provided a way out of this mess. But it's a way that Jesus described as being narrow, and then contrasted it with the way of the crowd, where the gate is wide and the path broad that leads to destruction, and that there are many who travel on it. That narrow gate is the cross, the one that the Messiah died on, and the one we pick up as we die to ourselves and follow Him. And so, what is the cross to you? Through which of the two gates are you walking? And if you were to die and stand before the one whom sin nailed to a cross, what would you say? All Father Yahweh rules on high, King of kings and Lord of lords, revealed to men in Jesus Christ, King of kings and Lord of lords, fear before him all ye lands, King of kings and Lord of lords, grace and judgment in his hands, King of It's been well said that the human mind always seeks to justify what the heart has chosen. As we approach our moment of truth, any number of excuses are thrown out to justify what our fallen hearts have embraced. In the arena of music and popular culture, there are three that are perhaps the most common. The good person, good intentions excuse, the neutral music excuse, and the it's only rock and roll excuse. So now let's look at each of them in turn. But I mean, it's just music. I mean, um, a lot of the artists I listen to are Christians themselves, I believe. They believe in God. They mention it in their albums. They mention it in their award shows. I mean, I sure, I, I'm sure they say something inappropriate here and there, and they act stupid at times. But, you know, we're just humans. We make mistakes. I mean, you know, Christians aren't perfect as well, you know. We're just forgiven. In a country where over 50 million people claim to be born-again Christians, this type of excuse is both common and horribly flawed. First, as we saw earlier in this series, saying it's just music is like saying it's just nuclear energy. For good or ill, music exerts an extraordinarily powerful influence. But equally cliched is the good person who believes in God defense. The truth is, professing belief in God by itself means nothing, as Jesus' brother James noted. Faith by itself, if it does not have works, is dead. He then got even more specific. You believe that there is one God? You do well. Even the demons believe and tremble. 
The reason they tremble? Because their end is hell, judgment, and chains of darkness. A destiny that only a few verses later is said to be shared by spiritually minded but self-willed humans, believers in God no doubt, who walk according to the flesh in the lust of uncleanness and despise authority. The fact is, Jesus reserved his greatest indignation for these types of religious hypocrites, people who draw near to me with their mouth and honor me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. If we stop and think about it, we can all understand God's disgust with this type of hypocrisy. Deep down inside, we know that there are few things more detestable than people who self-righteously say one thing and then do the exact opposite. For example, what would you think if you were watching the news and saw something like this? With KTLV5, I'm Ashton Bryce, live in front of Smokey's Barbecue Pit, where pets, or people for the ethical treatment of swine, is kicking off its national boycott of Smokey's, protesting the restaurant chain's killing of pigs. These dedicated protesters gathered outside Smokey's even before the restaurant's doors were open for business this morning. They say they mean business when it comes to defending pig rights. We are not superior animals. Pigs are like our brothers, just like dogs and everything else. You don't see pigs running around shooting or killing people because they're hungry or they're looking for money or anything. We have no right to feel that we are in any way superior. We are all one on Mother Earth. We're anticipating any minute now the arrival of the National Honorary Spokesman for Pets, Technopop superstar Priest. He will be making a statement that will officially kick off this campaign to stop what he is calling, quote, the systematic exploitation of our porcine brothers and sisters. I knew I had to be here to see him because it's really hot and it's really fun. Priest, of course, was the big winner at last week's Grammys, taking home a total of seven awards. And now many are crediting the growing anti-pork movement to a dedication he made while accepting the award for Artist of the Year. And the Dalai Lama. I just want to dedicate this award to the approximately 42 million pigs that are killed every year for food. And I would just ask that we would all pray for the transmigration of their souls that they might reach a higher and a purer state. Thank you. It looks as if Priest is arriving right now. Now, now anybody here who has read Animal Farm or has seen Babe knows that pigs are smart. They have feelings. But we march them off to these crematoriums. These slaughterhouses that we call barbecue pits. Join with me today in boycotting Smokies so that we can assure that every pig everywhere is guaranteed the right to life, to liberty, and to the pursuit of happiness. How did you come to believe that pigs should be protected? Oh, um... Well, that, that's pretty simple, really. It's um, because of my Buddhist faith, which of course includes belief in reincarnation, uh, uh, that provided the foundation. And when I heard that the, uh, the Dalai Lama was crying out for the souls of the millions of pigs that were killed over in, uh, in China and in Taiwan because of the, the hoof and mouth disease, I knew I had to do something about the killing here in America. So when I was... I'm sorry, Priest, but please correct me if I'm wrong, but are those pork ribs from Sonny's Barbecue? Um, well, I mean, what if they are? I mean, the, the important thing today is that they're not from Smokies. What does it, ma what does it matter if they're from Smokies or if they're from Sunnies? It's still meat, it's still meat from a pig. <laughs> Lady, come on, are you some kind of vegan fundamentalist or something? I mean... No, but race here. You're trying to the grace, you had just gotten Woo! out of this vehicle in front of all these people and had told them that we are supposed to stand up to protect the rights of pigs, and yet here you... Are you judging me? No, I'm not, I'm not judging you. Of course you are. You're judging me. Look, you have no right to judge me. Remember, judge not, lest you be judged. Well, while we're on the subject, 
Priest. In light of this recent Pets campaign, how do you explain the lyrics to your latest song, Hogwild? Uh, with the lyrics, this little pig went to market, this little piggy stayed home. And from the three other little piggies, I made bacon and ham bone. Look, Lois Lane is just a song. I mean, come on. If you don't like the lyrics, just, just get down with the beat. Look, I gotta go. Ciao. Well, there you have it, folks. Apparently, who you say you are and what you do have virtually nothing to do with one another. In front of Smokey's Crematorium Smokehouse, I'm Ashton Bryce, KTLB5. Well, all this may fly in our postmodern relativistic world, but it's going to crash and burn big time on that great day when Jesus warned, even the words we've spoken will be entered as evidence before the judgment seat of God. And to my Lord and Savior Jesus, whom I love and I can't let go of. We want to thank, first of all, God. Thank you so much. But, um, my God. And I want to st uh, start off by thanking God for blessing us so much. First and foremost, my Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. And also that thong for thong. Thong, thong. Thank you. Not to be unkind or single anyone out, millions are equally guilty of taking God's name in vain. But one artist hit the nail on the head when he observed after one award ceremony, it was rather ironic that teenage girls with breast implants and rappers with violent and misogynistic lyrics spent the whole night thanking Jesus Christ of all people. It's clearly by unchristian means that these alleged friends of God have made their millions. There's another common misconception related to this excuse that we need to briefly touch on. While it's true, of course, that only God is perfect, and Christians are forgiven by virtue of the mercy made available through the cross, that in no way means that Christians are just forgiven. No, we're just forgiven. If just is meant to suggest that that's the end of it. Reinforcing James' warning about dead faith, there are numerous places in the Bible where God commands us to be like Him, to see His righteous character develop progressively in our lives. Perhaps its greatest expression is found in Jesus' powerful exhortation during the Sermon on the Mount. Therefore you shall be perfect, just as your Father in Heaven is perfect. Impossible? The sight of death, no doubt. But that doesn't stop the true Christian from trying. Like a player on a team versus the spectator in the stands, the child of God is compelled to work, sacrifice, and submit in order to both please and honor their Heavenly Father. Yes, he will fail, sometimes miserably. But there's a world of difference between someone who's on the field trying and the person in the stands living their own life rebelling against God's righteous standards and then giving the occasional shout out to the Lord. For them, Jesus' warning at the end of the Sermon on the Mount will echo for all eternity. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name? And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. And that brings us to our next and somewhat related smokescreen. The good old neutral music excuse. I don't know, I don't like like the hard stuff more. I like more like yeah. in sync, Backstreet Boys. Oh, my. No, I mean seriously, yeah. I like like Backstreet Boys. They talk about love and relationships and yeah. things that are on the same wavelength as I am and I can really relate to it. and I really like how they- It helps everyone they, yeah. in different ways. Everyone can relate to it, so why not? Look at Britney Spears! Britney Spears, give it up one more time! Girl done went from the Mickey Mouse Club to the strip club! But before long, she was grinding down on a portable stripper pole. First of all, as we've seen, many of the artists who are commonly considered safe or neutral are far from it when held up to the light of God's Word. Nothing is forbidden anymore from pushing immodesty, lust, fornication, religious hypocrisy, irresponsibility, 
idolatry, rebellion, occultism, false religion, on and on. Their neutrality is an illusion that is only sustained when contrasted with the hardcore filth of today's entertainment industry. Take as just one example Christina Aguilera, ex Mouseketeer, Sears Back to School cover girl, and owner of one of the strongest voices in pop music. This genie in a bottle has been packaged as a sweet all American pop star, the very definition of safe and wholesome. Countless moms have thought nothing of buying her music, or a doll, or a karaoke microphone no doubt relieve their child isn't demanding the newest release by Eminem or Limp Biscuit. I'm a Christian, she told Rolling Stone, and I believe in God. All this is there for a purpose. He wants me to do what I'm doing for good. Well, one doesn't have to be very spiritual to know that God's good is being openly violated by her not-so-subtle anthems to seduction and fornication. Leaving aside the specific examples, and there are many, many more, there is a very interesting question we need to ask ourselves about the middle of the road. Isn't the so-called neutral stuff, by the very reason of its relative subtlety, potentially more destructive than the overt wickedness found in hardcore rock and roll? Surprised? Well, stop and consider the following fact of life. For something to be true, it has to be completely true. Inject into it even the smallest falsehood, and that truth immediately becomes a lie, a weapon in the hands of the one whom the scriptures call the father of all lies. And while there's no doubt that Satan's greatest triumph in this arena is to see people swallow lies devoid of even the slightest trace of virtue, cons like sex, drugs, and rock and roll, the fact is that his most effective deceptions are those that carry a degree of truth. And that's why the so-called middle of the road in music as well as in many other areas of life can often be the most dangerous place of all. By way of an analogy, consider rat poison, a substance that can kill a human just as easily as a rat. Well, it doesn't look very appetizing and it's very bitter to the taste. Left in a room with young children, it's unlikely they would pay much attention to it, and even more unlikely that they could stand to eat enough for it to be fatal. So it is with some of the more extreme forms of rock, music that directly glorifies death, sin, and Satan. Many people avoid its bitter sound and taste, although it must be noted that increasingly our society has become so sick and desensitized that many are willing to ingest this poison straight. But what if you were to take this exact same poison and sugarcoat it and add pretty colors to it to make it look, for example, like M&M's and then leave it with the children? Well, virtually every one of them will eat the poison without hesitation. And the same death would result. So, if you were the devil, which method would you find the most reliable? The bitter poison or the sugar-coated candy? As the great philosopher and writer C.S. Lewis noted in his classic, The Screwtape Letters, indeed the safest road to hell is a gradual one, 
the gentle slope, soft underfoot, without sudden turnings, without milestones, without signposts. We can explore this safe road to hell in more detail here at your friendly neighborhood funeral home. To use another analogy, the biblical picture of man without God is much like this poor fellow right here, trapped in the coffin of his fallen nature and unable to do the least thing to help or redeem himself. While physically alive and brimming with potential from a human perspective, to an infinite and incomprehensibly holy God, our sin, our innate drive to live life on our own terms, has cut us off from God and His eternal life. To put it bluntly, we are spiritually dead and only a heartbeat away from eternal judgment. The only way out of this black hole is to be born again, to have our sins blotted out through the sacrifice Jesus made on the cross. Death metal, goth, punk, and other more extreme forms of rock for the most part openly reject the cross and instead glory in this fallen state. Perversion, nihilism, violence, death, hell, Satan, and all the other horrors associated with sin are openly rubbed in the listener's face. And incredibly, millions of people willingly subject themselves to this. But many others, in fact the majority, are put off by the in-your-face evil and instead opt for the safer stuff, the so-called neutral or pop music. Just believe you can fly, just believe you can touch the sky, it doesn't matter what you say or do, just as long as to your heart you're true, I believe but what does the pop musician really have to offer his listener? Cries of love, peace, follow your heart and we are the world ultimately mean nothing to a spiritually dead man. In fact, by ignoring his real condition or offering instead a false hope of salvation, this poor wretch's situation has only been made worse. Of course, there's nothing wrong with singing about love unless it's the conditional, selfish, and emotion-driven love popularized by today's entertainments. There's nothing wrong with singing about peace and caring for the world. These are all virtues taught and practiced by Jesus. There's nothing wrong with even singing about death and despair, as long as it's done within the framework of truth and God's redemptive purposes. Apart from God, though, these things have no absolute context, no real meaning. Understand that God is reality, His Word is truth, and His Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, is our resurrection from the coffin of sin and eternal judgment. Most hardcore music mocks this. Much of the pop world ignores it, which is ultimately worse. The Bible answers this question by condemning both. Avoid profane and vain babblings, we're told, for they will inevitably lead to greater ungodliness and their corrupting influence will spread like cancer. Profane signifies words and worldviews that are openly wicked or blasphemous. While vain babblings suggest those that are empty and fundamentally worthless in their power to redeem or impart truth. If tomorrow is judgment day, 
And the Lord asked me what I did with my life. I spent it with you. In direct contrast to these two cancers, God prescribes the only antidote. Be diligent to present yourself approved to God, a worker who does not need to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. The bottom line for us in all of this is to understand that there are two distinct worlds that compete for our allegiance, the kingdom of God and the kingdom of the fallen world. As we've already seen, there's a type of spiritual gravity, the force of rebellion and self-will we call sin, that naturally pulls us deeper into the pit of the world, our flesh, and the devil. And then by the machinations of philosophy and empty deceit, profane and vain babblings, and the lust of the flesh, eyes, and pride of life, we're progressively blinded, hardened, and deceived as to the true nature of this pit, and oblivious to the glorious kingdom that shimmers just over the horizon. But even if our gospel is veiled, it is veiled to those who are perishing, whose minds the God of this age has blinded, who do not believe, lest the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine upon them. The solution? The only way out of this black hole? Well that, God will perhaps grant them repentance, so that they may know the truth and come to their senses and escape from the snare of the devil, having been taken captive by him to do his will. Those who have ears to hear, let them hear. And finally, there's the excuse that perhaps best personifies the very essence of rock and roll. You know, it's not like we're going out and worshiping the devil or anything. You know, music yeah, so is just it, so music. You ought to be able to do what you want to do. I mean, so what if they are Satanists? It's a free country. We have the freedom of religion, okay? That's like in the amendment somewhere or something like that. And we're not, we're not believing every word that these bands are talking about. We just like the music for what it is. And We're not you bad know? people, you know? It's like I come from a very good home, you know? My dad's a pastor. I mean, you know? Life is about partying, right? Having fun. Well, outside the fringe world of black and death metal and the occasional occult devotee, no one ever thinks they're worshiping the devil. I'm not the Antichrist the and that includes artists who have dabbled with, studied, and even embraced the occult. I'm not a Satanist. I'm not, I don't de worship the devil. I'm... We reached the devil at his home in Las Vegas. When asked for a comment, Satan said, no, he's not my boy but I love him like a son. Just for the record, Glenn Danzig does not, according to his publicist, worship the devil. Led Zeppelin's Jimmy Page echoed these disavowals when he stated, I do not worship the devil, but magic does intrigue me. What about these denials? If all these people mean well, and are just following their own spiritual path, or as in the case of many heavy metal artists, simply living up to the dark, occultic persona that's expected of them. They and their fans can't be considered followers of Satan, can they? Well, listen carefully, because everything we've examined in this series has been leading up to this very point. The reason so many people reject the charge of Satan worship is because, as we saw earlier, they have a caricature of the devil and his religion in their minds. He's the horn-headed demon in red pajamas, and serving him, should he even exist, would involve sacrificing babies, drinking blood, or something else equally horrible or bizarre. In reality, though, following Satan is far more mundane and universal than most people realize or would care to admit. But I can do anything that I want to. I can pursue any kind of lustful desires that I might feel. I can uh, engage in any activities that are so-called sinful activities and not really worry about 
any ecumenical councils making it right for me to do these things. Living for, as I've said, all of their earthly and carnal pleasures. A satanic world is a world reborn in purity, a world where uh, the instinct and the intellect will be complementary to one another rather than uh, being at odds with one another. It will be a world in which uh, we follow laws of nature instead of just the rules that man's made up to regulate his conduct. All right, we got one rule. There are no rules. Have a good time. Do what we want. If a Christian said to you, you were just really worshipping yourself, what would you say? In a sense, they would be right. Uh, it is a form of self-worship. We feel that there is no reason why these people shouldn't just flip the coin completely over and simply call themselves what religion has called them for many, many years. Call them devil worshippers or disciples of evil or Satanists. Of course, it's very hard for a person to hang an uncomplimentary label on themselves. And for this reason, for many years, there will be people practicing Satanism as good Christians or other religions, and uh, they will in, in, instinctively pursue the very same things that we are, as they always have. As we've already seen, Satan is an invisible spirit and a master of disguise. His ability to pass himself off as an angel of light can fool the rebellious and the spiritually naive into thinking that black is white truth a lie, and even that God himself is the one telling them these things. And as for following the devil, many that espouse an openly satanic worldview can tell you that it's nothing like the Hollywood caricature. And that's precisely what makes it so disturbing, as the occult magazine Gnosis acknowledged. If there's anything horrifying in its teachings, it's that these are the principles by which most people live most of the time, usually without admitting it even to themselves. And just what is this core principle by which most people live? Well, in a nutshell, do what you want. Surprised? Well, Anton LaVey wasn't. He understood precisely from where this popular concept had arisen. And he must, uh, as a Satanist, knowing this, realizing what his human potential is, eventually, and here is one of the essential points of Satanism, attain his own Godhead in accordance with his own potential. Therefore, each man, each woman, is a God or gods in Satanism. Big Pimper really, man, is living life to your fullest potential. I mean, like, whatever you want to do, when you want to do it, you do it, but in the grandest way possible, you know? Uh, and for a god or goddess, what's the ultimate standard for ethics, meaning, purpose, and destiny? You've got it. Whatever you feel is right. My heart is the ruler of all my being. If my heart tells me it's true, that's good enough for me. The answers to your, to your problems are in yourself and not in a, not in a God or a religion. Marilyn Manson noted the universality of the satanic ethic when he observed the idea of Antichrist is an unspoken knowledge that every person has. It's just the acceptance of yourself as a powerful being who can make their own decisions. It's not someone with a 666 on their head. And Satanism is about worshiping yourself because you are responsible for your own good and evil. How would you define, what would you define being a Satanist as? Worship of themselves. You're worshiping yourself when you worship Satan. Aleister Crowley stated it this way in his infamous Book of the Law. Every man and every woman is a star or a god. And as we saw earlier, do what thou wilt shall be the whole of the law. Uh, I'm a basically a free thinker. Whatever anybody wants to do, they can do whatever they want as long as it doesn't hurt other people. I live by myself, you know, I live by my own values and all that, morals. 
I set my own ways. How do you determine what those morals and values are? Well, I don't know, I just do what's right for myself. By declaring that each person should walk in their own light, discover and then do their true will, LaVey, Manson, and Crowley, along with Nietzsche and others, have simply been echoing the father of all lies, the one that goes back to the very dawn of human history. Then the serpent said to the woman, God knows that in the day you eat of it, your eyes will be open and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. Satanism then, in its essence, is simply each person looking through his or her own eyes for meaning and direction. As our own god or goddess, we're free to do as we will. Theologically, this worldview can be reduced to a single precept found in the fourth chapter of the Book of Satan. Say unto thine own heart, I am mine own Redeemer. Or, to put it in more common terms, the, quote, triumphant strains, end quote, of a song that LaVey and his disciples viewed as one of the most satanic of the 20th century. I did it my way For what is a man? What has he got? If not himself It's no mere coincidence that this song, in its successive incarnations, revealed artists who became living metaphors for the inevitable downward spiral of any culture that embraces I did it my way theology. I did it my way, indeed. Of course, not every follower of the satanic law ends up dying, as did Elvis and Sid, of a drug overdose. Hell does have its trophies on this side of the grave. But the ultimate expression of sin's wages for everyone who, quote, does it their way, and that includes some of the most talented and beautiful among us, is a grace-forsaken darkness that waits just on the other side of death. And while Elvis and Sid may represent the figurative Alpha and Omega of the rock milieu, this my way ethic has expressed itself in so many ways by so many different performers. And I want to do it my, you know, my way, to sound like Frank Sinatra. And in so many songs, interviews, and concert performances, one could easily argue that Do What Thou Wilt defines the very soul of rock and roll. Once a kid can click this switch in his head and say, I can do what I want to do, I'm here on this earth, there are laws, but I'm going to handle it my way, he gains identity. The bitch with a flashlight. Do anything you want to do. Do what you want. Do it, boy. Do what you want to do. You can do what you want to do. 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 Do what you want to do.
Do what thou wilt often resonates in the words of the popular mantra, do your own thing. And the thing is, whatever is good for you is the best for you, you know. It's a simple thing, but people don't understand Doing that. your own thing means doing your own thing, not right. doing exactly what everybody <laughs> else is doing, but doing what suits you. Yeah. Let me hear you say it's my thing. It's your thing. It can provide the foundation for the ever popular believe or trust in yourself. When I say be a soldier, I mean being true to the game, being true to yourself and believing yourself. The truth is all within and the satanic law can find its most perfect and enticing expression in what has become one of our culture's most popular credos. Follow or trust your heart. Trust your heart, let faith decide to guide these lives we see. What feels so right? Just trust your heart and you see the light. Julia, you must be Julia. From acceptance speeches to follow our hearts to Broadway musicals. Follow my heart, but to where? To wherever your heart tells you to go. To children's videos. When you follow your heart, this flake of feel good wisdom has become the great law, the only politically correct commandment for a culture wherein truth is relative. The truth is whatever you believe is right. Man is good, and God is whatever you want him, her, or it to be. The truth is, there are no absolute truths. I mean, even God doesn't work that way. But think you for know, just a moment. Like Aren't you. most, or even all, the things that people say and do determined, ultimately, by the desires of their hearts? We are bored with the concept of right and wrong. Without some absolute standard of right and wrong, what's to keep a cute children's song? from becoming the score for man's descent into lust, murder, and anarchy. When your people in your life try and tell you what is right, what do you do? Listen to your heart, girl. Do you take a brand new road or the one you've always known? Am I getting through? Listen to your heart, girl. Listen to your heart, girl. Listen to your heart, girl. Cause the heart's not gonna lie to you. Listen to your heart, I can do anything I want to you people at any time I want to. You listen, listen to your heart. As we saw earlier in this series, the reason this do what you want, it's your thing, follow your heart theology is wrong and ultimately even satanic is because our hearts and minds have been profoundly deranged by the effects of sin. 
The heart of man is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? Every way of a man is right in his own eyes. There's a way that seems right to a man, but its end is the way of death. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not to your own understanding. And perhaps most direct of all, he who trusts in his own heart is a fool. From mankind's fall from grace to virtually every evil ideology that has blighted this travailing planet, ignoring our Creator's commands and doing instead what seems right in our own eyes and hearts has been the fountain from which sin and its wages have flowed. Of course, that's not to say that following one's heart will always produce the wrong or the most evil consequence. The Bible makes it clear that all of us have a dim memory of Paradise Lost and the moral standards we were created to obey. Depending on the individual and the culture, listening to one's heart can at times produce an approximately correct decision. And of course, for someone who's been born again through and to the will of God, following one's now regenerated heart can provide genuine direction and courage. But for the rebel, for those walking in their own counsel and by their own light, following your heart is a perfect expression of the satanic law and a one-way ticket to hell. Let's now close by examining the law from the satanic Bible that best expresses the essence of this do-what-thou-wilt philosophy, Say to thine own heart, I am mine own redeemer. One of the essential facts of life is that we're all born with a sense that something is wrong or missing, and the rest of life becomes a quest for wholeness and fulfillment. In theological terms, redemption. Whatever we look to for this, be it God, family, friends, lovers, money, power, sex, drugs, music, fame, or anything else, that person or thing becomes our Redeemer, by definition, our God. Christianity simply declares that all of us have been ruined by sin and, as a result, are completely unable to save ourselves. We need a Messiah, a supernatural Redeemer. For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son that whoever believes in Him should not perish but have everlasting life. Against this, every other religion, every philosophy and ethical system contrived by man says in one way or another that we're not really that bad and that through our own efforts we can redeem ourselves. In this they share the bottom line of Satanism and most of rock and roll. Yeah.
And now, the ultimate dichotomy, the final fork in the road, presents itself. On the one hand stands the cross and the broken body of God the Son. And on the other, an idol, gilded by the craft of man. And just as in Moses' time, today the people riot and dance about their idol, and the music of their worship rises up to heaven as the sounds of war. Only those who are willingly blind can deny what this series has established, that at every point, with an almost mathematical precision, the culture of rock and roll seeks to subvert the rightful rule of God and put man, and sometimes even Satan, in his place. From its deep roots in the occult to the vast profusion of evil fruit, the stain of sin, death, and judgment are unmistakable for those who have eyes to see. Know now that one day the music will stop. For those still worshiping around the golden calf, by God's grace, may that time be now. to the end and our moment of truth. A truth that obviously goes a lot deeper than just deciding what bands and songs you're going to listen to. All that flows from a much deeper place, the foundation of who your God is, who owns and is running your life. The fork in the road that's before us in this moment in time should be radically clear. My will or thy will. The religion of man and doing what I think is best or the religion of God and accepting what He has done for us on the cross. If the Holy Spirit has opened your eyes and heart to see this fork in the road and you now recognize that you've been on the wrong side, well, by God's grace, it's time to switch sides. When Jesus said, repent and believe the gospel, that's what repent means. Change your mind, turn from your sins, switch sides. The gospel begins with a simple declaration of fact. All of us are like sheep who have turned away. Each of us has gone on our own path. We're sinners, and the wages of sin is death. The good news is that the Lord placed the power and penalty of sin on Jesus through the cross. He was crucified for our offenses, the Bible says, and then resurrected for our justification to present us redeemed before the throne of God. If by God's grace the lights are now on and you believe that and want to be a child, a friend, and follower of God, all you need do is call on the name of the Lord. Heavenly Father, I come before your throne of grace in and through the name of your Son, Jesus. I want to tell you how sorry I am for my rebellion and sin. In my thoughts and words, in the things I've done and left undone, I have broken your righteous commandments. I'm sorry, and by your grace purpose to turn from the path I've been on, to turn from all my sins, and instead love and follow you with all my heart, soul, and strength. I thank you for loving me while I was yet a sinner and sending Jesus to save me. According to your word, I believe and confess that he was crucified for my sins, 
raised from the dead for my salvation and glorified at your right hand so that one day I can worship you in heaven. I boldly and fervently declare that Jesus is now the Lord and Savior of my life. Take all that I am and ever will be and use it for your glory. So be it. Amen. If you prayed that prayer from your heart, you're now a child of God and embarked on the most incredible adventure imaginable, a journey to a holy city, a kingdom whose builder and architect is God. There's a blueprint for the way the Lord builds. Stick around for just a few more minutes and we're going to give you nine keys for making sure that the structure of your own life and destiny will stand before the tests of life. In closing, let me say something to those who are not ready to repent. Three quick suggestions that helped me as a rock and roll rebel and a confirmed skeptic when it came to things like Christianity. First, pray and be honest with God. Tell Him that you have real doubts, problems, whatever, but that if He is real and Jesus is the Messiah, you want to know it. Now, here's the rub. You also have to be willing to obey the truth once it's revealed to you. Second, the Bible tells us that faith comes by hearing the Word of God. Read from the bestseller of all time. I would suggest starting with the Gospel of Luke. And again, pray and ask God to reveal truth to you as you read. And finally, one of the primary contentions of this video series is that people are being brainwashed by today's popular entertainments. If you really want to know the truth, turn off or at least turn down the brainwashing hose for a month or so. Like getting off of junk food, you'll be amazed at how different you'll feel. If you do these three things, your cynicism may very well turn to salvation. May God's face shine upon you. Hi, my name is Bruce, and God set me free from hardcore Satanism and a devotion to occult philosophy. I want to encourage you to dive into the Word of God, to, as the Bible says, renew your mind and cleanse it with the washing of water by the Word. As this video series has made clear, there's a lot of brainwashing going on in this world. If you are going to grow in your faith, you need not only to shut off the sewer line of pop culture, you also need God to flush out the sewage with the living waters of His truth. As Jesus prayed concerning His disciples, Sanctify them, Lord, or make them holy in Thy truth. Thy word is truth. Become a student of God's word, and the truth will set you free. Hi, my name is Kelsey, and Jesus Christ completely delivered me from what I thought was a hopeless addiction to crack cocaine. Now you've just seen in this video series how powerful music can be. Well, whatever evil flows through bad music, a far greater good is manifested through psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs, singing and making a melody in your heart to the Lord. Become a worshiper. Listen to music that, as Bach said, gives glory to God. And take time daily, if possible, to lift up your heart in song to the Lord. He who sings to God, the early church said, prays twice. Hi, my name is Joy, and I was blessed to grow up in a strong Christian home and come to know the Lord at a very young age. I want to encourage you to spend time with God in prayer. When Jesus taught His disciples to pray, the first thing He said was, Our Father. As born-again Christians, we have a Father who loves us infinitely more than any human father ever could. Can you imagine a good father who doesn't love to spend time with his kids? Well, God wants to spend time with you, to love on you, to help you, to change you more and more into His image. And prayer, along with worship and the Word, is the best way that you can do this. And on top of this, prayer is the most powerful way that we can work with God to change the world. Hi, my name is Louie, and Jesus freed me from a 10-year drug habit my sophomore year in college. I want to challenge you to watch over your soul. God's command is to come out from among them, the pagan world, and touch nothing unclean, to set our affections on things above, not on things of the earth. 
to have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather to expose them. And here's the radical verse for you, to hate the work of those who fall away. There are hundreds of similar verses in the Bible, all telling us the same thing, that as believers we are not to, on a personal level, take in anything that is offensive to God. Of course, that doesn't mean that we're to retreat in the impotent little subcultures. Rather, we're called to transform our world as ambassadors of His kingdom. To be like Jesus, a friend of sinners, in order to lead them back to God. But on a personal level, for example, in the area of our leisure time and the entertainments that we enjoy, we simply cannot compromise by fellowshipping with darkness. There's a poem I've learned that pretty much says everything in regard to this key area of Christian discipleship. There are two natures that beat within my breast. One is foul and the other blessed. One I love and one I hate, but the one I feed will dominate. Feed and care for your soul. It's the only one you've got and its condition will determine your reward in eternity. Hi, my name is Gabriella, and the Lord delivered me from a prison of sexual abuse and rape, a sin that has victimized women in my family for generations. I want to challenge you to be radical in your service for God. You know the old saying, the best defense is a good offense? Well, after Jesus rose from the dead, having conquered sin and Satan, and being crowned the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords, He commissioned His disciples, and that includes you, to go. Christianity is not about getting saved and then twiddling your spiritual thumbs while waiting for the rapture. Every Christian has a part to play in fulfilling the Great Commission. Find out what yours is, and then throw yourself into it with all your heart, mind, and strength. Don't settle for an average life. Lose your life for His sake, and then you will find one that will shine forever. Hello, my name is Chris, and God delivered me from an aimless life of drinking, partying, and drug abuse. If you're a child of God, you are now part of a huge extended family that reaches around the world. Well, family life is meant to be shared. If you're a new Christian, find a good church that can be your immediate family, and then really get involved. And by a good church, I mean a congregation where the people are really excited about God, not just going through the motions, where the Bible is honored as the true and inerrant Word of God, where there is discipleship, God-honoring worship, and a real commitment to fulfilling the Great Commission. Join the team and get with the program. Hello, my name is Mike, and Christ set me free from the lie of doing my own thing and thinking I was saved because I went to church and loved gospel music. I want to encourage you to be a living, breathing ambassador for Jesus and His kingdom. To this end, while what we say is important, the way we live our lives is the real bottom line. Like St. Francis said, preach the gospel at all times, and if need be, use words. By His grace, strive to live a life of integrity, honesty, love, and service. And one more thing in this regard, don't be afraid to be different from the world around you. God has called us to be a peculiar people in the same sense that the fish swimming up the river seems peculiar to those that just go with the flow. So I also want to encourage you, don't allow the fallen world system to brainwash you and press you into its mold and strive to bring every thought captive in obedience to Christ. From education, dating, marriage, finances, fashion, politics, entertainment, you name it, we need to be leaders, living examples of a transformed life. Hello, my name is Julie, and Jesus saved me out of the darkness of idolatry and false religion. I want to encourage you to become a reader. It's no accident that Jesus was the Word made flesh and that reading and writing have always been central to the Judeo-Christian experience. Believers need to be able to give an answer to every man to defend the faith and provide real solutions to the world's questions and needs. A great place to start as a reader is with the writings of C.S. Lewis and Francis Schaeffer. From poetry to prose, philosophy to apologetics, we need to recover the lost tools of learning and raise again the standard of Christian scholarship. And don't be intimidated by the classics of literature and theology. If you chew strong meat long enough, your jaws will toughen up. Remember this, readers are leaders and TV watchers are bottom feeders. 
Hello, my name is Eric, and God set me free from a world of sex, drugs, and rock and roll. I want to encourage you to, well, be encouraged. If you read chapter 15 of Genesis, along with several other passages in the Bible, you'll see that God grants His people victory when, one, they repented of their sins and reestablished their covenant with Him, and two, the sins of the culture that's about to be won by God has reached a kind of saturation point. Well, perhaps that time is now. Perhaps the Amorite's cup of iniquity, so to speak, is full. Revival and judgment are in the air. It's time to rise up, put on the spiritual armor of God, and go. There's a culture and a world to be won.